Chapter One of New Grub Street. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bridget Gage. New Grub Street by George Gissing. Chapter One. A Man of His Day. As the Milvanes sat down to breakfast, the clock of Wattleboro Parish Church struck eight. It was two miles away, but the strokes were borne very distinctly on the west wind this autumn morning. Jasper, listening before he cracked an egg, remarked with cheerfulness, "There's a man being hanged in London at this moment." Surely it isn't necessary to let us know that," said his sister Maud coldly, and in such a tone too," protested his sister Dora. "Who is it?" inquired Mrs. Milvain, looking at her son with pained forehead. I don't know. It happened to catch my eye in the paper yesterday that some one was to be hanged at Newgate this morning. There's a certain satisfaction in reflecting that it is not oneself. That's your selfish way of looking at things," said Maud. "Well," returned Jasper, seeing that the fact came into my head, "what better use could I make of it? I could curse the brutality of an age that sanctions such things, or I could grow doleful over the misery of the poor fellow." But those emotions would be as little profitable to others as to myself. It just happened that I saw the thing in a light of consolation. Things are bad with me, but not so bad as that. I might be going out between Jack Ketch and the chaplain to be hanged. Instead of that, I am eating a really fresh egg and very excellent buttered toast, with coffee as good as can be reasonably expected in this part of the world. Do try boiling the milk, mother. The tone on which I spoke was spontaneous. Being so, it needs no justification. He was a young man of five and twenty, well built, though a trifle meagre, and of pale complexion. He had hair that was very nearly black, and a clean-shaven face, best described perhaps as a bureaucratic type. The clothes he wore were of expensive material, but had seen a good deal of service. His stand-up collar curled over at the corners, and his necktie was lilac sprigged. Of the two sisters. Dora, aged twenty, was the more like him in visage, but she spoke with the gentleness which seemed to indicate a different character. Maud, who was twenty-two, had bold, handsome features, and very beautiful hair of russet tinge. Hers was not a face that readily smiled. Their mother had the look and manners of an invalid, though she sat at table in the ordinary way. All were dressed as ladies, though very simply. The room, which looked upon a small patch of garden, was furnished with old-fashioned comfort. Only one or two objects suggesting the decorative spirit of 1882. A man who comes to be hanged, pursued Jasper impartially, has the satisfaction of knowing that he has brought society to its last resource. He is a man of such fatal importance that nothing will serve against him but the supreme effort of law. In a way, you know, that is success. In a way," repeated Maud scornfully. "Suppose we talk of something else," suggested Dora, who seemed to fear a conflict between her sister and Jasper. Almost at the same moment, a diversion was afforded by the arrival of the post. There was a letter for Mrs. Milvain, a letter and newspaper for her son. Whilst the girls and their mother talked of unimportant news communicated by the one correspondent, Jasper read the missive addressed to himself. "This is from Reardon." He remarked to the younger girl, "Things are going badly with him. He is just the kind of fellow to end by poisoning or shooting himself." But why? Can't get anything done, and begins to be sore troubled on his wife's account. Is he ill? Overworked, I suppose. But it's just what I foresaw. He isn't the kind of man to keep up literary production as a paying business. In favorable circumstances, he might write a fairly good book once every two or three years. The failure of his last depressed him, and now he is struggling hopelessly to get another done before the winter season. Those people will come to grief. The enjoyment with which he anticipates it," murmured Maud, looking at her mother. "Not at all," said Jasper. "It's true I envied the fellow because he persuaded a handsome girl to believe in him and share his risks, but I shall be very sorry if he goes to the, to the dogs. He's my one serious friend." But it irritates me to see a man making such large demands upon fortune. One must be more modest, as I am, because one book had a sort of success. He imagined his struggles were over. He got a hundred pounds for on neutral ground, 
and at once counted on a continuance of payments in geometrical proportion. I hinted to him that he couldn't keep it up, and he smiled with tolerance, no doubt thinking, he judges me by himself. But I didn't do anything of the kind. Toast, please, Dora. I'm a stronger man than Reardon. I can keep my eyes open and wait. Is his wife the kind of person to grumble? asked Mrs. Milvane. Well, yes, I suspect that she is. The girl wasn't content to go into modest rooms. They must furnish a flat. I rather wonder he didn't start a carriage for her. Well, his next book brought only another hundred. And now, even if he finishes this one, it's very doubtful if he'll get as much. The optimist was practically a failure. Mr. Yule may leave them some money, said Dora. Yes, but he may live another ten years, and he would see them both in Marylebone Workhouse before he advanced sixpence, or I'm much mistaken in him. Her mother has only just enough to live upon, can't possibly help them. Her brother wouldn't give or lend two pence halfpenny. Has Mr. Reardon no relatives? I never heard him make mention of a single one. No, he has done the fatal thing. A man in his position, if he marry at all, must take either a work girl or an heiress. And in many ways, the work girl is preferable. How can you say that? asked Dora. You never cease talking about the advantages of money. Oh, I don't mean that for me the work girl would be preferable. By no means. But for a man like Reardon, he is absurd enough to be conscientious, likes to be called an artist, and so on. He might possibly earn a hundred and fifty a year if his mind were at rest, and that would be enough if he had married a decent little dressmaker. He wouldn't desire superfluities, and the quality of his work would be its own reward. As it is, he's ruined. And I repeat, said Maud, that you enjoy the prospect. Nothing of the kind. If I seem to speak exultantly, it's only because my intellect enjoys the clear perception of a fact. A little marmalade, Dora, the homemade, please. But this is very sad, Jasper, said Mrs. Milvane, in her half absent way. I suppose they can't even go for a holiday. Quite out of the question. Not even if you invited them to come here for a week? Now, mother, urged Maud, that's impossible. You know very well. I thought we might make an effort, dear. A holiday might mean everything to him. No, no, fell from Jasper, thoughtfully. I don't think you'd get along very well with Mrs. Reardon. And then, if her uncle is coming to Mr. Yule's, you know, that would be awkward. I suppose it would, though those people would only stay a day or two, Miss Harrow said. Why can't Mr. Yule make them friends, those two lots of people? asked Dora. You say he's on good terms with both. I suppose he thinks it's no business of his. Jasper mused over the letter from his friend. Ten years hence, he said, if Reardon is still alive, I shall be lending him five pound notes. A smile of irony rose to Maud's lips. Dora laughed. To be sure, to be sure, exclaimed their brother, you have no faith. But just understand the difference between a man like Reardon and a man like me. He is the old type of unpractical artist. I am the literary man of 1882. He won't make concessions, or rather, he can't make them. He can't supply the market. I, well, you may say that at present I do nothing, but that's a great mistake. I am learning my business. Literature nowadays is a trade. Putting aside men of genius, who may succeed by mere cosmic force, your successful man of letters is your skillful tradesman. He thinks first and foremost of the markets. When one kind of goods begins to go off slackly, he is ready with something new and appetizing. He knows perfectly all the possible sources of income. Whatever he has to sell, he'll get payment for it from all sorts of various quarters. None of your unpractical selling for a lump sum to a middleman who will make six distinct profits. Now, look you, if I had been in Reardon's place, I'd have made four hundred at least out of the optimist. I should have gone shrewdly to work with magazines and newspapers and foreign publishers and all sorts of people. Reardon can't do that kind of thing. He's behind his age. He sells a manuscript as if he lived in Sam Johnson's Grub Street. But our Grub Street of today is quite a different place. It is supplied with telegraphic communication. It knows what literary fare is in demand in every part of the world. Its inhabitants are men of business, however seedy. It sounds ignoble, said Maud. I have nothing to do with that, my dear girl. Now, as I tell you, I am slowly but surely learning the business. My line won't be novels. I have failed in that direction. I'm not cut out for the work. 
"'It's a pity, of course. There's a great deal of money in it. But I have plenty of scope. In ten years, I repeat, I shall be making my thousand a year.' "'I don't remember that you stated the exact sum before,' Maud observed. "'Let it pass. And to those who have shall be given. When I have a decent income of my own, I shall marry a woman with an income somewhat larger, so that casualties may be provided for.' Dora exclaimed, laughing. "'It would amuse me very much if the Reardons got a lot of money at Mr. Yule's death, and that can't be ten years off, I'm sure.' "'I don't see that there's any chance of their getting much,' replied Jasper, meditatively. "'Mrs. Reardon is only his niece. The man's brother and sister will have the first helping, I suppose. And then, if it comes to the second generation, the literary Yule has a daughter, and by her being invited here, I should think she's the favorite niece.' "'No, no. Depend upon it. They won't get anything at all.' Having finished his breakfast, he leaned back and began to unfold the London paper that had come by post. "'Had Mr. Reardon any hopes of that kind at the time of his marriage, do you think?' inquired Mrs. Milvane. "'Reardon? Good heavens, no! Would he were capable of such forethought!' In a few minutes Jasper was left alone in the room. When the servant came to clear the table, he strolled slowly away, humming a tune— the house was pleasantly situated by the roadside, in a little village named Finden. Opposite stood the church, a plain, low, square-towered building. As it was cattle market today in the town of Wattleboro, droves of beasts and sheep occasionally went by, or the rattle of a grazier's cart sounded for a moment. On ordinary days the road saw few vehicles, and pedestrians were rare. Mrs. Milvane and her daughters had lived here for the last seven years, since the death of the father, who was a veterinary surgeon. The widow enjoyed an annuity of two hundred and forty pounds, terminable with her life. The children had nothing of their own. Maud acted irregularly as a teacher of music. Dora had an engagement as visiting governess in a Wattleboro family. Twice a year, as a rule, Jasper came down from London to spend a fortnight with them. Today marked the middle of his autumn visit, and the strained relations between him and his sisters, which invariably made the second week rather trying for all in the house, had already become noticeable. In the course of the morning, Jasper had half an hour's private talk with his mother, after which he set off to roam in the sunshine. Shortly after he had left the house, Maud, her domestic duties dismissed for the time, came into the parlor where Mrs. Milvane was reclining on the sofa. "'Jasper wants more money,' said the mother, when Maud had sat in meditation for a few minutes. "'Of course, I knew that. I hope you told him he couldn't have it.' "'I really didn't know what to say.' returned Mrs. Milvane, in a feeble tone of worry. "'Then you must leave the matter to me, that's all. There's no money for him, and there's an end of it.' Maud set her features in sullen determination. There was a brief silence. "'What's he to do, Maud? "'To do? How do other people do? What do Dora and I do?' "'You don't earn enough for your support, my dear.' "'Oh, well,' broke from the girl, "'of course, if you grudge us our food and lodging—' "'Don't be so quick-tempered. You know very well I am far from grudging you anything, dear. But I only meant to say that Jasper does earn something, you know. "'It's a disgraceful thing that he doesn't earn as much as he needs. We are sacrificed to him, as we always have been. Why should we be pinching and stinting to keep him in idleness?' "'But you really can't call it idleness, Maud. He is studying his profession.' "'Pray call it trade. He prefers it. How do I know that he's studying anything? What does he mean by studying?' and to hear him speak scornfully of his friend Mr. Reardon, who seems to work hard all through the year. It's disgusting, mother. At this rate he will never earn his own living. Who hasn't seen or heard of such men? If we had another hundred a year I would say nothing, but we can't live on what he leaves us, and I'm not going to let you try. I shall tell Jasper plainly that he's got to work for his own support. Another silence, and a longer one. Mrs. Milvane furtively wiped a tear from her cheek. "'It seems very cruel to refuse,' she said at length, "'when another year may give him the opportunity he's waiting for.' "'Opportunity! What does he mean by his opportunity? "'He says that it always comes if a man knows how to wait. "'And the people who support him may starve meanwhile. "'Now just think a bit, mother. "'Suppose anything were to happen to you. "'What becomes of Dora and me? "'And what becomes of Jasper, too? "'It's the truest kindness to him to compel him to earn a living. "'He gets more and more incapable of it. "'You can't say that, Maud. He earns a little more each year. But for that I should have my doubts. He has made thirty pounds already this year, 
and he only made about twenty-five the whole of last. We must be fair to him, you know. I can't help feeling that he knows what he's about. And if he does succeed, he'll pay us all back. Maud began to gnaw her fingers, a disagreeable habit she had in privacy. Then why doesn't he live more economically? I really don't see how he can live on less than a hundred and fifty a year. London, you know. The cheapest place in the world. Nonsense, Maud. But I know what I'm saying. I've read quite enough about such things. He might live very well indeed on thirty shillings a week, even buying his clothes out of it. But he has told us so often that it's no use to him to live like that. He is obliged to go to places where he must spend a little, or he makes no progress. Well, all I can say is, exclaimed the girl impatiently, it's very lucky for him that he's got a mother who willingly sacrifices her daughters to him. That's how you always break out. You don't care what unkindness you say. It's a simple truth. Dora never speaks like that. Because she's afraid to be honest. No, because she has too much love for her mother. I can't bear to talk to you, Maud. The older I get, and the weaker I get, the more unfeeling you are to me. Scenes of this kind were no uncommon thing. The clash of tempers lasted for several minutes. Then Maud flung out of the room. An hour later, at dinner time, she was rather more caustic in her remarks than usual. But this was the only sign that remained of the stormy mood. Jasper renewed the breakfast table conversation. Look here, he began. Why don't you girls write something? I'm convinced you could make money if you tried. There's a tremendous sale for religious stories. Why not patch one together? I am quite serious. Why don't you do it yourself? retorted Maud. I can't manage stories, as I have told you, but I think you could. In your place, I'd make a specialty of Sunday school prize books. You know the kind of thing I mean. They sell like hot cakes. And there's so deuced little enterprise in the business. If you'd give your mind to it, you might make hundreds a year. Better say, abandon your mind to it. Why, there you are. You're a sharp enough girl. You can quote as well as anyone I know. And please, why am I to take up an inferior kind of work? Inferior? Oh, if you can be a George Eliot, begin at the earliest opportunity. I merely suggested what seemed practicable. But I don't think you have genius, Maud. People have got that ancient prejudice so firmly rooted in their heads that one mustn't write save at the dictation of the Holy Spirit. I tell you, writing is a business. Get together half a dozen fair specimens of the Sunday school prize, study them, discover the essential points of such composition, hit upon new attractions, then go to work methodically, so many pages a day. There's no question of the divine afflatus. That belongs to another sphere of life. We talk of literature as a trade, not of Homer, Dante, and Shakespeare. If I could only get that into poor Reardon's head, he thinks me a gross beast often enough. What the devil, I mean, what on earth is there in typography to make everything it deals with sacred? I don't advocate the propagation of vicious literature. I speak only of good, coarse, marketable stuff for the world's vulgar. You just give it a thought, Maud. Talk it over with Dora. He resumed presently. I maintain that we people of brains are justified in supplying the mob with the food it likes. We are not geniuses, and if we sit down in a spirit of long-eared gravity, we shall produce only commonplace stuff. Let us use our wits to earn money, and make the best we can of our lives. If only I had the skill, I would produce novels out trashing the trashiest that ever sold fifty thousand copies. But it needs skill, mind you, and to deny it is a gross error of the literary pendants. To please the vulgar, you must, one way or another, incarnate the genius of vulgarity. For my own part, I shan't be able to address the bulkiest multitude. My talent doesn't lend itself to that form. I shall write for the upper middle class of intellect, the people who like to feel that what they are reading has some special cleverness, but who can't distinguish between stones and paste. That's why I'm so slow in warming to the work. Every month I feel surer of myself, however. That last thing of mine in the West End distinctly hit the mark. It wasn't too flashy. It wasn't too solid. I heard fellows speak of it in the train. Mrs. Milvain kept glancing at Maud. With eyes which desired her attention to these utterances. None the less, half an hour after dinner, Jasper found himself encountered by his sister in the garden. On her face a look which warned him of what was coming. I want you to tell me something, Jasper. How much longer shall you look to mother for support? I mean it literally. Let me have an idea of how much longer it will be. He looked away and reflected. To leave a margin, was his reply. Let us say twelve months. 
Better say your favorite ten years at once. No, I speak by the card. In twelve months' time, if not before, I shall begin to pay my debts. My dear girl, I have the honor to be a tolerably long headed individual. I know what I'm about. And let us suppose mother were to die within half a year. I should make shift to do very well. You, and please, what of Dora and me? You would write Sunday school prizes. Maud turned away and left him. He knocked the dust out of the pipe he had been smoking, and again set off for a stroll along the lanes. On his countenance was just a trace of solicitude, but for the most part he wore a thoughtful smile. Now and then he stroked his smoothly shaven jaws with thumb and fingers. Occasionally he became observant of wayside details, of the color of a maple leaf, the shape of a tall thistle, the consistency of a fungus. At the few people who passed he looked keenly, surveying them from head to foot. On turning, at the limit of his walk, he found himself almost face to face with two persons, who were coming along in silent companionship. Their appearance interested him. The one was a man of fifty, grizzled, hard featured, slightly bowed in the shoulders. He wore a grey felt hat with a broad brim and a decent suit of broadcloth. With him was a girl of perhaps two and twenty, in a slate coloured dress with very little ornament, and a yellow straw hat of the shape originally appropriated to males. Her dark hair was cut short and lay in innumerable crisp curls. Father and daughter, obviously. The girl, to a casual eye, was neither pretty nor beautiful. But she had a grave and impressive face, with a complexion of ivory tone. Her walk was gracefully modest, and she seemed to be enjoying the country air. Jasper mused concerning them. When he had walked a few yards, he looked back. At the same moment, the unknown man also turned his head. Where the deuce have I seen them? Him and the girl, too, Milvane asked himself. And before he reached home, the recollection he saw flashed upon his mind. The museum reading room, of course. End of chapter one. Chapter two of New Grub Street. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bridget Gage. New Grub Street by George Gissing. Chapter two. The House of Yule. I think, said Jasper, as he entered the room where his mother and Maud were busy with plain needlework, I must have met Alfred Yule and his daughter. How did you recognize them? Mrs. Milvane inquired. I passed an old buffer and a pale faced girl whom I know by sight at the British Museum. It wasn't near Yule's house, but they were taking a walk. They may have come already. When Miss Harrow was here last, she said, in about a fortnight. No mistaking them for people of these parts, even if I hadn't remembered their faces. Both of them are obvious dwellers in the valley of the shadow of books. Is Miss Yule such a fright then? asked Maud. A fright, not at all. A good example of the modern literary girl. I suppose you have the oddest old fashioned ideas of such people. No, I rather like the look of her. Sympatica, I should think, as that ass Welpdale would say. A very delicate, pure complexion, though morbid. Nice eyes, figure not spoilt yet. But of course, I may be wrong about their identity. Later in the afternoon, Jasper's conjecture was rendered a certainty. Maud had walked to Wattleboro, where she would meet Dora on the latter's return from her teaching, and Mrs. Milvane sat alone, in a mood of depression. There was a ring at the doorbell, and the servant admitted Miss Harrow. This lady acted as housekeeper to Mr. John Yule, a wealthy resident in this neighborhood. She was the sister of his deceased wife. A thin, soft speaking, kindly woman of forty five. The greater part of her life she had spent as a governess. Her position now was more agreeable, and the removal of her anxiety about the future had developed qualities of cheerfulness, which formerly no one would have suspected her to possess. The acquaintance between Mrs. Milvane and her was only of twelve months standing. Prior to that, Mr. Yule had inhabited a house at the end of Wattleboro, remote from Finden. Our London visitors came yesterday, she began by saying. Mrs. Milvane mentioned her son's encounter an hour or two ago. No doubt it was they, said the visitor. Mrs. Yule hasn't come. I hardly expected she would, you know. So very unfortunate when there are difficulties of that kind, isn't it? She smiled confidentially. The poor girl must feel it, said Mrs. Milvane. I'm afraid she does. Of course it narrows the circle of her friends at home. 
"'She's a sweet girl, and I should so like you to meet her. "'Do come and have tea with us tomorrow afternoon, will you? "'Or would it be too much for you just now? "'Will you let the girls call, "'and then perhaps Miss Yule will be so good as to come and see me? "'I wonder whether Mr. Milvane would like to meet her father. "'I have thought that perhaps it might be some advantage to him. "'Alfred is so closely connected with literary people, you know.' "'I feel sure he would be glad,' replied Mrs. Milvane. "'But what of Jasper's friendship with Mrs. Edmund Yule and the Reardons? "'Mightn't it be a little awkward?' "'Oh, I don't think so, unless he himself felt it so. "'There would be no need to mention that, I should say. "'And really, it would be so much better if those estrangements came to an end. "'John makes no scruple of speaking freely about everyone, "'and I don't think Alfred regards Mrs. Edmund with any serious unkindness.' If Mr. Milvane would walk over with the young ladies tomorrow, it would be very pleasant. Then I think I may promise that he will. I'm sure I don't know where he is at this moment. We don't see very much of him, except at meals. He won't be with you much longer, I suppose. Perhaps a week. Before Miss Harrow's departure, Maud and Dora reached home. They were curious to see the young lady from the Valley of the Shadow of Books, and gladly accepted the invitation offered them. They set out on the following afternoon in their brother's company. It was only a quarter of an hour's walk to Mr. Yule's habitation, a small house in a large garden. Jasper was coming hither for the first time. His sisters now and then visited Miss Harrow, but very rarely saw Mr. Yule himself, who made no secret of the fact that he cared little for female society. In Wattleborough and the neighborhood, opinions varied greatly as to this gentleman's character, but women seldom spoke very favorably of him. Miss Harrow was reticent concerning her brother-in-law, no one, however, had any reason to believe that she found life under his roof disagreeable. That she lived with him at all was, of course, occasionally matter for comment, certain Wattleboro ladies having their doubts regarding the position of a deceased wife's sister under such circumstances. But no one was seriously exercised about the relations between this sober lady of forty-five and a man of sixty-three in broken health. A Word of the Family History John Alfred and Edmund Yule were the sons of a Wattleboro stationer. Each was well educated, up to the age of seventeen, at the town's grammar school. The eldest, who was a hot-headed lad, but showed capacities for business, worked at first with his father, endeavoring to add a book-selling department to the trade in stationery. But the life of home was not much to his taste, and at one-and-twenty he obtained a clerk's place in the office of a London newspaper. Three years after, his father died and the small patrimony which fell to him he used in making himself practically acquainted with the details of paper manufacture, his aim being to establish himself in partnership with an acquaintance who had started a small paper mill in Hertfordshire. His speculation succeeded, and as years went on he became a thriving manufacturer. His brother Alfred, in the meantime, had drifted from work at a London bookseller's into the modern Grub Street, his adventures in which region will concern us hereafter. Edmund carried on the Wattleboro business, but with small success. Between him and his eldest brother existed a good deal of affection, and in the end John offered him a share in his flourishing paper works, whereupon Edmund married, deeming himself well established for life. But John's temper was a difficult one. Edmund and he quarreled, parted, and when the younger died, aged about forty, he left but moderate provision for his widow and two children. Only when he had reached middle age did John marry— the experiment could not be called successful, and Mrs. Yule died three years later, childless. At fifty-four, John Yule retired from active business. He came back to the scenes of his early life, and began to take an important part in the municipal affairs of Wattleboro. He was then a remarkably robust man. Fond of out-of-door exercise, he made it one of his chief efforts to encourage the local volunteer movement, the cricket and football clubs, public sports of every kind, showing no sympathy whatever with those persons who wished to establish free libraries, lectures, and the like. At his own expense, he built for the volunteers a handsome drill-shed. He founded a public gymnasium, and finally he allowed it to be rumored that he was going to present the town with a park. But by presuming too far upon the bodily vigor which prompted these activities, he passed of a sudden into the state of a confirmed invalid. On an autumn expedition in the Hebrides, he slept one night under the open sky, with the result that he had an all but fatal attack of rheumatic fever. After that, though the direction of his interest was unchanged, he could no longer set the example to Wattleboro youth of muscular manliness. The infliction did not improve his temper, 
For the next year or two he was constantly at warfare with one or other of his colleagues and friends, ill-brooking that the familiar control of various local interests should fall out of his hands. But before long he appeared to resign himself to his fate, and at present Wattleborough saw little of him. It seemed likely that he might still found the park which was to bear his name, but perhaps it would only be done in consequence of directions in his will. It was believed that he could not live much longer. With his kinsfolk he held very little communication. Alfred Yule, a battered man of letters, had visited Wattleborough only twice, including the present occasion, since John's return hither. Mrs. Edmund Yule, with her daughter, now Mrs. Reardon, had been only once, three years ago. These two families, as you have heard, were not on terms of amity with each other, owing to difficulties between Mrs. Alfred and Mrs. Edmund. But John seemed to regard both impartially. Perhaps the only real warmth of feeling he had ever known was bestowed upon Edmund, and Miss Harrow had remarked that he spoke with somewhat more interest of Edmund's daughter Amy than of Alfred's daughter Marian. But it was doubtful whether the sudden disappearance from the earth of all his relatives would greatly have troubled him. He lived a life of curious self-absorption, reading newspapers, little else, and talking with old friends who had stuck to him in spite of his irascibility. Miss Harrow received her visitors in a small and soberly furnished drawing room. She was nervous, probably because of Jasper Milvane, whom she had met but once, last spring, and who on that occasion had struck her as an alarmingly modern young man. In the shadow of a window curtain sat a slight, simply dressed girl, whose short curly hair and thoughtful countenance Jasper again recognized. When it was his turn to be presented to Miss Yule, he saw that she doubted for an instant whether or not to give her hand. Yet she decided to do so, and there was something very pleasant to him in its warm softness. She smiled with a slight embarrassment, meeting his look only for a second. "'I have seen you several times, Miss Yule,' he said in a friendly way. "'Though without knowing your name, it was under the great dome.' She laughed, readily understanding his phrase. "'I am there often,' was her reply. "'What great dome?' asked Miss Harrow, with surprise." that of the British Museum Reading Room, explained Jasper, known to some of us as the Valley of the Shadow of Books. People who often work there necessarily get to know each other by sight. In the same way I knew Miss Yule's father when I happened to pass him in the road yesterday. The three girls began to converse together, perforce of trivialities. Mary and Yule spoke in rather slow tones, thoughtfully, gently. She had linked her fingers, and laid her hands, palms downwards, upon her lap, a nervous action. Her accent was pure, unpretentious, and she used none of the fashionable turns of speech which would have suggested the habit of intercourse with distinctly metropolitan society. "'You must wonder how we exist in this out-of-the-way place,' remarked Maud. "'Rather, I envy you,' Marian answered, with a slight emphasis. The door opened, and Alfred Yule presented himself. He was tall, and his head seemed a disproportionate culmination to his meagre body. It was so large and massively featured." Intellect and uncertainty of temper were equally marked upon his visage. His brows were knitted in a permanent expression of severity. He had thin, smooth hair, grizzled whiskers, a shaven chin. In the multitudinous wrinkles of his face lay a history of laborious and stormy life. One readily divined in him a struggling and embittered man. Though he looked older than his years, he had by no means the appearance of being beyond the ripeness of his mental vigor. "'It pleases me to meet you, Mr. Milvane,' he said, as he stretched out his bony hand. "'Your name reminds me of a paper in the wayside a month or two ago, which you will perhaps allow a veteran to say was not ill done.' "'I am grateful to you for noticing it,' replied Jasper. There was positively a touch of visible warmth upon his cheek. The illusion had come so unexpectedly that it caused him keen pleasure. Mr. Yule seated himself awkwardly, crossed his legs, and began to stroke the back of his left hand, which lay on his knee. He seemed to have nothing more to say at present, and allowed Miss Harrow and the girls to support conversation. Jasper listened with a smile for a minute or two. Then he addressed the veteran. "'Have you seen the study this week, Mr. Yule?' "'Yes. Did you notice that it contains a very favorable review of a novel which was tremendously abused in the same column three weeks ago?' Mr. Yule started, but Jasper could perceive at once that his emotion was not disagreeable. "'You don't say so?' "'Yes. The novel is Miss Hawkes, on the boards. How will the editor get out of this?' 
Hm. Of course, Mr. Fadge is not immediately responsible, but it'll be unpleasant for him, decidedly unpleasant. He smiled grimly. You hear this, Marian? How is it explained, father? Maybe accident, of course, but, well, there's no knowing. I think it very likely this will be the end of Mr. Fadge's tenure of office. Racket, the proprietor, only wants a plausible excuse for making a change. The paper has been going downhill for the last year. I know of two publishing houses who have withdrawn their advertising from it, and who never send their books for review. Everyone foresaw that kind of thing from the day Mr. Fadge became editor. The tone of his paragraphs has been detestable. Two reviews of the same novel, eh? And diametrically opposed. Ha ha! Gradually he had passed from quiet appreciation of the joke to undisguised mirth and pleasure. His utterance of the name Mr. Fadge sufficiently intimated that he had some cause of personal discontent with the editor of the study. The author, remarked Milvane, ought to make a good thing out of this. Will, no doubt, ought to write at once to the papers, calling attention to this sample of critical impartiality. Ha ha! He rose and went to the window. Where for several minutes he stood gazing at vacancy, the same grim smile still on his face. Jasper, in the meantime, amused the ladies. His sisters had heard him on the subject already, with a description of the two antagonistic notices. But he did not trust himself to express so freely as he had done at home his opinion of reviewing in general. It was more than probable that both Yule and his daughter did a good deal of such work. Suppose we go into the garden, suggested Miss Harrow presently. It seems a shame to sit indoors on such a lovely afternoon. Hitherto there had been no mention of the master of the house, but Mr. Yule now remarked to Jasper, My brother would be glad if you would come and have a word with him. He isn't quite well enough to leave his room today. So, as the ladies went gardenwards, Jasper followed the man of letters upstairs to a room on the first floor. Here, in a deep cane chair, which was placed by the open window, sat John Yule. He was completely dressed, save that instead of a coat he wore a dressing gown. The facial likeness between him and his brother was very strong, but John's would universally have been judged the finer countenance, illness notwithstanding. He had a complexion which contrasted in its pure color with Alfred's parchmenty skin, and there was more finish about his features. His abundant hair was reddish, his long mustache and trimmed beard, a lighter shade of the same hue. So you too are in league with the doctors, was his bluff greeting, as he held a hand to the young man and inspected him with a look of slighting good nature. Well, that certainly is one way of regarding the literary profession, admitted Jasper, who had heard enough of John's way of thinking to understand the remark. A young fellow with all the world before him, too. Hang it, Mr. Milvane, is there no less pernicious work you can turn your hand to? I'm afraid not, Mr. Yule. After all, you know, You must be held in a measure responsible for my depravity. How's that? I understand that you have devoted most of your life to the making of paper. If that article were not so cheap and so abundant, people wouldn't have so much temptation to scribble. Alfred Yule uttered a short laugh. I think you are cornered, John. I wish, answered John, that you were both condemned to write on such paper as I chiefly made. It was a special kind of whitey brown, used by shopkeepers. He chuckled inwardly, and at the same time reached out for a box of cigarettes on a table near him. His brother and Jasper each took one as he offered them, and began to smoke. You would like to see literary production come entirely to an end, said Milvane. I should like to see the business of literature abolished. There's a distinction, of course, but on the whole, I should say that even the business serves a good purpose. What purpose? It helps to spread civilization. Civilization! exclaimed John scornfully. What do you mean by civilization? Do you call it civilizing men to make them weak, flabby creatures, with ruined eyes and dyspeptic stomachs? Who is it that reads most of the stuff that's poured out daily by the ton from the printing press? Just the men and women who ought to spend their leisure hours in open air exercise, the people who earn their bread by sedentary pursuits, and who need to live as soon as they are free from the desk or the counter, not to moon over small print. Your board schools, your popular press, your spread of education. Machinery for ruining the country, that's what I call it. You have done a good deal, I think, to counteract those influences in Wattleboro. I hope so, and if only I had kept the use of my limbs, I'd have done a good deal more. 
I have an idea of offering substantial prizes to men and women engaged in sedentary work, who take an oath to abstain from all reading, and keep it for a certain number of years. There's a good deal more need for that than for abstinence from strong liquor. If I could have had my way, I would have revived prize fighting. His brother laughed with contemptuous impatience. You would doubtless like to see military conscription introduced into England, said Jasper. Of course I should. You talk of civilizing. There's no such way of civilizing the masses of the people as by fixed military service. Before mental training must come training of the body. Go about the continent and see the effect of military service on loutish peasants and the lowest classes of town population. Do you know why it isn't even more successful? Because the damnable education movement interferes. If Germany would shut up her schools and universities for the next quarter of a century and go ahead like blazes with military training, there'd be a nation such as the world has never seen. After that, they might begin a little book teaching again, say an hour and a half a day for everyone above nine years old. Do you suppose, Mr. Milvain, that society is going to be reformed by you people who write for money? Why, you are the very first class that will be swept from the face of the earth as soon as the Reformation really begins. Alfred puffed at his cigarette. His thoughts were occupied with Mr. Fadge and the study. He was considering whether he could aid in bringing public contempt upon that literary organ and its editor. Milvain listened to the elder man's diatribe with much amusement. You now, pursued John, what do you write about? Nothing in particular. I make a salable page or two out of whatever strikes my fancy. Exactly. You don't even pretend that you've got anything to say. You live by inducing people to give themselves mental indigestion, and bodily too, for that matter. Do you know, Mr. Yule, that you have suggested a capital idea to me? If I were to take up your views, I think it isn't at all unlikely that I might make a good thing of writing against writing. It should be my literary specialty to rail against literature. The reading public should pay me for telling them that they oughtn't to read. I must think it over. Carlyle has anticipated you, threw in Alfred. Yes, but in an antiquated way. I would base my polemic on the newest philosophy. He developed the idea facetiously, whilst John regarded him as he might have watched a performing monkey. There again, your new philosophy, exclaimed the invalid. Why, it isn't even wholesome stuff, the kind of reading that most of you force on the public. Now there's the man who has married one of my nieces. Poor lass. Reardon, his name is. You know him, I dare say. Just for curiosity, I had a look at one of his books. It was called The Optimist. Of all the morbid trash I ever saw, that be everything. I thought of writing him a letter, advising a couple of anti-bilious pills before bedtime for a few weeks. Jasper glanced at Alfred Yule. Who wore a look of indifference. That man deserves penal servitude, in my opinion, pursued John. I'm not sure that it isn't my duty to offer him a couple of hundred a year on condition that he writes no more. Milvain, with a clear vision of his friend in London, burst into laughter. But at that point Alfred rose from his chair. Shall we rejoin the ladies? he said, with a certain pedantry of phrase and manner which often characterized him. Think over your ways whilst you're still young, said John, as he shook hands with the visitor. Your brother speaks quite seriously, I suppose, Jasper remarked when he was in the garden with Alfred. I think so. It's amusing now and then, but it gets rather tiresome when you hear it often. By the by, you are not personally acquainted with Mr. Fadge. I didn't even know his name until you mentioned it. The most malicious man in the literary world. There's no uncharitableness in feeling a certain pleasure when he gets into a scrape. I could tell you incredible stories about him. But that kind of thing is probably as little to your taste as it is to mine. Miss Harrow and her companions, having caught sight of the pair, came towards them. Tea was to be brought out into the garden. So you can sit with us and smoke, if you like, said Miss Harrow to Alfred. You are never quite at your ease, I think, without a pipe. But the man of letters was too preoccupied for society. In a few minutes he begged that the ladies would excuse his withdrawing. He had two or three letters to write before post time, which was early at Finden. Jasper, relieved by the veteran's departure, began at once to make himself very agreeable company. When he chose to lay aside the topic of his own difficulties and ambitions, he could converse with a spontaneous gaiety which readily won the good will of listeners. Naturally he addressed himself very often to Marion Yule, whose attention complimented him. She said little, 
and evidently was at no time a free talker. But the smile on her face indicated a mood of quiet enjoyment. When her eyes wandered, it was to rest on the beauties of the garden, the moving patches of golden sunshine, the forms of gleaming cloud. Jasper liked to observe her as she turned her head. There seemed to him a particular grace in the movement. Her head and neck were admirably formed, and the short hair drew attention to this. It was agreed that Miss Harrow and Marian should come on the second day after to have tea with the Milvanes, and when Jasper took leave of Alfred Yule, the latter expressed a wish that they might have a walk together one of these mornings. End of chapter two. Chapter three, part one of New Grub Street. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bridget Gage. New Grub Street by George Gissing. Chapter three, part one. Holiday. Jasper's favorite walk led him to a spot distant perhaps a mile and a half from home. From a tract of common, he turned into a short lane. Which crossed the Great Western Railway, and thence by a stile into certain meadows forming a compact little valley. One recommendation of this retreat was that it lay sheltered from all winds. To Jasper, a wind was objectionable. Along the bottom ran a clear, shallow stream, overhung with elder and hawthorn bushes, and close by the wooden bridge which spanned it was a great ash tree, making shadow for cows and sheep when the sun lay hot upon the open field. It was rare for any one to come along this path, save farm laborers morning and evening. But today, the afternoon that followed his visit to John Yule's house, he saw from a distance that his lounging place on the wooden bridge was occupied. Some one else had discovered the pleasure there was in watching the sun flecked sparkle of the water as it flowed over the clean sand and stones. A girl in a yellow straw hat, yes, and precisely the person he had hoped, at the first glance, that it might be. He made no haste as he drew nearer on the descending path. At length his footstep was heard. Marian Yule turned her head and clearly recognized him. She assumed an upright position, letting one of her hands rest upon the rail. After the exchange of ordinary greetings, Jasper leaned back against the same support and showed himself disposed for talk. When I was here late in the spring, he said, this ash was only just budding, though everything else seemed in full leaf. An ash, is it? murmured Marian. I didn't know. I think an oak is the only tree I can distinguish. Yet, she added quickly, I knew that the ash was late. Some lines of Tennyson come to my memory. Which are those? Delaying, as the tender ash delays, to clothe herself when all the woods are green. Somewhere in the idols. I don't remember, so I won't pretend to, though I should do so as a rule. She looked at him oddly. And seemed about to laugh, yet did not. You have had little experience of the country, Jasper continued. Very little. You, I think, have known it from childhood. In a sort of way. I was born in Wattleboro, and my people have always lived here. But I am not very rural in temperament. I have really no friends here. Either they have lost interest in me, or I in them. What do you think of the girls, my sisters? The question, though put with perfect simplicity, was embarrassing. They are tolerably intellectual, Jasper went on, when he saw that it would be difficult for her to answer. I want to persuade them to try their hands at literary work of some kind or other. They give lessons, and both hate it. Would literary work be less burdensome? said Marian, without looking at him. Rather more so, you think? She hesitated. It depends, of course, on, on several things. To be sure, Jasper agreed. I don't think they have any marked faculty for such work, but as they certainly haven't for teaching, that doesn't matter. It's a question of learning a business. I am going through my apprenticeship and find it a long affair. Money would shorten it, and unfortunately, I have none. Yes, said Marian, turning her eyes upon the stream. Money is a help in everything. Without it, one spends the best part of one's life in toiling for that first foothold which money could at once purchase. To have money is becoming of more and more importance in a literary career, principally because to have money is to have friends. Year by year, such influence grows of more account. 
A lucky man will still occasionally succeed by dint of his own honest perseverance. But the chances are dead against anyone who can't make private interest with influential people. His work is simply overwhelmed by that of the men who have better opportunities. Don't you think that even today, really good work will sooner or later be recognized? Later rather than sooner, and very likely the man can't wait. He starves in the meantime. You understand that I am not speaking of genius. I mean marketable literary work. The quantity turned out is so great that there's no hope for the special attention of the public unless one can afford to advertise hugely. Take the instance of a successful all round man of letters. Take Ralph Warbury, whose name you'll see in the first magazine you happen to open. But perhaps he is a friend of yours. Oh, no. Well, I wasn't going to abuse him. I was only going to ask. Is there any quality which distinguishes his work from that of twenty struggling writers one could name? Of course not. He's a clever, prolific man. So are they. But he began with money and friends. He came from Oxford into the thick of advertised people. His name was mentioned in print six times a week before he had written a dozen articles. This kind of thing will become the rule. Men won't succeed in literature that they may get into society, but will get into society that they may succeed in literature. Yes, I know it is true, said Marian, in a low voice. There's a friend of mine who writes novels, Jasper pursued. His books are not works of genius, but they are glaringly distinct from the ordinary circulating novel. Well, after one or two attempts, he made half a success. That is to say, the publishers brought out a second edition of the book in a few months. There was his opportunity, but he couldn't use it. He had no friends because he had no money. A book of half that merit, if written by a man in the position of Warbury when he started, would have established the reputation of a lifetime. His influential friends would have referred to it in leaders, in magazine articles, in speeches, in sermons. It would have run through numerous editions, and the author would have had nothing to do but write another book and demand his price. But the novel I'm speaking of was practically forgotten a year after its appearance. It was whelmed beneath the flood of next season's literature. Marian urged a hesitating objection. But under the circumstances, wasn't it in the author's power to make friends? Was money really indispensable? Why, yes, because he chose to marry. As a bachelor, he might possibly have got into the right circles, though his character would in any case have made it difficult for him to curry favor. But as a married man, without means, the situation was hopeless. Once married, you must live up to the standard of the society you frequent. You can't be entertained without entertaining in return. Now, if his wife had brought him only a couple of thousand pounds, all might have been well. I should have advised him, in sober seriousness, to live for two years at the rate of a thousand a year. At the end of that time, he would have been earning enough to continue at pretty much the same rate of expenditure. Perhaps. Well, I ought rather to say that the average man of letters would be able to do that. As for Reardon, he stopped. The name had escaped him unawares. Reardon, said Marian, looking up, you are speaking of him? I have betrayed myself, Miss Yule. But what does it matter? You have only spoken in his favor. I feared the name might affect you disagreeably. Marian delayed her reply. It is true, she said. We are not on friendly terms with my cousin's family. I have never met Mr. Reardon. But I shouldn't like you to think that the mention of his name is disagreeable to me. It made me slightly uncomfortable yesterday, the fact that I am well acquainted with Mrs. Entbund Yule and that Reardon is my friend. Yet I didn't see why that should prevent my making your father's acquaintance. Surely not. I shall say nothing about it. I mean, as you uttered the name unintentionally. There was a pause in the dialogue. They had been speaking almost confidentially, and Marian seemed to become suddenly aware of an oddness in the situation. She turned towards the uphill path, as if thinking of resuming her walk. You are tired of standing still, said Jasper. May I walk back a part of the way with you? Thank you, I shall be glad. They went on for a few minutes in silence. Have you published anything with your signature, Miss Yule? Jasper at length inquired. Nothing. I only help father a little. The silence that again followed was broken this time by Marian. When you chanced to mention Mr. Reardon's name, she said, with the diffident smile in which lay that suggestion of humor so delightful upon a woman's face, 
"'You were going to say something more about him.' "'Only that,' he broke off and laughed. "'Now, how boyish it was, wasn't it? "'I remember doing just the same thing once when I came home from school "'and had an exciting story to tell, with preservation of anonymities. "'Of course I blurted out a name in the first minute or two, "'to my father's great amusement. "'He told me that I hadn't the diplomatic character. "'I have been trying to acquire it ever since.' "'But why?' "'It's one of the essentials of success in any kind of public life. "'And I mean to succeed, you know. "'I feel that I am one of the men who do succeed. "'But I beg your pardon. You asked me a question. "'Really, I was only going to say of Reardon what I had said before, "'that he hasn't the tact requisite for acquiring popularity. "'Then I may hope that it isn't his marriage with my cousin "'which has proved a fatal misfortune.' "'In no case,' replied Milvain, averting his look, "'would he have used his advantages. "'And now, do you think he has but poor prospects? "'I wish I could see any chance of his being estimated at his right value. "'It's very hard to say what is before him.' "'I knew my cousin Amy when we were children,' said Marian, presently. "'She gave promise of beauty. "'Yes, she is beautiful. "'And the kind of woman to be of help to such a husband?' "'I hardly know how to answer, Miss Yule,' said Jasper, looking frankly at her. "'Perhaps I had better say that it's unfortunate they are poor.' Marian cast down her eyes. "'To whom isn't it a misfortune?' pursued her companion. "'Poverty is the root of all social ills. "'Its existence accounts even for the ills that arise from wealth. "'The poor man is a man laboring in fetters. "'I declare there is no word in our language which sounds so hideous to me as poverty.' Shortly after this they came to the bridge over the railway line. Jasper looked at his watch. "'Will you indulge me in a piece of childishness?' he said. "'In less than five minutes a London express goes by. I have often watched it here, and it amuses me. Would it weary you to wait?' "'I should like to,' she replied with a laugh. The line ran along a deep cutting, from either side of which grew hazel bushes and a few larger trees. Leaning upon the parapet of the bridge— Jasper kept his eye in the westward direction, where the gleaming rails were visible for more than a mile. Suddenly he raised his finger. "'You hear?' Marian had just caught the far-off sound of the train. She looked eagerly, and in a few moments saw it approaching. The front of the engine blackened nearer and nearer, coming on with dread force and speed. A blinding rush, and there burst against the bridge a great valley of sunlit steam— Milvane and his companion ran to the opposite parapet, but already the whole train had emerged, and in a few seconds it had disappeared round a sharp curve. The leafy branches that grew out over the line swayed violently backwards and forwards in the perturbed air. "'If I were ten years younger,' said Jasper, laughing, "'I should say that was jolly. It inspirits me. It makes me feel eager to go back and plunge into the fight again.' "'Upon me it has just the opposite effect.' "'fell from Marian, in very low tones. "'Oh, don't say that. "'Well, it only means that you haven't had enough holiday yet. "'I have been in the country more than a week. "'A few days more, and I must be off. "'How long do you think of staying?' "'Not much more than a week, I think. "'By the by, you are coming to have tea with us to-morrow,' "'Jasper remarked, a propos of nothing. "'Then he returned to another subject that was in his thoughts. "'It was by a train like that that I first went up to London.' "'Not really the first time. I mean when I went to live there, seven years ago. "'What spirits I was in! A boy of eighteen going to live independently in London. Think of it. "'You went straight from school? "'I was for two years at Redmayne College, after leaving Wattleborough Grammar School. "'Then my father died, and I spent nearly half a year at home. "'I was meant to be a teacher, but the prospect of entering a school by no means appealed to me.' A friend of mine was studying in London for some civil service exam, so I declared that I would go and do the same thing. Did you succeed? Not I. I never worked properly for that kind of thing. I read voraciously, and got to know London. I might have gone to the dogs, you know, but by when I had been in London a year, a pretty clear purpose began to form in me. Strange to think that you were growing up there all the time. I may have passed you in the street now and then. Marian laughed. "'And I did at length see you at the British Museum, you know.' "'They turned a corner of the road, and came full upon Marian's father, "'who was walking in this direction, with eyes fixed upon the ground. "'So here you are,' he exclaimed, looking at the girl, 
and for the moment paying no attention to Jasper. I wondered whether I should meet you. Then, more dryly, How do you do, Mr. Milvain? In a tone of easy indifference, Jasper explained how he came to be accompanying Miss Yule. Shall I walk on with you, father? Marian asked, scrutinizing his rugged features. Just as you please. I don't know that I should have gone much further, but we might take another way back. Jasper readily adapted himself to the wish he discerned in Mr. Yule. At once he offered leave taking in the most natural way. Nothing was said on either side about another meeting. The young man proceeded homewards, but on arriving did not at once enter the house. Behind the garden was a field used for the grazing of horses. He entered it by the unfastened gate, and strolled idly hither and thither, now and then standing to observe a poor worn out beast, all skin and bone, which had presumably been sent here in the hope that a little more labor might still be exacted from it if it were suffered to repose for a few weeks. There were sores upon its back and legs. It stood in a fixed attitude of despondency, just flicking away troublesome flies with its grizzled tail. It was tea time when he went in. Maud was not at home, and Mrs. Milvain, tormented by a familiar headache, kept her room. So Jasper and Dora sat down together. Each had an open book on the table. Throughout the meal, they exchanged only a few words. Going to play a little? Jasper suggested, when they had gone into the sitting room. If you like. She sat down at the piano, whilst her brother lay on the sofa, his hands clasped beneath his head. Dora did not play badly, but an absent mindedness, which was commonly observable in her, had its effect upon the music. She at length broke off idly in the middle of a passage, and began to linger on careless chords. Then, without turning her head, she asked, Were you serious in what you said about writing story books? End of chapter 3, part 1. Chapter Three, Part Two of New Grub Street. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chessie. New Grub Street by George Gissing. Chapter Three, Part Two. Quiet. I see no reason why you shouldn't do something in that way. But I tell you what. When I get back, I'll inquire into the state of the market. I know a man who was once engaged at Jolly and Monks, the chief publishers of that kind of thing, you know. I must look him up. What a mistake it is to neglect any acquaintance and get some information out of him. But it's obvious what an immense field there is for anyone who can just hit the taste of the new generation of board school children. Mustn't be too goody goody. That kind of thing is falling out of date. But you'd have to cultivate a particular kind of vulgarity. There's an idea, by the by. I write a paper on the characteristics of that new generation. It may bring me a few guineas, and it would be a help to you. But what do you know about the subject? asked Dora doubtfully. What a comical question! It is my business to know something about every subject, or to know where to get the knowledge. Well, said Dora after a pause, there's no doubt Mort and I ought to think very seriously about the future. You are aware, Jasper, that Mother has not been able to save a penny of her income. I don't see how she could have done. Of course, I know what you're thinking. But for me, it would have been possible. I don't mind confessing to you that a thought troubles me a little now and then. I shouldn't like to see you two going off governessing in strangers' houses. All I can say is that I am very honestly working for the end which I am convinced will be most profitable. I shall not desert you, you needn't fear that, but just put your heads together and cultivate your writing faculty. Suppose you could both together earn about a hundred a year in Grub Street. It would be better than governessing, wouldn't it? You say you don't know what Miss Yule writes? Well, I know a little more about her than I did yesterday. I've had an hour's talk with her this afternoon. Indeed? Met her down in the Leggett fields. I find she doesn't write independently, just helps her father. What the help amounts to, I can't say. There's something very attractive about her. 
she quoted a line or two of Tennyson, the first time I ever heard a woman speak blank words with any kind of decency. She was walking alone? Yes. On the way back we met old Yule. He seemed rather grumpy, I thought. I don't think she's the kind of girl to make a paying business of literature. Her qualities are personal, and it's pretty clear to me that the valley of the shadow of books by no means agrees with her disposition. Possibly old Yule is something of a tyrant. He doesn't impress me very favorably. Do you think you will keep up their acquaintance in London? Can't say. I wonder what sort of a woman that mother really is. Can't be so very gross, I should think. Miss Harrow knows nothing about her except that she was a quite uneducated girl. But dash it, by this time she must have got decent manners. Of course, there may be other objections. Mrs. Reardon knows nothing against her. Midway in the following morning, as Jasper sat with a book in the garden, he was surprised to see Alfred Yule enter by the gate. I thought, began the visitor, who seemed in high spirits, that you might like to see something I received this morning. He unfolded a London evening paper and indicated a long letter from a casual correspondent. It was written by the authoress of On the Boards and drew attention, with much expenditure of witticism, to the conflicting notices of that book which had appeared in the study. Jasper read the thing with laughing appreciation. Just what one expected. And I have private letters on the subject, added Mr. Yule. There has been something like a personal conflict between Fetch and the man who looks after the minor notices. Fetch, more so, charged the other man with a design to damage him and the paper. There's talk of legal proceedings. An immense joke. He laughed in his peculiar, croaking way. Do you feel disposed for a turn along the lanes, Mr. Milwain? By all means. There's my mother at the window. Will you come in for a moment? With a step of quite unusual sprightliness, Mr. Yule entered the house. He could talk of but one subject and Mrs. Milwain had to listen to a laboured account of the blunder just committed by the study. It was Alfred's new characteristic that he could do nothing light-handedly. He seemed always to converse with effort. He took a seat with stiff ungainliness. He walked with a stumbling or sprawling gait. When he and Jasper set out for their ramble, his loquacity was in strong contrast with the taciturn mood he had exhibited yesterday and the day before. He fell upon the general aspects of contemporary literature. The evil of the time is the multiplication of ephemerides. Hence a demand for essays, descriptive articles, fragments of criticism out of all proportion to the supply of even tolerable work. The men who have an aptitude for turning out this kind of thing in vast quantities are enlisted by every new periodical with the result that their productions are ultimately watered down into worthlessness. Well now, there's Fetch. Years ago, some of Fetch's work was not without a certain... a certain conditional promise of... of comparative merit. But now his writing, in my opinion, is altogether beneath consideration. How Racket could be so benighted as to give him the study especially after a man like Henry Hawkridge, passes my comprehension. Did you read a paper of his a few months back in the wayside, a preposterous rehabilitation of Elkanah Settle? Ha ha, that's what such men are driven to, Elkanah Settle, and he hadn't even a competent acquaintance with his poetry subject. Will you credit that he twice or thrice referred to Settle's reply to Absalom and Akitofo, by the title of Absalom Transposed, when every schoolgirl knows that the thing was called Akitofo Transposed. This was monstrous enough, but there was something still more contemptible. He positively, I assure you, attributed the play of Absom Wells to Crown. I should have presumed that every student of even the most trivial prime of literature was aware that Epsom Wells was written by Shadwell. Now, if one were to take Shadwell for the subject of a paper, 
one might very well show how unjustly his name has fallen into contempt. It has often occurred to me to do this. But Shadwell never deviates into sense. The sneer, in my opinion, is entirely unmerited. For my own part, I put Shadwell very high among the dramatists of his time, and I think I could show that his absolute worth is by no means inconsiderable. Shadwell has distinct vigor of dramatic conception, his dialogue, and as he talked, the man kept describing imaginary geometrical figures with the end of his walking stick. He very seldom raised his eyes from the ground, and the stoop in his shoulders grew more and more pronounced, until at a little distance one might have taken him for a hunchback. At one point, Jasper made a pause to speak of the pleasant, wooded prospect that lay before them. His companion regarded it absently, and in a moment or two asked, Did you ever come across Cottle's poem on the Malvern Hills? No? It contains a couple of the richest lines ever put into print. It needs the evidence of close deduction to know that I shall ever reach the top. Perfectly serious poetry, mind you. He barked in laughter. Impossible to interest him in anything apart from literature. Yet one saw him to be a man of solid understanding and not without perception of humor. He had read vastly. His memory was a literary cyclopedia. His failings, obvious enough, were the result of a strong and somewhat pedantic individuality ceaselessly at conflict with unpropitious circumstances. Towards the young man his demeanor varied between a shy cordiality and a dignified reserve which was in danger of seeming pretentious. On the homeward part of the walk he made a few discreet inquiries regarding Milwain's literary achievements and prospects and the frank self-confidence of the replies appeared to interest him. But he expressed no desire to number Jasper among his acquaintances in town, and of his own professional or private concerns he said not a word. "'Whether he could be any use to me or not, I don't exactly know,' Jasper remarked to his mother and sisters at dinner. "'I suspect it's as much as he can do to keep a footing among the younger tradesmen.' but I think he might have said he was willing to help me if he could. Perhaps, replied Maud, your large way of talking made him think any such offer superfluous. You have still to learn, said Jasper, that modesty helps a man in no department of modern life. People take you at your own valuation. It's the men who declare boldly that they need no help, to whom practical help comes from all sides. As likely as not, you will mention my name to someone. A young fellow who seems to see his way pretty clear before him. The other man will repeat it to somebody else. A young fellow whose way is clear before him. And so I come to the ears of a man who thinks, Just the fellow I want. I must look him up and ask him if he'll do such and such a thing. But I should like to see these youths at home. I must fish for an invitation. In the afternoon, Miss Harrow and Marian came at the expected hour. Jasper purposely kept out of the way until he was summoned to the tea-table. The Millwing girls were so far from effusive even towards old acquaintances that even the people who knew them best spoke of them as rather cold and perhaps a trifle condescending. There were people in Wattleboro who declared their airs of superiority ridiculous and insufferable. The truth was that nature had endowed them with a larger share of brains than was common in their circle, and had added that touch of pride which harmonized so ill with the restrictions of poverty. Their life had a tone of melancholy, the painful reserve which characterizes a certain clearly defined class in the present day. Had they been born twenty years earlier, the children of that veterinary surgeon would have grown up to a very different and in all probability a much happier existence, for their education would have been limited to the strictly needful, and, certainly in the case of the girls, nothing would have encouraged them to look beyond the simple life possible to a poor man's offspring. But whilst Maud and Dora were still with their homely schoolmistress, 
Wattleboro saw fit to establish a girl's high school, and the moderateness of the fees enabled these sisters to receive an intellectual training wholly incompatible with the material conditions of their life. To the relatively poor, who are so much worse off than the poor absolutely, education is in most cases a mocking cruelty. The burden of their brother's support made it very difficult for Maud and Dora even to dress as became their intellectual station. Amusements, holidays, the purchase of such simple luxuries as were all but indispensable to them could not be thought of. It resulted that they held apart from the society which would have welcomed them, for they could not bear to receive without offering in turn. The necessity of giving lessons galled them. They felt, and with every reason, that it made their position ambiguous, so that, though they could not help knowing many people, they had no intimates. They encouraged no one to visit them, and visited other houses as little as might be. In Mary and Yule they divined a sympathetic nature. She was unlike any girl with whom they had hitherto associated, and it was the impulse of both to receive her with unusual friendliness. The habit of reticence could not be at once overcome, and Marian's own timidity was an obstacle in the way of free intercourse. But Jasper's conversation at tea helped to smooth the course of things. "'I wish you lived anywhere near us,' Dora said to their visitor as the three girls walked in the garden afterwards, and Maud echoed the wish. "'It would be very nice,' was Marian's reply. "'I have no friends of my own age in London.' "'None?' "'Not one.' She was about to add something, but in the end kept silence. "'You seem to get along with Miss Ewell pretty well, after all,' said Jasper, when the family were alone again. "'Did you anticipate anything else?' Maud asked. "'It seemed doubtful up at Ewell's house. "'Well, get her to come here again before I go.' "'But it's a pity she doesn't play the piano,' he added musingly. For two days nothing was seen of the Yules. Jasper went each afternoon to the stream in the valley, but did not again meet Marian. In the meanwhile he was growing restless. A fortnight always exhausted his capacity for enjoying the companionship of his mother and sisters, and this time he seemed anxious to get to the end of his holiday. For all that, there was no continuance of the domestic bickering which had begun. Whatever the reason, Maud behaved with unusual mildness to her brother, and Jasper, in turn, was gently disposed to both the girls. On the morning of the third day, it was Saturday, he kept silence through breakfast, and, just as all were about to rise from the table, he made a sudden announcement. "'I shall go to London this afternoon.' "'This afternoon!' all exclaimed. "'But Monday is your day!' No, I shall go this afternoon by the 2.45. And he left the room. Mrs. Milwain and the girls exchanged looks. I suppose he thinks the Sunday will be too wearisome, said the mother. Perhaps so, Maud agreed carelessly. Half an hour later, just as Dora was ready to leave the house for her engagements in Wattleboro, her brother came into the hall and took his hat, saying, I'll walk a little way with you, if you don't mind. When they were in the road, he asked her in an offhand manner, Do you think I ought to say goodbye to the Yules? Or won't it signify? I should have thought you would wish to. I don't care about it. And, you see, there's been no hint of a wish on their part that I should see them in London. No, I'll just leave you to say goodbye for me. But they expect to see us today or tomorrow. You told them you were not going till Monday, and you don't know, but Mr. Yule might mean to say something yet. Well, I'd rather he didn't, replied Jasper with a laugh. Oh, indeed? I don't mind telling you, he laughed again. I'm afraid of that girl. No, it won't do. You understand that I'm a practical man, and I shall keep clear of dangers. 
These days of holiday idleness put all sorts of nonsense into one's head. Dora kept her eyes down and smiled ambiguously. You must act as you think fit, she remarked at length. Exactly. Now I'll turn back. You'll be with us at dinner? They parted. But Jasper did not keep to the straight way home. First of all he loitered to watch a reaping machine at work. Then he turned into a lane which led up the hill on which was John Newell's house. Even if he had purposed making a farewell call, it was still far too early. All he wanted to do was to pass an hour of the morning which threatened to lie heavy on his hands. So he rambled on and went past the house, and took the field path which would lead him circuitously home again. His mother desired to speak to him. She was in the dining room. In the parlor, Maud was practicing music. "'I think I ought to tell you of something I did yesterday, Jasper,' Mrs. Milwain began. "'You see, my dear, we have been rather straitened lately, and my health, you know, grows so uncertain, and, all things considered, I have been feeling very anxious about the girls. So I wrote to your uncle William and told him that I must positively have that money.' I must think of my own children before his. The matter referred to was this. The deceased Mr. Milwain had a brother who was a struggling shopkeeper in a midland town. Some ten years ago William Milwain, on the point of bankruptcy, had borrowed a hundred and seventy pounds from his brother in Wattleboro, and this debt was still unpaid. For on the death of Jasper's father, repayment of the loan was impossible for William and since then it had seemed hopeless that the sum would ever be recovered. The poor shopkeeper had a large family, and Mrs. Milwain, notwithstanding her own position, had never felt able to press him. Her relative, however, often spoke of the business, and declared his intention of paying whenever he could. "'You can't recover by law now, you know,' said Jasper. "'But we have a right to the money, law or no law.' He must pay it. He will simply refuse, and be justified. Poverty doesn't allow of honorable feeling any more than of compassion. I'm sorry you wrote like that. You won't get anything, and you might as well have enjoyed the reputation of forbearance. Mrs. Milwain was not able to appreciate this characteristic remark. Anxiety weighed upon her, and she became irritable. I'm obliged to say, Jasper, that you seem rather thoughtless. If it were only myself, I would make any sacrifice for you, but you must remember. Now, listen, mother, he interrupted, laying a hand on her shoulder. I have been thinking about all this, and the fact of the matter is I shall do my best to ask you for no more money. It may or may not be practicable, but I'll have a try. So don't worry. If Uncle writes that he can't pay, just explain why you wrote, and keep him gently in mind of the thing. That's all. One doesn't like to do brutal things if one can avoid them, you know. The young man went to the parlor and listened to Maud's music for a while. But restlessness again drove him forth. Towards eleven o'clock he was again ascending in the direction of John Ewell's house. Again he had no intention of calling, but when he reached the iron gates he lingered. I will by chaff, he said within himself at last, just to prove I have complete command of myself. It's to be a display of strength, not weakness. At the house door he inquired for Mr. Alfred Yule. That gentleman had gone in a carriage to Wattleboro half an hour ago with his brother. Miss Yule? Yes, she was within. Jasper entered the sitting room, waited a few moments, and Marian appeared. She wore a dress in which Milvane had not yet seen her, and it had the effect of making him regard her attentively. The smile with which she had come towards him passed from her face, which was perchance a little warmer of hue than commonly. "'I'm sorry your father's away, Miss Yule,' Jasper began in an animated voice. "'I wanted to say good-bye to him. I return to London in a few hours.' You are going sooner than you intended? Yes, I feel I mustn't waste any more time. 
I think the country air is doing you good. You certainly look better than when I passed you that first day. I feel better, much. My sisters are anxious to see you again. I shouldn't wonder if they come up this afternoon. Marian had seated herself on the sofa, and her hands were linked upon her lap in the same way as when Jasper spoke with her here before, the palms downward. The beautiful outline of her bent head was relieved against a broad strip of sunlight on the wall behind her. They deplore, he continued in a moment, that they should come to know you only to lose you again so soon. I have quite as much reason to be sorry, she answered, looking at him with the slightest possible smile. But perhaps they will let me write to them and hear from them now and then. They would think it an honor. Country girls are not often invited to correspond with literary ladies in London. He said it with as much jocoseness as civility allowed, then at once rose. Father will be very sorry, Marian began, with one quick glance towards the window, and then another towards the door. Perhaps he might possibly be able to see you before you go. Jasper stood in hesitation. There was a look on the girl's face, which, under other circumstances, would have suggested a ready answer. "'I mean,' she added hastily, "'he might just call or even see you at the station?' "'Oh, I shouldn't like to give Mr. Yule any trouble. It's my own fault for deciding to go today. I shall leave by the 2.45.' He offered his hand. "'I shall look for your name in the magazines, Miss Yule.' Oh, I don't think you will ever find it there. He laughed incredulously, shook hands with her a second time, and strode out of the room, head erect, feeling proud of himself. When Dora came home at dinner time, he informed her of what he had done. A very interesting girl, he added impartially. I advise you to make a friend of her. Who knows, but you may live in London some day, and then she might be valuable. "'Morally, I mean. "'For myself, I shall do my best not to see her again for a long time. "'She's dangerous.' "'Jasper was unaccompanied when he went to the station. "'Whilst waiting on the platform, he suffered from apprehension, "'lest Alfred Yule's seemed visage should present itself. "'But no acquaintance approached him. "'Safe in the corner of his third-class carriage, "'he smiled at the last glimpses of the familiar fields.' and began to think of something he had decided to write for the West End. End of chapter 3, part 2Recording by Alan Brown New Grub Street by George Gissing Chapter 4 An Author and His Wife Eight flights of stairs, consisting alternately of eight and nine steps. Amy had made the calculation, and wondered what was the cause of this arrangement. The ascent was trying, but then no one could contest the respectability of the abode. In the flat immediately beneath resided a successful musician, whose carriage and pair came at a regular hour each afternoon to take him and his wife for a most respectable drive. In this special building no one else seemed at present to keep a carriage, but all the tenants were gentlefolk. And as to living up at the very top, why there were distinct advantages, as so many people of moderate income are nowadays hastening to discover. The noise from the street was diminished at this height. No possible tramplers could establish themselves above your head. The air was bound to be purer than that of inferior strata. Finally one had the flat roof whereon to sit or expatiate in sunny weather. True that a gentle rain of soot was wont to interfere with one's comfort out there, in the open, but such minutiae are easily forgotten in the fervor of domestic description. It was undeniable that on a fine day 
one enjoyed extensive views the green ridge from hampstead to highgate with primrose hill and the foliage of regent's park in the foreground the suburban spaces of st john's wood maida vale kilburn westminster abbey and the houses of parliament lying low by the side of the hidden river and a glassy gleam on far-off hills which meant the crystal palace then the clouded majesty of eastern london crowned by st paul's dome these things one's friends were expected to admire sunset often afforded rich effects but they were for solitary musing a sitting-room a bedroom a kitchen but the kitchen was called dining-room or even parlour at need for the cooking range lent itself to concealment behind an ornamental screen the walls displayed pictures and bookcases and a tiny scullery which lay apart sufficed for the coarser domestic operations this was amy's territory during the hours when her husband was working or endeavouring to work of necessity edwin reardon used the front room as his study his writing-table stood against the window each wall had its shelves of serried literature vases busts engravings all of the inexpensive kind served for ornaments a maidservant recently emancipated from the board school came at half-past seven each morning and remained until two o'clock by which time the reardons had dined on special occasions her services were enlisted for later hours but it was reardon's habit to begin the serious work of the day at about three o'clock and to continue with brief interruptions until ten or eleven in many respects an awkward arrangement but enforced by the man's temperament and his poverty one evening he sat at his desk with a slip of manuscript paper before him it was the hour of sunset his outlook was upon the backs of certain large houses skirting regent's park and lights had begun to show here and there in the windows. In one room a man was discoverable, dressing for dinner. He had not thought it worth while to lower the blind. In another, some people were playing billiards. The higher windows reflected a rich glow from the western sky. For two or three hours Reardon had been seated in much the same attitude. Occasionally he dipped his pen into the ink and seemed about to write but each time the effort was abortive. At the head of the paper was inscribed, Chapter 3, but that was all. And now the sky was dusking over. Darkness would soon fall. He looked something older than his years, which were two and thirty. On his face was the pallor of mental suffering. Often he fell into a fit of absence and gazed at vacancy with wide, miserable eyes. Returning to consciousness, he fidgeted nervously on his chair, dipped his pen for the hundredth time, bent forward in feverish determination to work. Useless. He scarcely knew what he wished to put into words, and his brain refused to construct the simplest sentence. The colors faded from the sky, and night came quickly. Reardon threw his arms upon the desk, let his head fall forward, and remained so as if asleep. Presently the door opened, and a young, clear voice made inquiry. "'Don't you want the lamp, Edwin?' The man roused himself, turned his chair a little, and looked towards the open door. "'Come here, Amy.' His wife approached. It was not quite dark in the room, for a glimmer came from the opposite houses. "'What's the matter? Can't you do anything?' I haven't written a word today. At this rate, one goes crazy. Come and sit by me a minute, dearest. I'll get the lamp. No, come and talk to me. We can understand each other better. Nonsense. You have such morbid ideas. I can't bear to sit in the gloom. At once she went away and quickly reappeared with a reading lamp, which she placed on the square table in the middle of the room. Draw down the blind, Edwin. She was a slender girl, but not very tall. 
her shoulders seemed rather broad in proportion to her waist and the part of her figure below it the hue of her hair was ruddy gold loosely arranged tresses made a superb crown to the beauty of her small refined head yet the face was not of distinctly feminine type with short hair and appropriate clothing she would have passed unquestioned as a handsome boy of seventeen a spirited boy too and one much in the habit of giving orders to inferiors her nose would have been perfect but for ever so slight a crook which made it preferable to view it in full face than in profile her lips curved sharply out and when she straightened them of a sudden the effect was not reassuring to any one who had counted upon her for facile humour in harmony with the broad shoulders she had a strong neck as she bore the lamp into the room a slight turn of her head showed splendid muscles from the ear downward it was a magnificently clear-cut bust one thought in looking at her of the newly finished head which some honest sculptor has wrought with his own hand from the marble block there was a suggestion of planes and of the chisel the atmosphere was cold ruddiness would have been quite out of place on her cheeks and a flush must have been the rarest thing there her age was not quite twenty-two she had been wedded nearly two years and had a child ten months old as for her dress it was unpretending in fashion and colour but of admirable fit every detail of her appearance denoted scrupulous personal refinement she walked well you saw that the foot however gently was firmly planted when she seated herself her posture was instantly graceful and that of one who is indifferent about support for the back what is the matter she began why can't you get on with the story it was the tone of friendly remonstrance not exactly of affection not at all of tender solicitude reardon had risen and wished to approach her but could not do so directly he moved to another part of the room then came round to the back of her chair and bent his face upon her shoulder amy well i think it's all over with me i don't think i shall write any more don't be so foolish dear what is to prevent your writing perhaps i am only out of sorts but i begin to be horribly afraid my will seems to be fatally weakened i can't see my way to the end of anything if i get hold of an idea which seems good all the sap has gone out of it before i have got it into working shape in these last few months i must have begun a dozen different books i have been ashamed to tell you of each new beginning i write twenty pages perhaps and then my courage fails i am disgusted with the thing and can't go on with it can't my fingers refuse to hold the pen in mere writing i have done enough to make much more than three volumes but it's all destroyed because of your morbid conscientiousness there was no need to destroy what you had written it was all good enough for the market don't use that word amy i hate it you can't afford to hate it was her rejoinder in very practical tones however it was before you must write for the market now you have admitted that yourself he kept silence where are you she went on to ask what have you actually done two short chapters of a story i can't go on with the three volumes lie before me like an interminable desert impossible to get through them the idea is stupidly artificial and i haven't a living character in it the public don't care whether the characters are living or not don't stand behind me like that it's such an awkward way of talking come and sit down he drew away and came to a position whence he could see her face but kept at a distance yes he said in a different way that's the worst of it what is that you well it's no use that i what she did not look at him her lips after she had spoken drew in a little that your disposition towards me is being affected by this miserable failure you keep saying to yourself that i am not what you thought me 
Perhaps you even feel that I have been guilty of a sort of deception. I don't blame you. It's natural enough. I'll tell you quite honestly what I do think, she replied, after a short silence. You are much weaker than I imagined. Difficulties crush you, instead of rousing you to struggle. True, it has always been my fault. But don't you feel it's rather unmanly, this state of things? You say you love me, and I try to believe it, but whilst you are saying so, you let me get nearer and nearer to miserable, hateful poverty. What is to become of me, of us? Shall you sit here day after day until our last shilling is spent? No, of course I must do something. When shall you begin in earnest? In a day or two you must pay this quarter's rent, and that will leave us just about fifteen pounds in the world. Where is the rent at Christmas to come from? What are we to live upon? There's all sorts of clothing to be bought. There'll be all the extra expenses of winter. Surely it's bad enough that we have had to stay here all the summer, no holiday of any kind. I have done my best not to grumble about it, but I begin to think that it would be very much wiser if I did grumble. She squared her shoulders and gave her head just a little shake as if a fly had troubled her. "'You bear everything very well and kindly,' said Reardon. "'My behaviour is contemptible. I know that. Good heavens, if I only had some business to go to, something I could work at in any state of mind and make money out of. Given this chance, I would work myself to death rather than you should lack anything you desire. But I am at the mercy of my brain. It is dry and powerless. How I envy those clerks who go by to their offices in the morning. There's the day's work cut out for them, no question of mood and feeling. They have just to work at something, and when the evening comes they have earned their wages. They are free to rest and enjoy themselves. What an insane thing it is to make literature one's only means of support, when the most trivial accident may at any time prove fatal to one's power of work for weeks or months. No, that is the unpardonable sin, to make a trade of an art. I am rightly served for attempting such a brutal folly. He turned away in a passion of misery. How very silly it is to talk like this, came in Amy's voice, clearly critical. Art must be practiced as a trade, at all events in our time. This is the age of trade. Of course, if one refuses to be of one's time, and yet hasn't the means to live independently, what can result but breakdown and wretchedness? The fact of the matter is you could do fairly good work, and work which would sell, if only you would bring yourself to look at things in a more practical way. It's what Mr. Milvane is always saying, you know. Milvane's temperament is very different from mine. He is naturally light-hearted and hopeful. I am naturally the opposite. What you and he say is true enough. The misfortune is that I can't act upon it. I am no uncompromising artistic pedant. I am quite willing to try and do the kind of work that will sell. Under the circumstances, it would be a kind of insanity if I refused. But power doesn't answer to my will. My efforts are utterly vain. I suppose the prospect of pennilessness is itself a hindrance. The fear haunts me. With such terrible real things pressing upon me, my imagination can shape nothing substantial. When I have labored out a story, I suddenly see it in a light of such contemptible triviality that to work at it is an impossible thing. You are ill. That's the fact of the matter. You ought to have had a holiday. I think even now you had better go away for a week or two. Do, Edwin. Impossible. It would be the merest pretense of holiday. To go away and leave you here? No. Shall I ask Mother or Jack to lend us some money? That would be intolerable. But this state of things is intolerable. Reardon walked the length of the room and back again. Your mother has no money to lend, dear, and your brother would do it so unwillingly that we can't lay ourselves under such an obligation. 
"'Yet it will come to that, you know,' remarked Amy calmly. "'No, it shall not come to that. I must and will get something done long before Christmas. If only you—' He came and took one of her hands. "'If only you will give me more sympathy, dearest. You see, that's one side of my weakness. I am utterly dependent upon you. Your kindness is the breath of life to me. Don't refuse it. But I have done nothing of the kind. You begin to speak very coldly, and I understand your feeling of disappointment. The mere fact of your urging me to do anything that will sell is a proof of bitter disappointment. You would have looked with scorn at anyone who talked to me like that two years ago. You were proud of me because my work wasn't altogether common, and because I had never written a line that was meant to attract the vulgar. All that's over now. If you knew how dreadful it is to see that you have lost your hopes of me. Well, but I haven't altogether, Amy replied meditatively. I know very well that if you had a lot of money you would do better things than ever. Thank you a thousand times for saying that, my dearest. But you see we haven't money, and there's little chance of our getting any. That scrubby old uncle won't leave anything to us. I feel too sure of it. I often feel disposed to go and beg him on my knees to think of us in his will, she laughed. I suppose it's impossible, and would be useless, but, but I should be capable of it, if I knew it would bring money. Reardon said nothing. I didn't think so much of money when we were married, Amy continued. I had never seriously felt the want of it, you know. I did think, there's no harm in confessing it, that you were sure to be rich some day, but... I should have married you all the same if I had known that you would win only reputation. You are sure of that? Well, I think so. But I know the value of money better now. I know it is the most powerful thing in the world. If I had to choose between a glorious reputation with poverty and a contemptible popularity with wealth, I should choose the latter. No, I should. Perhaps you're right. He turned away with a sigh. Yes, you are right. What is reputation? If it is deserved, it originates with a few score of people among the many millions who would never have recognized the merit they at last applaud. That's the lot of a great genius. As for a mediocrity like me, what a ludicrous absurdity to fret myself in the hope that half a dozen folks will say, I am above the average, after all. Is there sillier vanity than this? A year after I have published my last book, I shall be practically forgotten. Ten years later, I shall be as absolutely forgotten as one of those novelists of the early part of this century, whose names one doesn't even recognize. What fatuous posing! Amy looked askance at him, but replied nothing. And yet, he continued, of course it isn't only for the sake of reputation that one tries to do uncommon work. There's the shrinking from conscious insincerity of workmanship, which most of the writers nowadays seem never to feel. It's good enough for the market. That satisfies them, and perhaps they are justified. I can't pretend that I rule my life by absolute ideals. I admit that everything is relative. There is no such thing as goodness or badness, in the absolute sense, of course. Perhaps I am absurdly inconsistent when, though knowing my work can't be first-rate, I strive to make it as good as possible. I don't say this in irony, Amy. I really mean it. It may very well be that I am just as foolish as the people I ridicule for moral and religious superstition. This habit of mine is superstitious. How well I can imagine the answer of some popular novelist if he heard me speak scornfully of his books. My dear fellow, he might say, do you suppose I am not aware that my books are rubbish? I know it just as well as you do, but my vocation is to live comfortably. I have a luxurious house, a wife and children who are happy and grateful to me for their happiness. If you choose to live in a garret and... What's worse, make your wife and children share it with you. That's your concern. The man would be abundantly right. But, said Amy, why should you assume that his books are rubbish? 
good work succeeds now and then i speak of the common kind of success which is never due to literary merit if i speak bitterly well i am suffering from my powerlessness i am a failure my poor girl and it isn't easy for me to look with charity on the success of men who deserved it far less than i did when i was still able to work of course edwin if you make up your mind that you are a failure you will end by being so but i'm convinced there's no reason that you should fail to make a living with your pen now let me advise you put aside all your strict ideas about what is worthy and what is unworthy and to just act upon my advice it's impossible for you to write a three-volume novel very well then do a short story of a kind that's likely to be popular you know mr milvane is always saying that the long novel has had its day and that in future people will write shilling books why not try give yourself a week to invent a sensational plot and then a fortnight for the writing have it ready for the new season at the end of october if you like don't put your name to it your name certainly would have no weight with this sort of public just to make it a matter of business as mr milvane says and see if you can't earn some money he stood and regarded her his expression was one of pained perplexity you mustn't forget amy that it needs a particular kind of faculty to write stories of this sort the invention of a plot is just the thing i find most difficult but the plot may be as silly as you like providing it holds the attention of vulgar readers think of the hollow statue what could be more idiotic yet it sells by the thousands i don't think i can bring myself to that reardon said in a low voice very well then will you tell me what you propose to do i might perhaps manage a novel in two volumes instead of three he seated himself at the writing table and stared at the blank sheets of paper in an anguish of hopelessness it will take you till christmas said amy and then you will get perhaps fifty pounds for it i must do my best i'll go out and try to get some ideas i he broke off and looked steadily at his wife what is it she asked suppose i were to propose to you to leave this flat and take cheaper rooms he uttered it in a shamefaced way his eyes falling amy kept silence we might sublet it he continued in the same tone for the last year of the lease and where do you propose to live amy inquired coldly there's no need to be in such a dear neighborhood we could go to one of the outer districts one might find three unfurnished rooms for about eight and sixpence a week less than half our rent here you must do as seems good to you for heaven's sake amy don't speak to me in that way i can't stand that surely you can see that i am driven to think of every possible resource to speak like that is to abandon me say you can't or you won't do it but don't treat me as if you had no share in my miseries she was touched for the moment i didn't mean to speak unkindly dear but think what it means to give up our home and position that is open confession of failure it would be horrible i won't think of it i have three months before christmas and i will finish a book i really can't see why you shouldn't just do a certain number of pages every day good or bad never mind let the pages be finished now you have got two chapters no that won't do i must think of a better subject amy made a gesture of impatience there you are what does the subject matter get this book finished and sold and then do something better next time give me tonight just to think perhaps one of the old stories i have thrown aside will come back in a clearer light i'll go out for an hour you don't mind being left alone you mustn't think of such trifles as that but a nothing that concerns you in the slightest way is a trifle to me nothing i can't bear that you should forget that have patience with me darling a little longer he knelt by her and looked up into her face say only one or two kind words like you used to she passed her hand lightly over his hair and murmured something with a faint smile then reardon took his hat and stick and descended the eight flights of stone steps and walked in the darkness round the outer circle of regent's park 
racking his fagged brain in a hopeless search for characters, situations, motives. End of chapter 4《Chapter Five of New Grub Street. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Brown. New Grub Street by George Gissing. Chapter Five. The Way Hither. Even in the mid-rapture of his marriage month he had foreseen this possibility. But fate had hitherto rescued him in sudden ways when he was on the brink of self-abandonment, and it was hard to imagine that this culmination of triumphant joy could be a preface to base miseries. He was the son of a man who had followed many different pursuits, and in none had done much more than earn a livelihood. At the age of forty, when Edwin, his only child, was ten years old, Mr. Reardon established himself in the town of Hereford as a photographer, and there he abode until his death nine years after, occasionally risking some speculation not inconsistent with the photographic business, but always with the result of losing the little capital he ventured. Mrs. Reardon died when Edwin had reached his fifteenth year, in breeding and education she was superior to her husband, to whom, moreover, she had brought something between four and five hundred pounds. Her temper was passionate in both senses of the word, and the marriage could hardly be called a happy one, though it was never disturbed by serious discord. The photographer was a man of whims and idealisms. His wife had a strong vein of worldly ambition. They made few friends, and it was Mrs. Reardon's frequently expressed desire to go and live in London, where fortune, she thought, might be kinder to them. Reardon had all but made up his mind to try this venture when he suddenly became a widower. After that he never summoned energy to embark on new enterprises. The boy was educated at an excellent local school, at eighteen he had a far better acquaintance with the ancient classics than most lads who have been expressly prepared for a university, and, thanks to an anglicized Swiss, who acted as an assistant in Mr. Reardon's business, he not only read French, but could talk it with a certain haphazard fluency. These attainments, however, were not of much practical use. The best that could be done for Edwin was to place him in the office of an estate agent, his health was indifferent, and it seemed likely that open-air exercise, of which he would have a good deal under the particular circumstances of the case, might counteract the effects of study too closely pursued. At his father's death he came into possession. Practically it was put at his disposal at once, though he was little more than nineteen, of about two hundred pounds, a life insurance for five hundred had been sacrificed to exigencies not very long before. He had no difficulty in deciding how to use this money. His mother's desire to live in London had in him the force of an inherited motive. As soon as possible he released himself from his uncongenial occupations, converted into money all the possessions of which he had not immediate need, and betook himself to the metropolis to become a literary man, of course. His capital lasted him nearly four years, for notwithstanding his age, he lived with painful economy, the strangest life of almost absolute loneliness. From a certain point of Tottenham Court Road, there is visible a certain garret window in a certain street which runs parallel with that thoroughfare. For the greater part of these four years, the garret in question was Reardon's home. He paid only three and sixpence a week for the privilege of living there. His food cost him about a shilling a day. On clothing and other unavoidable expenses he laid out some five pounds yearly. Then he bought books, volumes, which cost anything between two pence and two shillings. Further than that he durst not go. 
a strange time i assure you when he had completed his twenty-first year he desired to procure a reader's ticket for the british museum now this was not such a simple matter as you may suppose it was necessary to obtain the signature of some respectable householder and reardon was acquainted with no such person his landlady was a decent woman enough and a payer of rates and taxes but it would look odd to say the least of it to present himself in great russell street armed with this person's recommendation there was nothing for it but to take a bold step to force himself upon the attention of a stranger the thing from which his pride had always shrunk he wrote to a well-known novelist a man with whose works he had some sympathy i am trying to prepare myself for a literary career i wish to study in the reading room of the british museum but have no acquaintance to whom i can refer in the ordinary way will you help me i mean in this particular only that was the substance of his letter for reply came an invitation to a house in the west end with fear and trembling reardon answered the summons he was so shabbily attired he was so diffident from the habit of living quite alone he was horribly afraid lest it should be supposed that he looked for other assistance than he had requested well the novelist was a rotund and a jovial man his dwelling and his person smelt of money he was so happy himself that he could afford to be kind to others have you published anything he inquired for the young man's letter had left this uncertain nothing i have tried the magazines but as yet without success but what do you write chiefly essays on literary subjects i can understand that you would find a difficulty in disposing of them that kind of thing is supplied either by men of established reputation or by anonymous writers who have a regular engagement on papers and magazines give me an example of your topics i have written something lately about tibullus oh dear oh, oh dear forgive me mr reardon my feelings were too much for me those names have been my horror ever since i was a schoolboy far be it from me to discourage you if your line is to be solid literary criticism i will only mention as a matter of fact that such work is indifferently paid and in very small demand it hasn't occurred to you to try your hand at fiction in uttering the word he beamed to him it meant a thousand or so a year i'm afraid i have no talent for that the novelist could do no more than grant his genial signature for the specified purpose and add good wishes in abundance reardon went home with his brain in a whirl he had had his first glimpse of what was meant by literary success that luxurious study with its shelves of handsomely bound books its beautiful pictures its warm fragrant air great heavens what might not a man do who sat at his ease amid such surroundings he began to work at the reading room but at the same time he thought often of the novelist's suggestion and before long had written two or three short stories no editor would accept them but he continued to practice himself in that art and by degrees came to fancy that after all perhaps he had some talent for fiction it was significant however that no native impulse had directed him to novel writing his intellectual temper was that of the student the scholar but strongly blended with a love of independence which had always made him think with a distaste of a teacher's life the stories he wrote were scraps of immature psychology the last thing a magazine would accept from an unknown man his money dwindled and there came a winter during which he suffered much from cold and hunger what a blessed refuge it was there under the great dome when he must else have sat in his windy garret with the mere pretense of a fire the reading-room was his true home its warmth enwrapped him kindly the peculiar odour of its atmosphere at first a cause of headache grew dear and delightful to him but he could not sit here until his last penny should be spent something practical must be done 
and practicality was not his strong point. Friends in London he had none, but for an occasional conversation with his landlady he would scarcely have spoken a dozen words a week. His disposition was the reverse of democratic, and he could not make acquaintances below his own intellectual level. Solitude fostered a sensitiveness which, to begin with, was extreme. The lack of stated occupation encouraged his natural tendency to dream and procrastinate and hope for the improbable. He was a recluse in the midst of millions, and viewed with dread the necessity of going forth to fight for daily food. Little by little he had ceased to hold any correspondence with his former friends at Hereford. The only person to whom he still wrote and from whom he still heard was his mother's father, an old man who lived at Derby, retired from the business of a draper, and spending his last years pleasantly enough with a daughter who had remained single. Edwin had always been a favorite with his grandfather, though they had met only once or twice during the past eight years. But in writing he did not allow it to be understood that he was in actual want, and he felt that he must come to dire extremities before he could bring himself to beg assistance. He had begun to answer advertisements, but the state of his wardrobe forbade his applying for any but humble positions. Once or twice he presented himself personally at offices, but his reception was so mortifying that death by hunger seemed preferable to a continuance of such experiences. The injury to his pride made him savagely arrogant. For days after the last rejection he hid himself in his garret, hating the world. He sold his little collection of books, and of course they brought only a trifling sum. That exhausted, he must begin to sell his clothes. And then? But help was at hand. One day he saw it advertised in a newspaper that the secretary of a hospital in the north of London was in need of a clerk. Application was to be made by letter. He wrote, and two days later, to his astonishment, received a reply asking him to wait upon the secretary at a certain hour. In a fever of agitation he kept the appointment, and found that his business was with a young man in the very highest spirits, who walked up and down a little office. The hospital was of the special order, a house of no great size, and treated the matter in hand as an excellent joke. I thought you know of engaging someone much younger, quite a lad, in fact. But look there, those are the replies to my advertisement. He pointed to a heap of five or six hundred letters, and laughed consumedly. Impossible to read them all, you know. It seemed to me that the fairest thing would be to shake them together, stick my hand in, and take out one by chance. If it didn't seem very promising, I would try a second time. But the first letter was yours, and I thought the fair thing to do was at all events to see you, you know. The fact is I am only able to offer a pound a week. I shall be very glad indeed to take that, said Reardon, who was bathed in perspiration. And what about references, and so on, proceeded the young man, chuckling and rubbing his hands together. The applicant was engaged. He had barely strength to walk home. The sudden relief from his miseries made him, for the first time, sensible of the extreme physical weakness into which he had sunk. For the next week he was very ill, but he did not allow this to interfere with his new work, which was easily learnt and not burdensome. He held this position for three years, and during that time important things happened. When he had recovered from his state of semi-starvation, and was living in comfort, a pound a week is a very large sum if you have previously had to live on ten shillings, Reardon found that the impulse to literary production awoke in him more strongly than ever. He generally got home from the hospital about six o'clock and the evening was his own. In this leisure time he wrote a novel in two volumes. One publisher refused it, but a second offered to bring it out on the terms of half-profits to the author. The book appeared, and was well spoken of in one or two papers, 
but profits there were none to divide. In the third year of his clerkship, he wrote a novel in three volumes. For this, his publishers gave him twenty-five pounds, with again a promise of half the profits, after deduction of the sum advanced. Again, there was no pecuniary success. He had just got to work upon a third book when his grandfather at Derby died and left him four hundred pounds. He could not resist the temptation to recover his freedom. Four hundred pounds, at the rate of eighty pounds a year, meant five years of literary endeavor. In that period he could certainly determine whether or not it was his destiny to live by the pen. In the meantime, his relations with the secretary of the hospital, Carter by name, had grown very friendly. When Reardon began to publish books, the high-spirited Mr. Carter looked upon him with something of awe, and when the literary man ceased to be a clerk, there was nothing to prevent association on equal terms between him and his former employer. They continued to see a good deal of each other, and Carter made Reardon acquainted with certain of his friends, among whom was one John Ewell, an easy-going, selfish, semi-intellectual young man who had a place in a government office. The time of solitude had gone by for Reardon. He began to develop the power that was in him. Those two books of his were not of a kind to win popularity. They dealt with no particular class of society, unless one makes a distinct class of people who have brains, and they lacked local color. Their interest was almost purely psychological. It was clear that the author had no faculty for constructing a story, and that pictures of active life were not to be expected of him. He could never appeal to the multitude. But strong characterization was within his scope, and an intellectual fervor appetizing to a small section of refined readers marked all his best pages. He was the kind of man who cannot struggle against adverse conditions but whom prosperity warms to the exercise of his powers. Anything like the cares of responsibility would sooner or later harass him into unproductiveness. That he should produce much was in any case out of the question. Possibly a book every two or three years might not prove too great a strain upon his delicate mental organism. But for him to attempt more than that would certainly be fatal to the peculiar merit of his work. Of this he was dimly conscious, and, on receiving his legacy, he put aside for nearly twelve months the new novel he had begun. To give his mind a rest, he wrote several essays, much maturer than those which had formerly failed to find acceptance, and two of these appeared in magazines. The money thus earned he spent at a tailor's. His friend Carter ventured to suggest this mode of outlay. His third book sold for fifty pounds. It was a great improvement on its predecessors, and the reviews were generally favorable. For the story which followed, on neutral ground, he received a hundred pounds. On the strength of that he spent six months traveling in the south of Europe. He returned to London at mid-June, and on the second day after his arrival befell an incident which was to control the rest of his life. Busy with the pictures in the Grosvenor Gallery, he heard himself addressed in a familiar voice, and on turning he was aware of Mr. Carter, resplendent in fashionable summer attire, and accompanied by a young lady of some charms. Reardon had formerly feared encounters of this kind, too conscious of the defects of his attire but at present there was no reason why he should shirk social intercourse. He was passably dressed, and the half-year of travel had benefited his appearance in no slight degree. Carter presented him to the young lady, of whom the novelist had already heard as a fiancée to his friend. Whilst they stood conversing, there approached two ladies, evidently mother and daughter, whose attendant was another of Reardon's acquaintances, Mr. John Yule. This gentleman stepped briskly forward and welcomed the returned wanderer. Let me introduce you, he said, to my mother and sister, 
Your fame has made them anxious to know you. Reardon found himself in a position of which the novelty was embarrassing, but scarcely disagreeable. Here were five people grouped around him, all of whom regarded him unaffectedly as a man of importance. For though, strictly speaking, he had no fame at all, these persons had kept up with the progress of his small repute, and were all distinctly glad to number among their acquaintances an unmistakable author, one, too, who was fresh from Italy and Greece. Mrs. Yule, a lady rather too pretentious in her tone to be attractive to a man of Reardon's refinement, hastened to assure him how well his books were known in her house. Though for the run of ordinary novels we don't care much, Miss Yule, not at all pretentious in speech and seemingly reserved of disposition, was good enough to show frank interest in the author. As for the poor author himself, well, he merely fell in love with Miss Yule at first sight, and there was an end of the matter. A day or two later he made a call at their house, in the region of Westbourne Park. It was a small house, and rather showily than handsomely furnished. No one, after visiting it, would be astonished to hear that Mrs. Edmund Yule had but a small income, and that she was often put to desperate expedients to keep up the gloss of easy circumstances. In the gauzy and fluffy and varnishy little drawing-room, Reardon found a youngish gentleman already in conversation with the widow and her daughter. This proved to be one Mr. Jasper Milvain, also a man of letters. Mr. Milvain was glad to meet Reardon, whose books he had read with decided interest. Really, exclaimed Mrs. Yule, I don't know how it is that we have had to wait so long for the pleasure of knowing you, Mr. Reardon. If John were not so selfish, he would have allowed us a share in your acquaintance long ago. Ten weeks thereafter, Miss Yule became Mrs. Reardon. It was a time of frantic exultation with the poor fellow. He had always regarded the winning of a beautiful and intellectual wife as the crown of a successful literary career, but he had not dared to hope that such a triumph would be his. Life had been too hard with him on the whole. He, who hungered for sympathy, who thought of a woman's love as the prize of mortals supremely blessed, had spent the fresh years of his youth in monkish solitude. Now of a sudden came friends and flattery, ay, and love itself. He was rapt to the seventh heaven. Indeed it seemed that the girl loved him. She knew that he had but a hundred pounds or so left over from that little inheritance, that his book sold for a trifle, that he had no wealthy relatives from whom he could expect anything. Yet she hesitated not a moment when he asked her to marry him. I have loved you from the first. How is that possible, he urged. What is there lovable in me? I am afraid of waking up and finding myself in my old garret, cold and hungry. You will be a great man. I implore you not to count on that. In many ways I am wretchedly weak. I have no such confidence in myself. Then I will have confidence for both. But how can you love me for my own sake, love me as a man? I love you. And the words sang about him, filled the air with a mad pulsing of intolerable joy, made him desire to fling himself in passionate humility at her feet, to weep hot tears, to cry to her in insane worship. He thought her beautiful beyond anything his heart had imagined. Her warm gold hair was the rapture of his eyes and of his reverent hand. Though slenderly fashioned, she was so gloriously strong. Not a day of illness in her life, said Mrs. Yule, and one could readily believe it. She spoke with such a sweet decision. Her I love you was a bond with eternity. In the simplest as in the simplest as in the greatest things, she saw his wish and acted frankly upon it. No pretty petulance, no affectation of silly sweet languishing, none but the weaknesses of woman. 
and so exquisitely fresh in her twenty years of maidenhood with bright young eyes that seemed to bid defiance to all the years to come he went about like one dazzled with excessive light he talked as he had never talked before recklessly exultantly insolently in the nobler sense he made friends on every hand he welcomed all the world to his bosom he felt the benevolence of a god i love you it breathed like music at his ears when he fell asleep in weariness of joy it awakened him on the morrow as with a glorious ringing summons to renewed life delay why should there be delay amy wished nothing but to become his wife idle to think of his doing any more work until he sat down in the home of which she was mistress his brain burned with visions of the books he would henceforth write but his hand was incapable of anything but a love letter and what letters reardon never published anything equal to those i have received your poem amy replied to one of them and she was right not a letter but a poem he had sent her with every word on fire the hours of talk it enraptured him to find how much she had read and with what clearness of understanding latin and greek no ah but she should learn them both that there might be nothing wanting in the communion between his thought and hers for he loved the old writers with all his heart they had been such strength to him in his days of misery they would go together to the charmed lands of the south no not now for their marriage holiday amy said that would be an imprudent expense but as soon as he had got a good price for a book will not the publishers be kind if they knew what happiness lurked in embryo within their foolish checkbooks he woke of a sudden in the early hours of one morning a week before the wedding day you know that kind of awaking so complete in an instant caused by the pressure of some troublesome thought upon the dreaming brain suppose i should not succeed henceforth suppose i could never get more than this poor hundred pounds for one of the long books which cost me so much labour i shall perhaps have children to support and amy how would amy bear poverty he knew what poverty means the chilling of brain and heart the unnerving of the hands the slow gathering about of one fear and shame and impotent wrath the dread feeling of helplessness of the world's base indifference poverty poverty and for hours he could not sleep his eyes kept filling with tears the beating of his heart was low and in his solitude he called upon amy with pitiful entreaty do not forsake me i love you i love you but that went by six days five days four days will one's heart burst with happiness the flat is taken is furnished up there towards the sky eight flights of stone steps you're a confoundedly lucky fellow reardon remarked milvain who had already become very intimate with his new friend a good fellow too and you deserve it but at first i had a horrible suspicion i guess what you mean no i wasn't even in love with her though i admired her she would never have cared for me in any case i am not sentimental enough the deuce i mean it in an inoffensive sense she and i are rather too much alike i fancy how do you mean asked reardon puzzled and not very well pleased there's a great deal of pure intellect about miss you you know she was sure to choose a man of the passionate kind i think you are talking nonsense my dear fellow well perhaps i am to tell you the truth i have by no means completed my study of women yet it is one of the things in which i hope to be a specialist some day though i don't think i shall ever make use of it in novels rather perhaps in life three days two days one day now let every joyous sound which the great globe can utter ring forth in one burst of harmony is it not well done to make the village bells chant merrily when a marriage is over here in london we can have no such music 
but for us my dear one all the roaring life of the great city is wedding him sweet pure face under its bridal veil the face which shall if fate spare it be as dear to me many a long year hence as now at the culminating moment of my life as he trudged on in the dark his tortured memory was living through that time again the images forced themselves upon him however much he tried to think of quite other things of some fictitious story on which he might set to work in the case of his earlier books he had waited quietly until some suggestive situation some group of congenial characters came with sudden delightfulness before his mind and urged him to write but nothing so spontaneous could now be hoped for his brain was too weary with months of fruitless harassing endeavour moreover he was trying to devise a plot the kind of literary jack-in-the-box which might excite interest in the mass of readers and this was alien to the natural working of his imagination he suffered the torments of nightmare an oppression of the brain and heart which must soon be intolerable end of chapter five Chapter Six of New Grub Street. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Brown. New Grub Street by George Gissing. Chapter Six: The Practical Friend. When her husband had set forth, Amy seated herself in the study and took up a new library volume, as if to read. But she had no real intention of doing so. It was always disagreeable to her to sit in the manner of one totally unoccupied, with hands on lap, and even when she consciously gave herself up to musing, an open book was generally before her. She did not, in truth, read much nowadays. Since the birth of her child, she had seemed to care less than before for disinterested study. If a new novel that had succeeded came into her hands, she perused it in a very practical spirit, commenting to Reardon on the features of the work which had made it popular. Formerly she would have thought much more of its purely literary merits, for which her eye was very keen. How often she had given her husband a thrill of exquisite pleasure by pointing to some merit or defect of which the common reader would be totally insensible. Now she spoke less frequently on such subjects. Her interests were becoming more personal. She liked to hear details of the success of popular authors, about their wives or husbands, as the case might be, their arrangements with publishers, their methods of work, the gossip columns of literary papers, and of some that were not literary, had an attraction for her. She talked of questions such as international copyright, was anxious to get an insight into the practical conduct of journals and magazines, liked to know who read for the publishing houses. To an impartial observer it might have appeared that her intellect was growing more active and mature. More than half an hour passed. It was not a pleasant train of thought that now occupied her. Her lips were drawn together. Her brows were slightly wrinkled. The self-control, which at other times was agreeably expressed upon her features, had become rather too cold and decided. At one moment it seemed to her that she heard a sound in the bedroom. The doors were purposely left ajar. And her head turned quickly to listen, the look in her eyes instantaneously softening but all remained quiet. The street would have been silent but for a cab that now and then passed, the swing of a hansom or the roll of a four-wheeler, and within the buildings nothing whatever was audible. Yes, a footstep briskly mounting the stone stairs, not like that of the postman, a visitor, perhaps, to the other flat on the topmost landing. But the final pause was in this direction, and then came a sharp rat-tat at the door. Amy rose immediately and went to open. 
Jasper Milvane raised his urban silk hat, then held out his hand with the greeting of frank friendship. His inquiries were in so loud a voice that Amy checked him with a forbidding gesture. "'You'll wake Willie. By Jove, I always forget,' he exclaimed in subdued tones. "'Does the infant flourish? Oh, yes. Reardon out? I got back on Saturday evening, but couldn't come round before this. It was Monday. How close it is in here. I suppose the roof gets so heated during the day. Glorious weather in the country. And I've no end of things to tell you. He won't be long, I suppose. I think not. He left his hat and stick in the passage, came into the study, and glanced about as if he expected to see some change since he was last here three weeks ago. "'So you have been enjoying yourself,' said Amy, as, after listening for a moment at the door, she took a seat. "'Oh, a little freshening of the faculties. But whose acquaintance do you think I have made?' "'Down there?' "'Yes. Your Uncle Alfred and his daughter were staying at John Yule's, and I saw something of them. I was invited to the house. Did you speak of us?' To Miss Yule only. I happened to meet her on a walk, and, in a blundering way, I mentioned Reardon's name. But, of course, it didn't matter in the least. She inquired about you with a good deal of interest, asked if you were as beautiful as you promised to be years ago. Amy laughed. Doesn't that proceed from your fertile invention, Mr. Milvane? Not a bit of it, by the by. What would be your natural question concerning her? Do you think she gave promise of good looks? I'm afraid I can't say that she did. She had a good face, but rather plain. I see. Jasper threw back his head and seemed to contemplate an object in memory. Well, I shouldn't wonder if most people called her a trifle plain even now. And yet, no, that's hardly possible, after all. She has no color. Where's her hair short? Short? Oh, I, I don't mean the smooth, boyish hair with a parting. Not the kind of hair that would be lank if it grew long. Curly all over. Looks uncommonly well, I assure you. She has a capital head. Odd girl. Very odd girl. Quiet, thoughtful. Not very happy, I'm afraid. Seems to think with a dread of a return to books. Indeed. But I had understood she was a reader. Reading enough for six people, probably. Perhaps her health is not very robust. Oh, I knew her by sight quite well. Had seen her at the reading room. She's the kind of girl that gets into one's head, you know. Suggestive. Much more in her than comes out, until one knows her very well. Well, I should hope so, remarked Amy with a peculiar smile. But that's by no means a matter of course. They didn't invite me to come and see them in London. I suppose Marion mentioned your acquaintance with this branch of the family. I think not. At all events, she promised me she wouldn't. Amy looked at him inquiringly, in a puzzled way. She promised you? Voluntarily. We got rather sympathetic. Your uncle, Alfred, I mean, is a remarkable man, but I think he regarded me as a youth of no particular importance. Well, how do things go? Amy shook her head. No progress? None whatever. He can't work. I begin to be afraid that he is really ill. He must go away before the fine weather is over. Do persuade him tonight. I wish you could have had a holiday with him. Out of the question now, I'm sorry to say. I must work savagely. But can't you all manage a fortnight somewhere? Hastings? Eastbourne? It would be simply rash. One goes on saying, What does a pound or two matter? But it begins at length to matter a great deal. I know, confound it all. I think how it would amuse some rich grocer's son who pitches his half-sovereign to the waiter when he has dined himself into good humour. But I tell you what it is. You must really try to influence him towards practicality. Don't you think... He paused, and Amy sat looking at her hands. I have made an attempt, she said at length, in a distant undertone. You really have? 
Jasper leaned forward, his clasped hands hanging between his knees. He was scrutinizing her face, and Amy, conscious of the too fixed regard, at length moved her head uneasily. "'It seems very clear to me,' she said, "'that a long book is out of the question for him at present. "'He writes so slowly and is so fastidious. "'It would be a fatal thing to hurry through something weaker even than the last.' "'You think the optimist weak?' Jasper asked, half absently. "'I don't think it worthy of Edwin. "'I don't see how anyone can. "'I have wondered what your opinion was. "'Yes, he ought to try a new tack, I think.' "'Just then there came the sound of a latch-key opening the outer door. "'Jasper lay back in his chair and waited with a smile for his expected friend's appearance. "'Amy made no movement.' "'Oh, there you are,' said Reardon, presenting himself with the dazzled eye of one who has been in darkness. He spoke in a voice of genial welcome, though it still had the note of depression. "'When did you get back?' Milvane began to recount what he had told in the first part of his conversation with Amy. As he did so, the latter withdrew and was absent for five minutes. On reappearing, she said, "'You'll have supper with us, Mr. Milvane. "'I think I will, please.' "'Shortly after, all repaired to the eating-room, "'where conversation had to be carried on in a low tone "'because of the proximity of the bedchamber "'in which lay the sleeping child. "'Jasper began to tell of certain things "'that had happened to him since his arrival in town. "'It was a curious coincidence, but... "'By the by, have you heard what the study has been doing?' "'I should think rather so,' replied Reardon, his face lighting up, "'with no small satisfaction.' "'Delicious, isn't it?' exclaimed his wife. "'I thought it too good to be true when Edwin heard of it from Mr. Biffin.' All three laughed in subdued chorus. For the moment Reardon became a new man in his exultation over the contradictory reviewers. "'Oh, Biffin told you, did he?' Well, continued Jasper, it was an odd thing, but when I reached my lodgings on Saturday evening, there lay a note from Horace Barlow, inviting me to go and see him on Sunday afternoon out at Wimbledon, the special reason being that the editor of the study would be there, and Barlow thought I might like to meet him. Now this letter gave me a fit of laughter, not only because of those precious reviews, but because Alfred Yule had been telling me all about this same editor, who rejoices in the name of Fadge. Your uncle, Mrs. Reardon, declares that Fadge is the most malicious man in the literary profession, though that's saying such a very great deal. Well, never mind. Uh, of course I was delighted to go and meet Fadge. At Barlow's I found the queerest collection of people, most of them women of the inkiest description. The great Fadge himself surprised me. I expected to see a gaunt, bilious man, and he was the rosiest and dumpiest little dandy you can imagine. A fellow of forty-five, I dare say, with thin yellow hair and blue eyes, and a manner of extreme innocence. Fadge flattered me with confidential chat, and I discovered at length why Barlow had asked me to meet him. It's Fadge that is going to edit Culpepper's new monthly. You've heard about it? and he had actually thought it worth while to enlist me among contributors. Now how's that for a piece of news? The speaker looked from Reardon to Amy with a smile of vast significance. I rejoice to hear it, said Reardon fervently. You see, you see, cried Jasper, forgetting all about the infant in the next room. All things come to the man who knows how to wait. But I'm hanged if I expected a thing of this kind to come so soon. Why, I'm a man of distinction. My doings have been noted. The admirable qualities of my style have drawn attention. I'm looked upon as one of the coming men. Thanks, I confess, in some measure to old Barlow. He seems to have amused himself with cracking me up to all and sundry. That last thing of mine in the West End has done me a vast amount of good, it seems. And Alfred Yule himself had noticed that paper in the wayside. That's how things work, you know. Reputation comes with a burst. 
just when you're not looking for anything of the kind. What's the new magazine to be called? asked Amy. Why, they propose The Current. Not bad in a way, though you imagine a fellow saying, Have you seen The Current, Current? At all events, the tone is to be up-to-date, and the articles are to be short. No padding. Merrim Saul from cover to cover. What do you think I've undertaken to do for a start? A paper consisting of sketches of typical readers of each of the principal daily and weekly papers. A deuced good idea, you know, my own, of course, but deucedly hard to carry out. I shall rise to the occasion, see if I don't. I'll rival Fadge himself in maliciousness, though I must confess I discovered no particular malice in the fellow's way of talking. The article shall make a sensation. I'll spend a whole month on it, and make it a perfect piece of satire. Now that's the kind of thing that inspires me with awe and envy, said Reardon. I could no more write such a paper than an article on fluxions. Tis my vocation, Hal. You might think I hadn't experience enough to begin with, but my intuition is so strong that I can make a little experience go an immense way. Most people would imagine I had been wasting my time these last few years, just sauntering about, reading nothing but periodicals, making acquaintance with loafers of every description. The truth is, I have been collecting ideas, and ideas that are convertible into coin of the realm, my boy. I have the special faculty of an extempore writer. Never in my life shall I do anything of solid literary value. I shall always despise the people I write for. But my path will be that of success. I have always said it, and now I am sure of it. Does Fadge retire from the study, then? inquired Reardon, when he had received this tirade with a friendly laugh. Yes, he does. Was going to, it seems, in any case. Of course I heard nothing about the two reviews, and I was almost afraid to smile whilst Fadge was talking with me, lest I should betray my thought. Did you know anything about the fellow before? Not I. Didn't know who edited the study. Nor I either. Remarkable what a number of illustrious obscure are going about. But I have still something else to tell you. I'm going to set my sisters afloat in literature. How? Well, I don't see why they shouldn't try their hands at a little writing, instead of giving lessons which don't suit them a bit. Last night, when I got back from Wimbledon, I went to look up Davies. Perhaps you don't remember my mentioning him, a fellow who was at Jolly and Monk's, the publishers, up to a year ago. He edits a trade journal now, and I see very little of him. However, I found him at home and had a long practical talk with him. I wanted to find out the state of the market as to such wares as Jolly and Monk could dispose of. He gave me some very useful hints, and the result was that I went off this morning and saw Monk himself. No Jolly exists at present. Mr. Monk, I began in my blandest tone. You know it. I am requested to call upon you by a lady who thinks of preparing a little volume to be called A Child's History of the English Parliament. Her idea is that... And so on. Well, I got on admirably with Monk, especially when he learnt that I was to be connected with Culpepper's new venture. He smiled upon the project and said he should be very glad to see a specimen chapter. If that pleased him, we could then discuss terms. But has one of your sisters really begun such a book? inquired Amy. Neither of them knows anything of the matter, but they are certainly capable of doing the kind of thing I have in mind which will consist largely of anecdotes of prominent statesmen. I myself shall write the specimen chapter and send it to the girls to show them what I propose. I shouldn't wonder if they make some fifty pounds out of it. The few books that will be necessary they can either get at Wattleboro Library or I can send them. Your energy is remarkable, all of a sudden, said Reardon. Yes, the hour has come, I find. There is a tide, to quote something that has the charm of freshness. The supper, which consisted of bread and butter, cheese, sardines, cocoa, was now over, and Jasper, still enlarging on his recent experiences, 
and future prospects, led the way back to the sitting room. Not very long after this, Amy left the two friends to their pipes. She was anxious that her husband should discuss his affairs privately with Milvane, and give ear to the practical advice which she knew would be tendered him. "'I hear that you're still stuck fast,' began Jasper, when they had smoked a while in silence. "'Yes. Getting rather serious, I should fear, isn't it?' "'Yes,' repeated Reardon in a low voice. "'Come, come, old man, you can't go on in this way. Would it or wouldn't it be any use if you took a seaside holiday?' "'Not in the least. I am incapable of holiday, if the opportunity were offered. "'Do something I must, or I shall fret myself into imbecility. "'Very well. What is it to be? "'I shall try to manufacture two volumes. "'They needn't run more than about two hundred and seventy pages, "'and those well spaced out. "'This is refreshing. This is practical. "'But look now. Let it be something rather sensational. Couldn't we invent a good title, something to catch eye and ear? The title would suggest the story, you know. Reardon laughed contemptuously, but the scorn was directed rather against himself than Milvain. Let's try, he muttered. Both appeared to exercise their minds on the problem for a few minutes. Then Jasper slapped his knee. How would this do? The Weird Sisters devilish good eh suggests all sorts of things both to the vulgar and the educated nothing brutally claptrap about it you know but what does it suggest to you oh which like mysterious girls or women think it over there was another long silence reardon's face was that of a man in blank misery i have been trying he said at length after an attempt to speak which was checked by a huskiness in his throat to explain to myself how this state of things has come about. I almost think I can do so. How? That half year abroad, and the extraordinary shock of happiness which followed it once upon it, have disturbed the balance of my nature. It was adjusted to circumstances of hardship, privation, struggle. A temperament like mine can't pass through such a violent change of conditions without being greatly affected. I have never since been the man I was before I left England. The stage I had then reached was the result of a slow and elaborate building up. I could look back and see the processes by which I had grown from the boy who was a mere bookworm to the man who had all but succeeded as a novelist. It was a perfectly natural, sober development. But in the last two years and a half I can distinguish no order. In living through it, I have imagined from time to time that my powers were coming to their ripest. But that was mere delusion. Intellectually, I have fallen back. The probability is that this wouldn't matter. If only I could live on in peace of mind, I should recover my equilibrium and perhaps once more understand myself. But the due course of things is troubled by my poverty. He spoke in a slow, meditative way, in a monotonous voice, and without raising his eyes from the ground. I can understand, put in Jasper, that there may be philosophical truth in all this, all the same. It's a great pity that you should occupy your mind with such thoughts. A pity? No. I must remain a reasoning creature. Disaster may end by driving me out of my wits, but till then I won't abandon my heritage of thought. Let us have it out, then. You think it was a mistake to spend those months abroad? A mistake from the practical point of view. That vast broadening of my horizon lost me the command of my literary resources. I lived in Italy and Greece as a student, concerned especially with the old civilizations. I read little but Greek and Latin. That brought me out of the track I had laboriously made for myself. I often thought with disgust of the kind of work I had been doing. My novels seemed vapid stuff, so wretchedly and shallowly modern. If I had had the means, I should have devoted myself to the life of a scholar. 
that, I quite believe, is my natural life. It's only the influence of recent circumstances that has made me a writer of novels. A man who can't journalize, yet must earn his bread by literature, nowadays inevitably turns to fiction, as the Elizabethan men turned to drama. Well, I should have got back, I think, into the old line of work. It was my marriage that completed what the time abroad had begun. He looked up suddenly and added, I am speaking as if to myself. You, of course, don't misunderstand me and think I am accusing my wife. No, I don't take you to mean that by any means. No, no, of course not. All this wrong is my accursed want of money. But that threatens to be such a fearful wrong that I begin to wish I had died before my marriage day. Then Amy would have been saved. The Philistines are right. A man has no business to marry unless he has a secured income equal to all natural demands. I behaved with the grossest selfishness. I might have known that such happiness was never meant for me. Do you mean by all this that you seriously doubt whether you will ever be able to write again? In awful seriousness, I doubt it, replied Reardon with haggard face. It strikes me as extraordinary. In your position I should work as I never had done before. Because you are the kind of man who is roused by necessity. I am overcome by it. My nature is feeble and luxurious. I never in my life encountered and overcame a practical difficulty. Yes, when you got to work at the hospital. All I did was to write a letter, and chance made it effective. My view of the case, Reardon, is that you are simply ill. Certainly I am, but the ailment is desperately complicated. Tell me, do you think I might possibly get any kind of stated work to do? Should I be fit for any place in a newspaper office, for instance? I fear not. You are the last man to have anything to do with journalism. If I appealed to my publishers, could they help me? I don't see how. They would simply say, Write a book and we'll buy it. Yes, there's no help but that. If only you were able to write short stories, Fadge might be useful. But what's the use? I suppose I might get ten guineas at most for such a story. I need a couple of hundred pounds at least. Even if I could finish a three-volume book, I doubt if they would give me a hundred again after the failure of the optimist. No, they wouldn't. But to sit and look forward in this way is absolutely fatal, my dear fellow. Get to work at your two-volume story. Call it The Weird Sisters, or anything better that you can devise, but get it done. So many pages a day. If I go ahead as I begin to think I shall, I shall soon be able to assure you good notices in a lot of papers. Your misfortune has been that you had no influential friends. By the by, how has the study been in the habit of treating you? Scrubbily. I'll make an opportunity of talking about your books to Fadge. I think Fadge and I shall get on pretty well together. Alfred Yule hates the man fiercely for some reason or other. By the way, I may as well tell you that I broke off short with the Yules on purpose. Oh? I had begun to think far too much about the girl. Wouldn't do, you know. I must marry someone with money, and a good deal of it. That's a settled point with me. Then you are not at all likely to meet them in London. Not at all. And if I get allied with Fadge, no doubt you will involve me in his savage feeling. You see how wisely I acted? I have a scent for the prudent course. They talked for a long time, but again chiefly of Milvane's affairs. Reardon, indeed, cared little to say anything more about his own. Talk was mere vanity and vexation of spirit, for the spring of his volition seemed to be broken, and whatever resolve he might utter, he knew that everything depended on influences he could not even foresee. End of chapter 6《One of New Grub Street. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
Recording by Alan Brown. New Grub Street by George Gissing. Chapter Seven: Marian's Home. Three weeks after her return from the country, which took place a week later than that of Jasper Milvain, Marian Yule was working one afternoon at her usual place in the museum reading room. It was three o'clock, and with the interval of half an hour at midday, when she went away for a cup of tea and a sandwich, she had been closely occupied since half-past nine. Her task at present was to collect materials for a paper on French authoresses of the seventeenth century, the kind of thing which her father supplied on stipulated terms for anonymous publication. Marian was by this time almost able to complete such a piece of manufacture herself, and her father's share in it was limited to a few hints and corrections. The greater part of the work by which Yule earned his moderate income was anonymous. Volumes and articles which bore his signature dealt with much of the same subjects as his unsigned matter, but the writing was labored with a conscientiousness unusual in men of his position. The result, unhappily, was not correspondent with the efforts. Alfred Yule had made a recognizable name among the critical writers of the day. Seeing him in the title lists of a periodical, most people knew what to expect, but not a few forbore the cutting open of the pages he occupied. He was learned, copious, occasionally mordant in style, but grace had been denied him. He had of late begun to perceive the fact that those passages of Marian's writing, which were printed just as they came from her pen, had a merit of a kind quite distinct from anything of which he himself was capable, and it began to be a question with him whether it would not be advantageous to let the girl sign these compositions. A matter of business, to be sure, at all events, in the first instance. For a long time Marian had scarcely looked up from the desk, but at this moment she found it necessary to refer to the invaluable La Russe. As so often happened, the particular volume of which she had need was not upon the shelf. She turned away and looked about her with a gaze of weary disappointment. At a little distance were standing two young men, engaged as their faces showed in facetious colloquy. As soon as she observed them, Marian's eyes fell, but the next moment she looked again in that direction. Her face had wholly changed. She wore a look of timid expectancy. The men were moving towards her, still talking and laughing. She turned to the shelves and affected to search for a book. The voices drew near, and one of them was well known to her. Now she could hear every word. Now the speakers were gone by. Was it possible that Mr. Milvane had not recognized her? She followed him with her eyes, and saw him take a seat not far off. He must have passed without even being aware of her. She went back to her place, and for some minutes sat trifling with a pen. When she made a show of resuming work, it was evident that she could no longer apply herself as before. Every now and then she glanced at people who were passing. There were intervals when she wholly lost herself in reverie. She was tired, and had even a slight headache. When the hand of the clock pointed to half-past three, she closed the volume from which she had been copying extracts, and began to collect her papers. A voice spoke close behind her. "'Where's your father, Miss Yule?' The speaker was a man of sixty, short, stout, tonsured by the hand of time. He had a broad, flabby face, the color of an ancient turnip, save where one of the cheeks was marked with a mulberry stain. His eyes, gray-orbed in a yellow setting, glared with good-humored inquisitiveness, and his mouth was that of the confirmed gossip. For eyebrows he had two little patches of reddish stubble, for moustache what looked like a bit of discolored toe, and scraps of similar material hanging beneath his creasy chin represented a beard. His garb must have seen a great deal of museum service. It consisted of a jacket, something between 
brown and blue, hanging in capacious shapelessness, a waistcoat half open for lack of buttons, and with one of the pockets coming unsewn, a pair of bronze-hued trousers, which had all run to knee. Necktie he had none, and his linen made distinct appeal to the laundress. Marian shook hands with him. He went away at half-past two, was her reply to his question. How annoying! I wanted particularly to see him. I have been running about all day, and couldn't get here before. Something important. Most important. At all events, I can tell you. But I entreat you that you won't breathe a word save to your father. Mr. Quarmby, that was his name, had taken a vacant chair and drawn it close to Marion's. He was in a state of joyous excitement, and talked in thick, rather pompous tones, with a pant at the end of a sentence. To emphasize the extremely confidential nature of his remarks, he brought his head almost in contact with the girl's, and one of her thin, delicate hands was covered with his red, podgy fingers. "'I have had a talk with Nathaniel Walker,' he continued, "'a long talk, a talk of vast importance. "'You know Walker? "'No, no, how should you? "'He's a man of business, close friend of Rackett's, "'Rackett, you know, the owner of the study.' Upon this he made a grave pause, and glared more excitedly than ever. "'I have heard of Mr. Rackett,' said Marian. "'Of course, of course. And you must also have heard that Fadge leaves the study at the end of the year, eh? Father told me it was probable. Rackett and he have done nothing but quarrel for months. The paper is falling off seriously. Well, now, when I came across Nat Walker this afternoon, the first thing he said to me was— "'You know Alfred Ewell pretty well, I think?' "'Pretty well,' I answered. "'Why?' "'I'll tell you,' he said. "'But it's between you and me, you understand. "'Rackett is thinking about him in connection with the study. "'I'm delighted to hear it.' "'To tell you the truth,' went on Nat, "'I shouldn't wonder if Ewell gets the editorship. "'But you understand that it would be altogether premature to talk about it. "'Now what do you think of this, eh?' "'It's very good news,' answered Marian. "'I should think so. Ho, ho!' Mr. Quarmby laughed in a peculiar way, which was the result of long years of mirth subduel in the reading-room. "'But not a breath to any one but your father. He'll be here to-morrow. Break it gently to him, you know. He's an excitable man. Can't take things quietly like I do. Ho, ho!' His suppressed laugh ended in a fit of coughing, the reading-room cough. When he had recovered from it, he pressed Marian's hand with paternal fervor and waddled off to chatter with someone else. Marian replaced several books on the reference shelves, returned others to the central desk, and was just leaving the room when again a voice made demand upon her attention. "'Miss Yule, one moment, if you please.' It was a tall, meager, dry-featured man, dressed with the painful neatness of self-respecting poverty. The edges of his coat-sleeves were carefully darned. His black necktie and skull-cap, which covered his baldness, were evidently of home manufacture. He smiled softly, and timidly with blue, roomy eyes. Two or three recent cuts on his chin and neck were the result of conscientious shaving, with an unsteady hand. "'I have been looking for your father,' he said, as Marian turned. "'Isn't he here?' "'He is gone, Mr. Hinks.' "'Ah, then would you do me the kindness to take a book for him? In fact, it's my little essay on the historical drama just out.' He spoke with nervous hesitation, and in a tone which seemed to make apology for his existence. "'Oh, father will be glad to have it. "'If you will kindly wait one minute, Miss Yule, it's at my place over there.' He went off with long strides, and speedily came back panting, in his hand a thin new volume. "'My kind regards to him, Miss Yule. You are quite well, I hope. I won't detain you.' And he backed into a man who was coming inobservantly this way. Marian went to the ladies' cloakroom, put on her hat and jacket, and left the museum. 
Someone passed out through the swing door a moment before her, and as soon as she had issued beneath the portico, she saw that it was Jasper Milvane. She must have followed him through the hall, but her eyes had been cast down. The young man was now alone. As he descended the steps, he looked to left and right, but not behind him. Marian followed at a distance of two or three yards. Nearing the gateway, she quickened her pace a little, so as to pass out into the street almost at the same moment as Milvane. But he did not turn his head. He took to the right. Marian had fallen back again, but she still followed at a very little distance. His walk was slow, and she might easily have passed him in quite a natural way. In that case he could not help seeing her, but there was an uneasy suspicion in her mind that he really must have noticed her in the reading-room. This was the first time she had seen him since their parting at Finden. Had he any reason for avoiding her? Did he take it ill that her father had shown no desire to keep up his acquaintance? She allowed the interval between them to become greater. In a minute or two Milvane turned up Charlotte Street, and so she lost sight of him. In Tottenham Court Road she waited for an omnibus that would take her to the remoter part of Camden Town. Obtaining a corner seat, she drew as far back as possible and paid no attention to her fellow passengers. At a point in Camden Road, she at length alighted, and after ten minutes' walk reached her destination in a quiet byway called St. Paul's Crescent, consisting of small, decent houses. That at which she paused had an exterior promising comfort within. The windows were clean and neatly curtained, and the polishable appurtenances of the door gleamed to perfection. She admitted herself with a latch-key, and went straight upstairs without encountering anyone. Descending again in a few moments, she entered the front room on the ground floor. This served both as parlour and dining-room. It was comfortably furnished, without much attempt at adornment. On the walls were a few autotypes and old engravings. A recess between fireplace and window was fitted with shelves, which supported hundreds of volumes, the overflow of Yule's library. The table was laid for a meal. It best suited the convenience of the family to dine at five o'clock. A long evening, so necessary to most literary people, was thus assured. Marian, as always, when she had spent a day at the museum, was faint with weariness and hunger. She cut a small piece of bread from a loaf on the table, and sat down in an easy chair. Presently appeared a short, slight woman of middle age, plainly dressed in serviceable grey. Her face could never have been very comely, and it expressed but moderate intelligence. Its lines, however, were those of gentleness and good feeling. She had the look of one who is making a painful effort to understand something. This was fixed upon her features, and probably resulted from the peculiar conditions of her life. "'Rather early, aren't you, Marian?' she said as she closed the door and came forward to take a seat. "'Yes, I have a little headache. Oh, dear, is that beginning again?' Mrs. Yule's speech was seldom ungrammatical and her intonation was not flagrantly vulgar, but the accent of the London poor, which brands, as with hereditary baseness, still clung to her words, rendering futile such propriety of phrase as she owed to years of association with educated people. In the same degree did her bearing fall short of that which distinguishes a lady. The London work-girl is rarely capable of raising herself or being raised, to a place in life above that to which she was born. She cannot learn how to stand, and sit, and move like a woman bred to refinement, any more than she can fashion her tongue to graceful speech. Mrs. Yule's behavior to Marian was marked with a singular diffidence. She looked and spoke affectionately, but not with a mother's freedom. 
one might have taken her for a trusted servant waiting upon her mistress. Whenever opportunity offered, she watched the girl in a curiously furtive way, that puzzled look on her face becoming very noticeable. Her consciousness was never able to accept as a familiar and unimportant fact the vast difference between herself and her daughter. Marian's superiority in native powers, in delicacy of feeling, in the results of education, could never be lost sight of. Under ordinary circumstances, she addressed the girl as if tentatively, however sure of anything from her own point of view, she knew that Marian, as often as not, had quite a different criterion. She understood that the girl frequently expressed an opinion by mere reticence, and hence the carefulness with which, when conversing, she tried to discover the real effect of her words in Marian's features. "'Hungry, too,' she said, seeing the crust Marian was nibbling. "'You really must have more lunch, dear. It isn't right to go so long.' You'll make yourself ill. Have you been out? Marian asked. Yes, I went to Holloway. Mrs. Yule sighed and looked very unhappy. By going to Holloway was always meant a visit to her own relatives, a married sister with three children and a brother who inhabited the same house. To her husband she scarcely ever ventured to speak of these persons. Yule had no intercourse with them but Marian was always willing to listen sympathetically, and her mother often exhibited a touching gratitude for this condescension, as she deemed it. "'Are things no better?' the girl inquired. "'Worse, as far as I can see. John has begun his drinking again, and him and Tom quarrel every night. There's no peace in the house. If ever Mrs. Yule lapsed into gross errors of pronunciation, or phrase, it was when she spoke of her kinsfolk. The subject seemed to throw her back into a former condition. He ought to go and live by himself, said Marian, referring to her mother's brother, the thirsty John. So he ought, to be sure. I'm always telling them so. But there, you don't seem to be able to persuade them. They're that silly and obstinate. And Susan, she only gets angry with me, and tells me not to talk in a stuck-up way. I'm sure I never say a word that could offend her. I'm too careful for that. And there's Annie. No doing anything with her. She's about the streets at all hours, and what'll be the end of it no one can say. They're getting that ragged, all of them. It isn't Susan's fault. Indeed it isn't. She does all that woman can. But Tom hasn't brought home ten shillings the last month. And it seems to me as if he was getting careless. I gave her half a crown. It was all I could do. And the worst of it is, they think I could do so much more if I liked. They're always hinting that we are rich people, and it's no good my trying to persuade them. They think I'm telling falsehoods, and it's very hard to be looked at in that way. It is indeed, Marian. You can't help it, Mother. I suppose their suffering makes them unkind and unjust. That's just what it does, my dear. You never said anything truer. Poverty will make the best people bad, if it gets hard enough. Why, there's so much of it in the world, I'm sure I can't see. I suppose father will be back soon. He said dinner time. Mr. Quarmby has been telling me something which is wonderfully good news, if it's really true, but I can't help feeling doubtful. He says that father may perhaps be made editor of the study at the end of this year. Mrs. Yule, of course, understood, in outline, these affairs of the literary world. She thought of them only from the pecuniary point of view, but that made no essential distinction between her and the mass of literary people. "'My word!' she exclaimed. "'What a thing that would be for us!' Marian had begun to explain her reluctance to base any hopes on Mr. Quarmby's prediction when the sound of a postman's knock at the house door caused her mother to disappear for a moment. "'It's for you,' said Mrs. Yu, returning, "'from the country.' Marian took the letter and examined its address with interest. "'It must be one of the Miss Milvanes. 
Yes, Dora Milvain. After Jasper's departure from Finden, his sisters had seen Marian several times, and the mutual liking between her and them had been confirmed by opportunity of conversation. The promise of correspondence had hitherto waited for fulfillment. It seemed natural to Marian that the younger of the two girls should write. Maud was attractive and agreeable and probably clever, but Dora had more spontaneity in friendship. "'It will amuse you to hear,' wrote Dora, "'that the literary project our brother mentioned in a letter whilst you were still here is really to come to something. He has sent us a specimen chapter written by himself of the child's history of Parliament, and Maud thinks she could carry it on in that style, if there's no hurry. She and I have both set to work on English histories, and we shall be authorities before long. Jolly and Monk offer thirty pounds for the little book if it suits them, when finished, with certain possible profits in the future. Trust Jasper for making a bargain. So perhaps our literary career will be something more than a joke, after all. I hope it may. Anything rather than a life of teaching. We shall be so glad to hear from you, if you still care to trouble about country girls. And so on. Marian read with a pleased smile, then acquainted her mother with the contents. "'I'm very glad,' said Mrs. Yule. "'It's so seldom you get a letter.' "'Yes.' Marian seemed desirous of saying something more, and her mother had a thoughtful look, suggestive of sympathetic curiosity. "'Is their brother likely to call here?' Mrs. Yule asked, with misgiving. "'No one has invited him to,' was the girl's quiet reply. "'He wouldn't come without that. "'It's not likely that he even knows the address.' Your father won't be seeing him, I suppose. By chance, perhaps, I don't know. It was very rare indeed for these two to touch upon any subject save those of everyday interest. In spite of the affection between them, their exchange of confidence did not go very far. Mrs. Yule, who had never exercised maternal authority since Marian's earliest childhood, claimed no maternal privileges and Marian's natural reserve had been strengthened by her mother's respectful aloofness. The English fault of domestic reticence could scarcely go further than it did in their case. Its exaggeration is, of course, one of the characteristics of those unhappy families severed by differences of education between the old and the young. "'I think,' said Marian, in a forced tone, "'that father hasn't much liking for Mr. Milvane. She wished to know if her mother had heard any private remarks on this subject, but she could not bring herself to ask directly. I'm sure I don't know, replied Mrs. Yule, smoothing her dress. He hasn't said anything to me, Marian. An awkward silence. The mother had fixed her eyes on the mantelpiece and was thinking hard. Otherwise, said Marian, he would have said something, I should think, about meeting in London. But is there anything in this gentleman that he wouldn't like? I don't know of anything. Impossible to pursue the dialogue. Marian moved uneasily, then rose, said something about putting the letter away, and left the room. Shortly after, Alfred Yule entered the house. It was no uncommon thing for him to come home in a mood of silent moroseness, and this evening... The first glimpse of his face was sufficient warning. He entered the dining-room and stood on the hearth-rug, reading an evening paper. His wife made a pretense of straightening things upon the table. "'Well,' he exclaimed irritably, "'it's after five. Why isn't dinner served?' "'It's just coming, Alfred. Even the average man of a certain age is an alarming creature when dinner delays itself.' The literary man in such a moment goes beyond all parallel, if there be added the fact that he has just returned from a very unsatisfactory interview with a publisher, wife and daughter may indeed regard the situation as appalling. Marian came in, and at once observed her mother's frightened face. Father, she said, hoping to make a diversion, Mr. Hinks has sent you his new book, and wishes 
then take mr hink's new book back to him and tell him that i have quite enough to do without reading tedious trash he needn't expect that i am going to write a notice of it the simpleton pesters me beyond endurance i wish to know if you please he added with savage calm when dinner will be ready if there is time to write a few letters just tell me at once that i mayn't waste half an hour marian resented this unreasonable anger but she durst not reply at that moment the servant appeared with a smoking joint and mrs yule followed carrying dishes of vegetables the man of letters seated himself and carved angrily he began his meal by drinking half a glass of ale then he ate a few mouthfuls in a quick hungry way his head bent closely over the plate it happened commonly enough that dinner passed without a word of conversation and that seemed likely to be the case this evening end of chapter seven part one chapter seven part two of new grub street this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by alan brown new grub street by george gissing chapter seven marion's home part two to his wife yule seldom addressed anything but a curt inquiry or caustic comment if he spoke humanly at table it was to marion ten minutes passed then marion resolved to try any means of clearing the atmosphere mr quarmby gave me a message for you she said a friend of his nathaniel walker has told him that mr rackett will very likely offer you the editorship of the study yule stopped in the act of mastication he fixed his eyes intently on the sirloin for half a minute then by way of the beer jug and the salt cellar turned them upon marian's face walker told him that pooh it was a great secret i wasn't to breathe a word to any one but you walker's a fool and quarmby's an ass remarked her father but there was a tremulousness in his bushy eyebrows his forehead half unwreathed itself he continued to eat more slowly and as if with appreciation of the viands what did he say repeat it to me in his words marian did so as nearly as possible he listened with a scoffing expression but still his features relaxed i don't credit racket with enough good sense for such a proposal he said deliberately and i'm not very sure i should accept it if it were made that fellow fadge has all but ruined the paper it will amuse me to see how long it takes him to make culpepper's new magazine a distinct failure a silence of five minutes ensued the newell said of a sudden where's hink's book marian reached it from a side table under this roof literature was regarded almost as a necessary part of table garnishing i thought it would be bigger than this Yule muttered as he opened the volume in a way peculiar to bookish men a page was turned down as if to draw attention to some passage yule put on his eyeglasses and soon made a discovery which had the effect of completing the transformation of his visage his eyes glinted his chin worked in pleasurable emotion in a moment he handed the book to marian indicating the small type of a footnote it embodied an effusive eulogy introduced apropos of some literary discussion of mr alfred yule's critical acumen scholarly research lucid style and sundry other distinguished merits that is kind of him said marian good old hinks i suppose i must try to get him a half a dozen readers may i see asked mrs yule under her breath bending to marian her daughter passed on the volume, and Mrs. Yule read the footnote the, with that look of slow appreciation, which is so pathetic when it signifies the heart's good will thwarted by the mind's defect. "'That'll be good for you, Alfred, won't it?' she said, glancing at her husband. 
Certainly, he replied with a smile of contemptuous irony. If Hinks goes on, he'll establish my reputation. And he took a draught of ale, like one who is reinvigorated for the battle of life. Marian, regarding him askance, mused on what seemed to her a strange anomaly in his character. It had often surprised her that a man of his temperament and powers should be so dependent upon the praise and blame of people whom he justly deemed his inferiors. Yule was glancing over the pages of the work. A pity the man can't write English. What vocabulary! Obstruent! Reliable, particularization, fabulosity, different to, averse to. Did one ever come across such a mixture of antique pedantry and modern vulgarism? Surely he has his name from the German Hinken, eh, Marian? With a laugh he tossed the book away again. His mood was wholly changed. He gave various evidences of enjoying the meal, and began to talk freely with his daughter. Finished the authoresses? Not quite. No hurry. When you have time, I want you to read Ditchley's new book, and jot down a selection of his worst sentences. I'll use them for an article on contemporary style. It occurred to me this afternoon. He smiled grimly. Mrs. Yule's face exhibited much contentment which became radiant joy when her husband remarked casually that the custard was very well made to-day. Dinner over, he rose without ceremony and went off to his study. The man had suffered much and toiled stupendously. It was not inexplicable that dyspepsia, and to many another ill that literary flesh is heir to, racked him sore go back to the days when he was an assistant at a bookseller's in Holborn. Already ambition devoured him, and the genuine love of knowledge goaded his brain. He allowed himself but three or four hours of sleep. He wrought doggedly at languages, ancient and modern. He tried his hand at metrical translations. He planned tragedies. Practically, he was living in a past age. His literary ideals were formed on the study of Boswell. The head assistant in the shop went away to pursue a business which had come into his hands on the death of a relative. It was a small publishing concern, housed in an alley off the Strand, and Mr. Polo, a singular name to become well known in the course of time, had his ideas about its possible extension. Among other instances of activity, he started a penny weekly paper called All Sorts, and in the pages of this periodical, Alfred Yule first appeared as an author. Before long, he became sub-editor of All Sorts, then actual director of the paper. He said good-bye to the bookseller, and his literary career fairly began. Mr. Polo used to say that he never knew a man who could work so many consecutive hours as Alfred Ewell. A faithful account of all that the young man learnt and wrote from 1855 to 1860, that is, from his twenty-fifth to his thirtieth year, would have the look of burlesque exaggeration. He had set it before him to become a celebrated man, and he was not unaware that the attainment of that end would cost him quite exceptional labor, seeing that nature had not favored him with brilliant parts. No matter, his name should be spoken among men unless he killed himself in the struggle for success. In the meantime he married, living in a garret, and supplying himself with the materials of his scanty meals. He was in the habit of making purchases at a little chandler's shop, where he was waited upon by a young girl of no beauty, but, as it seemed to him, of amiable disposition. One holiday he met this girl as she was walking with a younger sister in the streets. He made her nearer acquaintance, and before long she consented to be his wife and share his garret. His brothers John and Edmund cried out that he had made an unpardonable fool of himself in marrying so much beneath him, 
that he might well have waited until his income improved. This was all very well, but they might just as reasonably have bidden him reject plain food, because a few years hence he would be able to purchase luxuries. He could not do without nourishment of some sort, and the time had come when he could not do without a wife. Many a man with brains but no money has been compelled to the same step. Educated girls have a pronounced distaste for London garrets. Not one in fifty thousand would share poverty with the brightest genius ever born. Seeing that marriage is so often indispensable to that very success which would enable a man of parts to mate equally, there is nothing for it but to look below one's own level and be grateful to the untaught woman who has pity on one's loneliness. Unfortunately, Alfred Ewell was not so grateful as he might have been. His marriage proved far from unsuccessful. He might have found himself united to a vulgar shrew, whereas the girl had the great virtues of humility and kindliness. She endeavored to learn of him, but her dullness and his impatience made this attempt a failure. Her human qualities had to suffice. And they did, until Yule began to lift his head above the literary mob. Previously he often lost his temper with her, but never expressed or felt repentance of his marriage. Now he began to see only the disadvantages of his position, and forgetting the facts of the case, to imagine that he might well have waited for a wife who could share his intellectual existence. Mrs. Yule had to pass through a few years of much bitterness. Already a martyr to dyspepsia, and often suffering from bilious headaches of extreme violence, her husband now and then lost all control of his temper, all sense of kind feeling, even of decency, and reproached the poor woman with her ignorance, her stupidity, her low origin. Naturally enough, she defended herself with such weapons as a sense of cruel injustice supplied. More than once, the two all but parted. It did not come to an actual rupture, chiefly because Ewell could not do without his wife. Her tendons had become indispensable. And then there was the child to consider. From the first it was Yule's dread, lest Marian should be infected with her mother's faults of speech and behavior. He would scarcely permit his wife to talk to the child. At the earliest possible moment Marian was sent to a day school, and in her tenth year she went as weekly boarder to an establishment at Fulham. Any sacrifice of money to ensure her growing up with the tongue and manners of a lady. It can scarcely have been a light trial to the mother to know that contact with her was regarded as her child's greatest danger. But in her humility and her love for Marian, she offered no resistance. And so it came to pass that one day the little girl, hearing her mother make some flagrant grammatical error turned to the other parent and asked gravely why doesn't mother speak as properly as we do well that is one of the results of such marriages one of the myriad miseries that result from poverty the end was gained at all hazards marian grew up everything that her father desired not only had she the bearing of refinement but it early became obvious that nature had well endowed her with brains. From the nursery her talk was of books, and at the age of twelve she was already able to give her father some assistance as an amanuensis. At that time Edmund Yule was still living. He had overcome his prejudices, and there was intercourse between his household and that of the literary man. Intimacy it could not be called, for Mrs. Edmund, who was the daughter of a law stationer, had much difficulty in behaving to Mrs. Alfred with show of suavity. Still, the cousins Amy and Marian from time to time saw each other, and were not unsuitable companions. It was the death of Amy's father 
that brought these relations to an end. Left to the control of her own affairs, Mrs. Edmund was not long in giving offence to Mrs. Alfred, and so to Alfred himself. The man of letters might be inconsiderate enough in his behaviour to his wife, but as soon as anyone else treated her with disrespect, that was quite another matter. Purely on this account he quarrelled violently with his brother's widow, and from that day the two families kept apart. The chapter of quarrels was one of no small importance in Alfred's life. His difficult temper, and an ever-increasing sense of neglected merit, frequently put him at war with publishers, editors, fellow-authors, and he had an unhappy trick of exciting the hostility of men who were most likely to be useful to him. With Mr. Polo, for instance, who held him in esteem, and whose commercial success made him a valuable connection, Alfred ultimately broke on a trifling matter of personal dignity. Later came the great quarrel with Clement Fadge, an affair of considerable advantage in the way of advertisement to both men concerned. It happened in the year of 1873. At that time Yule was editor of a weekly paper called The Balance, a literary organ which aimed high, and failed to hit the circulation essential to its existence. Fadge, a younger man, did reviewing for The Balance. He was in needy circumstances, and had wrought himself into Yule's good opinion by judicious flattery. But with a clear eye, for the main chance, Mr. Fadge soon perceived that Yule could only be of temporary use to him, and that the editor of a well-established weekly, which lost no opportunity of throwing scorn upon Yule, and all his works would be a much more profitable conquest. He succeeded in transferring his services to the more flourishing paper, and struck out a special line of work by the free exercise of a malicious flippancy, which was then without rival in the periodical press. When he had thoroughly got his hand in, it fell to Mr. Fadge, in the mere way of business, to review a volume of his old editors, a rather pretentious and long-winded but far from worthless essay, on imagination as a national characteristic. The notice was a masterpiece. Its exquisite virulence set the literary circles chuckling. Concerning the authorship, there was no mystery, and Alfred Yule had the indiscretion to make a violent reply, a savage assault upon Fadge in the columns of the balance. Fadge desired nothing better. The uproar which arose, chaff, fury, grave comments, sneering spite, could only result in drawing universal attention to his anonymous cleverness and throwing ridicule upon the heavy, conscientious man. Well, you probably remember all about it. It ended in the disappearance of Yule's struggling paper, and the establishment on a firm basis of Fadge's reputation. It would be difficult to mention any department of literary endeavor in which Yule did not, at one time or another, try his fortune turn to his name in the museum catalogue. The list of works appended to it will amuse you. In his thirtieth year he published a novel. It failed completely, and the same result awaited a similar experiment five years later. He wrote a drama of modern life, and for some years strove to get it acted, but in vain. Finally it appeared for the closet, giving Clement Fadge such an opportunity as he seldom enjoyed. The one noteworthy thing about these productions, and about others of equally mistaken direction, was the sincerity of their workmanship. Had Yule been content to manufacture a novel, or a play with due disregard for literary honor, he might perchance have made a mercantile success. But the poor fellow had not pliancy enough for this. He took his efforts, au oh, grand sérieux, thought he was producing works of art, pursued his ambition in a spirit of fierce conscientiousness. In spite of all, he remained only a journeyman. The kind of work he did best was poorly paid, and could bring no fame. 
At the age of fifty he was still living in a poor house, in an obscure quarter. He earned enough for his actual needs, and was under no pressing fear for the morrow, so long as his faculties remained unimpaired. But there was no disguising from himself that his life had been a failure, and the thought tormented him. Now there had come, unexpectedly, a gleam of hope, if indeed the man Racket thought of offering him the editorship of the study, he might even yet taste the triumphs for which he had so vehemently longed. The study was a weekly paper of fair repute. Fadge had harmed it, no doubt of that, by giving it a tone which did not suit the majority of its readers, serious people, who thought that the criticism of contemporary writing offered an opportunity for something better than a display of malevolent wit. But a return to the old earnestness would doubtless set all right again, and the joy of sitting in that dictatorial chair, the delight of having his own organ once more, of making himself a power in the world of letters, of emphasizing to a large audience his developed methods of criticism, an embittered man is a man beset by evil temptations. The study contained each week certain columns of flying gossip, and when he thought of this, Yule also thought of Clement Fadge and sundry other of his worst enemies. How the gossip column can be used for hostile purposes, yet without the least overt offense, he had learnt only too well. Sometimes the mere omission of a man's name from a list of authors can mortify and injure. In our day the manipulation of such paragraphs has become a fine art, but he recalled numerous illustrations. Alfred knew well enough how incessantly the tempter would be at his ear. He said to himself that in certain instances yielding would be no dishonor, he himself had many a time been mercilessly treated. In the very interest of the public it was good that certain men should suffer a snubbing, and his fingers itched to have hold of the editorial pen. Ha-ha! Like the war-horse he snuffed the battle afar off. No work this evening, though there were tasks which pressed for completion. His study, the only room on the ground level except the dining room, was small, and even a good deal of the floor was encumbered with books. But he found space for walking nervously hither and thither. He was doing this when, about half-past nine, his wife appeared at the door, bringing him a cup of coffee and some biscuits, his wonted supper. Marian generally waited upon him at this time, and he asked, why she had not come. She has one of her headaches again, I'm sorry to say, Miss Yule replied. I persuaded her to go to bed early. Having placed the tray upon the table, books had to be pushed aside. She did not seem disposed to withdraw. Are you busy, Alfred? Why? I thought I should like just to speak of something. She was using the opportunity of his good humor. Ewell spoke to her with the usual carelessness, but not forbiddingly. What is it? Those Holloway people, I'll warrant. No, no, it's about Marian. She had a letter from one of those young ladies this afternoon. What young ladies? asked Ewell with impatience of this circuitous approach. The Miss Milvanes. Well, there's no harm that I know of. They're decent people. Yes, so you told me. But she began to speak about her brother, and what about him? Do say what you want to say, and have done with it. I can't help thinking, Alfred, that she's disappointed you didn't ask him to come here. You stared at her in slight surprise. He was still not angry, and seemed quite willing to consider this matter suggested to him so timorously. Oh, you think so? Well, I don't know. Why should I have asked him? It was only because Miss Harrow seemed to wish it that I saw him down there. 
I have no particular interest in him. And as for... He broke off, and seated himself. Mrs. Yule stood at a distance. We must remember her age, she said. Why, yes, of course, he mused, and began to nibble a biscuit. And you know, Alfred, she never does meet any young men. I've often thought it wasn't right to her. Hm. But this lad Milvane is a very doubtful sort of customer. To begin with, he has nothing, and they tell me his mother, for the most part, supports him. I don't quite approve of that. She isn't well off, and he ought to have been making a living by now. He has a kind of cleverness, may do something, but there's no being sure of that. These thoughts were not coming into his mind for the first time. On the occasion when he met Milvane and Marian together in the country road, he had necessarily reflected upon the possibilities of such intercourse, and with the issue that he did not care to give any particular encouragement to its continuance. He, of course, heard of Milvane's leave-taking call, and he purposely refrained from seeing the young man after that. The matter took no very clear shape in his meditations. He saw no likelihood that either of the young people would think much of the other after their parting, and time enough to trouble one's head with such subjects when they could no longer be postponed. It would not have been pleasant to him to foresee a life of spinsterhood for his daughter, but she was young, and she was a valuable assistant. How far did that latter consideration weigh with him? He put the question pretty distinctly to himself, now that his wife had broached the matter thus unexpectedly. Was he prepared to behave with deliberate selfishness? Never yet had any conflict been manifested between his interests and Marian's. Practically he was in the habit of counting upon her aid for an indefinite period. If, indeed, he became editor of the study, why, in that case, her assistance would be less needful, and, indeed, it seemed probable that young Milvane had a future before him. But in any case, he said aloud, partly continuing his thoughts, partly replying to a look of disappointment on his wife's face, how do you know that he has any wish to come and see Marian? I don't know anything about it, of course. And you may have made a mistake about her. What made you think she had him in mind? Well, it was her way of speaking, you know, and then she asked if you had got a dislike to him. She did. Hmm. Well, I don't think Milvane is any good to Marian. He's just the kind of man to make himself agreeable to a girl for the fun of the thing. Mrs. Ewell looked alarmed. Oh, if you really think that, don't let him come. I wouldn't for anything. I don't say it for certain. He took a sip of his coffee. I have had no opportunity of observing him with much attention, but he's not the kind of man I care for. Then no doubt it's better as it is. Yes, I don't see anything that could be done now. We shall see whether he gets on. I advise you not to mention him to her. Oh, no, I won't. She moved as if to go away, but her heart had been made uneasy by that short conversation which followed on Marian's reading the letter, and there were still things she wished to put into words. If those ladies go on writing to her, I dare say they'll often speak about their brother. Yes, it's rather unfortunate. And you know, Alfred, he may have asked them to do it. I suppose there's one subject on which all women can be subtle, muttered Yule, smiling. The remark was not a kind one, but he did not make it worse by his tone. The listener failed to understand him, and looked with her familiar expression of mental effort. "'We can't help that,' he added, with a reference to her suggestion. "'If he has any serious thoughts, well, let him go on and wait for opportunities. "'It's a great pity, isn't it, that you can't see more people of the right kind?' No use talking about it. Things are as they are. I can't see that her life is unhappy. It isn't very happy. You think not? I'm sure it isn't. If I get the study, things may be different. 
though but it's no use talking about what can't be helped now don't you go encouraging her to think herself lonely and so on it's best for her to keep close to work i'm sure of that perhaps it is i'll think it over mrs yule silently left the room and went back to her sewing she had understood that though and the what can't be helped such allusions reminded her of a time unhappier than the present when she had been wont to hear plainer language she knew too well that had she been a woman of education her daughter would not now be suffering from loneliness it was her own choice that she did not go with her husband and marry into john newell's she made an excuse that the house could not be left to one servant but in any case she would have remained at home for her presence must needs be an embarrassment both to father and daughter alfred was always ashamed of her before strangers he could not conceal his feeling either from her or from other people who had reason for observing him marian was not perhaps ashamed but such companionship put restraint upon her freedom and would it not always be the same supposing mr milvane were to come to this house would it not repel him when he found what sort of person marian's mother was she shed a few tears over her needlework at midnight the study door opened yule came to the dining-room to see that all was right and it surprised him to find his wife still sitting there why are you so late i forgot the time forgotten forgotten don't go back to that kind of language again come put the light out end of chapter seven Chapter 8, Part 1 of New Grub Street. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bridget Gage. New Grub Street by George Gissing. Chapter 8, Part 1 To the Winning Side. Of the acquaintances Yule had retained from his earlier years, several were in the well defined category of men with unpresentable wives. There was Hinks, for instance, whom, though in anger he spoke of him as a bore, Alfred held in some genuine regard. Hinks made perhaps a hundred a year out of a kind of writing which only certain publishers can get rid of, and of this income he spent about a third on books. His wife was the daughter of a laundress, in whose house he had lodged thirty years ago, when new to London, but already long acquainted with hunger. They lived in complete harmony, but Mrs. Hinks, who was four years the elder, still spoke the laundress tongue, unmitigated and unmitigatable. Another pair were Mr. and Mrs. Gorbutt. In this case, there were no narrow circumstances to contend with, for the wife, originally a nursemaid, not long after her marriage inherited house property from her relative. Mr. Gorbutt deemed himself a poet, since his accession to an income he had published, at his own expense, a yearly volume of verses, the only result being to keep alive rancor in his wife, who was both parsimonious and vain. Making no secret of it, Mrs. Gorbett rued the day on which she had wedded a man of letters, when by waiting so short a time she would have been enabled to aim at a prosperous tradesman, who kept his gig and had everything handsome about him. Mrs. Yule suspected, not without reason, that this lady had an inclination to strong liquors. Thirdly came Mr. and Mrs. Christofferson, who were poor as church mice. Even in a friend's house they wrangled incessantly, and made tragi-comical revelations of their home life. The husband worked casually at irresponsible journalism, but his chosen study was metaphysics. For many years he had had a huge and profound book on hand, which he believed would bring him fame, though he was not so unsettled in mind as to hope for anything else. When an article or two had earned enough money for immediate necessities, he went off to the British Museum, and then the difficulty was to recall him to profitable exertions. Yet yeah, husband and wife had an affection for each other. Mrs. Christofferson came from Camberwell, where her father, once upon a time, was the smallest of small butchers. Disagreeable stories were whispered concerning her earlier life, 
and probably the metaphysician did not care to look back in that direction. They had had three children. All were happily buried. These men were capable of better things than they had done or would ever do. In each case, their failure to fulfill youthful promise was largely explained by the unpresentable wife. They should have waited. They might have married a social equal at something between fifty and sixty. Another old friend was Mr. Cornby. Unwedded he, and perpetually exultant over men who, as he phrased it, had noosed themselves. He made a fair living, but, like Dr. Johnson, had no passion for clean linen. Yule was not disdainful of these old companions, and the fact that all had a habit of looking up to him increased his pleasure in their occasional society. If, as happened once or twice in half a year, several of them were gathered together at his house, he tasted a sham kind of social and intellectual authority which he could not help relishing. On such occasions he threw off his habitual gloom and talked vigorously, making natural display of his learning and critical ability. The topic, sooner or later, was that which is inevitable in such a circle. The demerits, the pretentiousness, the personal weakness of prominent contemporaries in the world of letters. Then did the room ring with scornful laughter, with boisterous satire, with shouted irony, with fierce invective. After an evening of that kind, Yule was unwell and miserable for several days. It was not to be expected that Mr. Cornby, inveterate chatterbox of the reading room and other resorts, should keep silence concerning what he had heard of Mr. Rackett's intentions. The rumor soon spread that Alfred Yule was to succeed Fadge in the direction of the study, with the necessary consequence that Yule found himself an object of affectionate interest to a great many people, of whom he knew little or nothing. At the same time, the genuine old friends pressed warmly about him, with congratulations, with hints of their sincere readiness to assist in filling the columns of the paper. All this was not disagreeable, but in the meantime Yule had heard nothing whatever from Mr. Rackett himself, and his doubts did not diminish as week after week went by. The event justified him. At the end of October appeared an authoritative announcement that Fadge's successor would be not Alfred Yule, but a gentleman who till of late had been quietly working as a sub-editor in the provinces, and who had neither friendships nor enmities among the people of the London literary press. A young man, comparatively fresh from the university, and said to be strong in pure scholarship. The choice, as you are aware, proved a good one, and the study became an organ of more repute than ever. Yule had been secretly conscious that it was not to men such as he that positions of this kind are nowadays entrusted. He tried to persuade himself that he was not disappointed. But when Mr. Cornby approached him with a blank face, he spoke certain wrathful words which long wrinkled in that worthy's mind. At home he kept sullen silence. No, not to such men as he, poor and without social recommendations. Besides, he was growing too old— in literature, as in most other pursuits, the press of energetic young men was making it very hard, for a veteran even, to hold the little grazing plot he had won by hard fighting. Still, Quornby's story had not been without foundation. It was true that the proprietor of the study had for a moment thought of Alfred Yule, doubtless as to the natural contrast to Clement Fadge, whom he would have liked to mortify if the thing were possible. But counsellors had proved to Mr. Rackett the disadvantages of such a choice. Mrs. Yule and her daughter foresaw but too well the results of this disappointment, notwithstanding that Alfred announced it to them with dry indifference. The month that followed was a time of misery for all in the house. Day after day Yule sat at his meals in sullen muteness. To his wife he scarcely spoke at all, and his conversation with Marian did not go beyond necessary questions and remarks on topics of business. His face became so strange a color that one would have thought him suffering from an attack of jaundice. Bilious headaches exasperated his savage mood. Mrs. Yule knew from long experience how worse than useless it was for her to attempt consolation. In silence was her only safety. Nor did Marian venture to speak directly of what had happened. But one evening, when she had been engaged in the study and was now saying good night, she laid her cheek against her father's an unwanted caress which had a strange effect upon him. 
The expression of sympathy caused his thoughts to reveal themselves, as they never yet had done before his daughter. "'It might have been very different with me,' he exclaimed abruptly, as if they had already been conversing on the subject. "'When you think of my failures, and you must often do so now you are grown up and understand things, don't forget the obstacles that have been in my way. I don't like you to look upon your father as a thickhead who couldn't be expected to succeed. Look at Fadge. He married a woman of good social position. She brought him friends and influence. But for that, he would never have been editor of the study, a place for which he wasn't in the least fit. But he was able to give dinners. He and his wife went into society. Everybody knew him and talked of him. How has it been with me? I live here like an animal in its hole, and go blinking about, if by chance I find myself among the people with whom I ought naturally to associate. If I had been able to come in direct contact with Racket and other men of that kind, to dine with them, and have them to dine with me, to belong to a club, and so on, I shouldn't be what I am at my age. My one opportunity, when I edited The Balance, wasn't worth much. There was no money behind the paper. We couldn't hold out long enough. But even then, if I could have assumed my proper social standing, if I could have opened my house freely to the right kind of people, how was it possible? Marian could not raise her head. She recognized the portion of truth in what he said, but it shocked her that he should allow himself to speak thus. Her silence seemed to remind him how painful it must be to her to hear these accusations of her mother. And with a sudden, good night, he dismissed her. She went up to her room, and wept over the wretchedness of all their lives. Her loneliness had seemed harder to bear than ever since that last holiday. For a moment, in the lanes about Finden, there had come to her a vision of joy, such as fate owed her youth. But it had faded, and she could no longer hope for its return. She was not a woman, but a mere machine for reading and writing. Did her father never think of this? He was not the only one to suffer from the circumstances in which poverty had involved him. She had no friends to whom she could utter her thoughts. Dora Milvane had written a second time, and more recently had come a letter from Maud. But in replying to them she could not give a true account of herself. Impossible to them. From what she wrote they would imagine her contentedly busy, absorbed in the affairs of literature. To no one could she make known the aching sadness of her heart, the dreariness of life as it lay before her. That beginning of half-confidence between her and her mother had led to nothing. Mrs. Yule found no second opportunity of speaking to her husband about Jasper Milvane, and purposely she refrained from any further hint or question to Marian. Everything must go on as hitherto. The days darkened. Through November rains and fogs Marian went her usual way to the museum, and toiled there among the other toilers. Perhaps once a week she allowed herself to stray about the alleys of the reading-room, scanning furtively those who sat at the desks, but the face she might perchance have discovered was not there. One day, at the end of the month, she sat with books open before her, but by no effort could fix her attention upon them. It was gloomy, and one could scarcely see to read. A taste of fog grew perceptible in the warm, headachy air. Such profound discouragement possessed her that she could not even maintain the pretense of study. Heedless whether any one observed her, she let her hands fall and her head droop. She kept asking herself what was the use and purpose of such a life as she was condemned to lead. When already there was more good literature in the world than any mortal could cope with in his lifetime, here was she exhausting herself in the manufacture of printed stuff which no one even pretended to be more than a commodity for the day's market. What unspeakable folly! To write, was not that the joy and the privilege of one who had an urgent message for the world? Her father, she knew well, had no such message. He had abandoned all thought of original production, and only wrote about writing. She herself would throw away her pen with joy, but for the need of earning money. And all these people about her, what aim had they save to make new books out of those already existing, that yet newer books might in turn be made out of theirs? This huge library, growing into unwieldiness, threatening to become a trackless desert of print. How intolerably it weighed upon the spirit! Oh, to go forth and labor with one's hands, to do any poorest, commonest work of which the world had truly need! It was ignoble to sit here and support the paltry pretense of intellectual dignity. A few days ago, 
Her startled eye had caught an advertisement in the newspaper, headed Literary Machine. Had it then been invented at last, some automaton to supply the place of such poor creatures as herself to turn out books and articles? Alas, the machine was only one for holding volumes conveniently, that the work of literary manufacture might be physically lightened. But surely before long some Edison would make the true automaton. The problem must be comparatively such a simple one. Only to throw in a given number of old books, and have them reduced, blended, modernized, into a single one for today's consumption. The fog grew thicker. She looked up at the windows beneath the dome, and saw that they were a dusky yellow. Then her eye discerned an official walking along the upper gallery, and in pursuance of her grotesque humor, her mocking misery, she likened him to a black, lost soul, doomed to wander in an eternity of vain research along endless shelves. Or again, the readers who sat here at these radiating lines of desks, what were they but hapless flies caught in a huge web, its nucleus the great circle of the catalogue? Darker, darker. From the towering wall of volumes seemed to emanate visible motes, intensifying the obscurity. In a moment, the book lined circumference of the room would be but a featureless prison limit. But then flashed forth the spluttering whiteness of the electric light, and its ceaseless hum was henceforth a new source of headache. It reminded her how little work she had done today. She must, she must force herself to think of the task in hand. A machine has no business to refuse its duty. But the pages were blue and green and yellow before her eyes. The uncertainty of the light was intolerable. Right or wrong, she would go home and hide herself, and let her heart unburden itself of tears. On her way to return books, she encountered Jasper Milvane. Face to face, no possibility of his avoiding her. And indeed, he seemed to have no such wish. His countenance lighted up with unmistakable pleasure. At last we meet, as they say in the melodramas. Oh, do let me help you with those volumes, which won't even let you shake hands. How do you do? How do you like this weather? And how do you like this light? It's very bad. That'll do both for weather and light, but not for yourself. How glad I am to see you. Are you just going? Yes. I have scarcely been here half a dozen times since I came back to London. But you are writing still? Oh, yes, but I draw upon my genius and my stores of observation, and the living world. Marian received her vouchers for the volumes, and turned to face Jasper again. There was a smile on her lips. The fog is terrible, Milvane went on. How do you get home? By omnibus from Tottenham Court Road. Then do let me go a part of the way with you. I live in Mornington Road, up yonder, you know. I have only just come in to waste half an hour. And after all, I think I should be better at home. Your father is all right, I hope. He is not quite well. I'm sorry to hear that. You are not exactly up to the mark either. What weather! What a place to live in, this London in winter. It would be a little better down at Finden. A good deal better, I should think. If the weather were bad, it would be bad in a natural way. But this is artificial misery. I don't let it affect me much, said Milvane. Just of late, I have been in remarkably good spirits. I'm doing a lot of work. No end of work. More than I've ever done. I'm very glad. Where are your out of door things? I think there's a lady's vestry somewhere, isn't there? Oh, yes. Then will you go and get ready? I'll wait for you in the hall. But, by the by, I'm taking it for granted that you were going alone. I was, quite alone. The quite seemed excessive. It made Jasper smile. And also, he added, that I should not annoy you by offering my company. Why should it annoy me? Good. Milvane had only to wait a minute or two. He surveyed Marian from head to foot when she appeared. An impertinence as unintentional as that occasionally noticeable in his speech. And smiled approval. They went out into the fog, which was not one of London's densest, but made walking disagreeable enough. You have heard from the girls, I think, Jasper resumed. Your sisters? Yes, they have been so kind as to write to me. Told you all about their great work? I hope it'll be finished by the end of the year. The bits they have sent me will do very well indeed. I knew they had it in them to put sentences together. Now I want them to think of patching up something or other for the English girl. You know the paper. I have heard of it. I happen to know Mrs. Boston Wright, who edits it. 
met her at a house the other day, and told her frankly that she would have to give my sisters something to do. It's the only way to get on. One has to take it for granted that people are willing to help you. I have made a host of new acquaintances just lately. I'm glad to hear it, said Marian. Do you know? But how should you? I'm going to write for the new magazine, The Current. Indeed. Edited by that man Fadge. Yes. Your father has no affection for him, I know. He has no reason to have, Mr. Milvane. No, no. Fadge is an offensive fellow, when he likes, and I fancy he very often does like. Well, I must make what use of him I can. You won't think worse of me because I write for him. I know that one can't exercise choice in such things. True. I shouldn't like to think that you regard me as a fadge like individual, a natural fadgeite. Marian laughed. There's no danger of my thinking that. But the fog was making their eyes water and getting into their throats. By when they reached Tottenham Court Road, they were both thoroughly uncomfortable. The bus had to be waited for, and in the meantime they talked scrappily, coughily. In the vehicle things were a little better, but here one could not converse with freedom. What pestilent conditions of life! exclaimed Jasper, putting his face rather near to Marian's. I wish to goodness we were back in those quiet fields, you remember? With the September sun warm about us. Shall you go to Finden again before long? I really don't know. I'm sorry to say my mother is far from well. In any case, I must go at Christmas, but I'm afraid it won't be a cheerful visit. Arrived in Hampstead Road, he offered his hand for goodbye. I wanted to talk about all sorts of things, but perhaps I shall find you again some day. He jumped out and waved his hat in the lowered fog. End of chapter 8, section 1. Chapter Eight, Part Two of New Grub Street. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bridget Gage, New Grub Street by George Gissing. Chapter Eight, Part Two. To the winning side. Shortly before the end of December appeared the first number of the Current. Yule had once or twice referred to the forthcoming magazine with acrid contempt. And of course he did not purchase a copy. So young Milvane has joined Fadge's hopeful standard, he remarked, a day or two later at breakfast. They say his paper is remarkably clever. I could wish it had appeared anywhere else. Evil communications, etc. But I shouldn't think there's any personal connection, said Marian. Very likely not, but Milvane has been invited to contribute, you see. Do you think he ought to have refused? Oh, no, it's nothing to me, nothing whatever. Mrs. Yule glanced at her daughter, but Marian seemed unconcerned. The subject was dismissed. In introducing it, Yule had had his purpose. There had always been an unnatural avoidance of Milvane's name in conversation, and he wished to have an end of this. Hitherto, he had felt a troublesome uncertainty regarding his position in the matter. From what his wife had told him, it seemed pretty certain that Marian was disappointed by the abrupt closing of her brief acquaintance with the young man. And Yule's affection for his daughter caused him to feel uneasy in the thought that perhaps he had deprived her of a chance of happiness. His conscience readily took hold of an excuse for justifying the course he had followed. Milvane had gone over to the enemy. Whether or not the young man understood how relentless the hostility was between Yule and Fadge mattered little. The probability was that he knew all about it. In any case, intimate relations with him could not have survived this alliance with Fadge. So that, after all, there had been wisdom in letting the acquaintance lapse. To be sure, nothing could have come of it. Milvane was the kind of man who weighed opportunities. Every step he took would be regulated by considerations of advantage. At all events, that was the impression his character had made upon Yule. Any hopes that Marian might have been induced to form would assuredly have ended in disappointment. It was kindness to interpose before things had gone so far. Henceforth, if Milvane's name was unavoidable, it should be mentioned just like that of any other literary man. It seemed very unlikely indeed that Marian would continue to think of him with any special and personal interest. The fact of her having got into correspondence with his sisters was unfortunate, but this kind of thing rarely went on for very long. Ewell spoke of the matter with his wife that evening. 
By the by, has Marian heard from those girls at Finden lately? She had a letter one afternoon last week. Do you see these letters? No, she told me what was in them at first, but now she doesn't. She hasn't spoken to you again, if Milvane. Not a word. Well, I understood what I was about, Yule remarked, with the confident air of one who doesn't wish to remember that he had ever felt doubtful. There was no good in having the fellow here. He has got in with a set that I don't at all care for. If she ever says anything, you understand, you can just let me know. Marian had already procured a copy of the current, and read it privately. Of the cleverness of Milvane's contribution, there could be no two opinions. It drew the attention of the public, and all notices of the new magazine made special reference to this article. With keen interest, Marian sought after comments of the press. When it was possible, she cut them out and put them carefully away. January passed, and February. She saw nothing of Jasper. A letter from Dora in the first week of March made announcement that the child's history of the English Parliament would be published very shortly. It told her, too, that Mrs. Milvane had been very ill indeed, but that she seemed to recover a little strength as the weather improved. Of Jasper there was no mention. A week later came the news that Mrs. Milvane had suddenly died. This letter was received at breakfast time. The envelope was an ordinary one. And so little did Marian anticipate the nature of its contents, that at the first sight of the words she uttered an exclamation of pain. Her father, who had turned from the table to the fireside with his newspaper, looked round and asked what was the matter. Mrs. Milvane died the day before yesterday. Indeed. He averted his face again, and seemed disposed to say no more. But in a few moments he inquired, What are her daughters likely to do? I have no idea. Do you know anything of their circumstances? I believe they will have to depend upon themselves. Nothing more was said. Afterwards, Mrs. Yule made a few sympathetic inquiries, but Marian was very brief in her replies. Ten days after that, on a Sunday afternoon, when Marian and her mother were alone in the sitting room, they heard the knock of a visitor at the front door. Yule was out, and there was no likelihood of the visitors wishing to see anyone but him. They listened. The servant went to the door, and, after a murmur of voices, came to speak to her mistress. "'It's a gentleman called Mr. Milvane,' the girl reported, in a way that proved how seldom callers presented themselves. He asked for Mr. Yule, and when I said he was out, then he asked for Miss Yule. Mother and daughter looked anxiously at each other. Mrs. Yule was nervous and helpless. "'Show Mr. Milvane into the study,' said Marian, with sudden decision." "'Are you going to see him there?' asked her mother in a hurried whisper. "'I thought you would prefer that to his coming in here.' "'Yes, yes, but suppose father comes back before he's gone. "'What will it matter? You forget that he asked for father first. "'Oh, yes, then don't wait.' Marian, scarcely less agitated than her mother, was just leaving the room, when she turned back again. "'If father comes in, you will tell him before he goes into the study.' "'Yes, I will.' The fire in the study was on the point of extinction. This was the first thing Marian's eye perceived on entering, and it gave her assurance that her father would not be back for some hours. Evidently, he had intended it to go out. Small economies of this kind, unintelligible to people who have always lived at ease, had been the lifelong rule with him. With a sensation of gladness at having free time before her, Marian turned to where Milvane was standing, in front of one of the bookcases. He wore no symbol of mourning, but his countenance was far graver than usual, and rather paler. They shook hands in silence. "'I am so grieved,' Marian began, with broken voice. "'Thank you. I know the girls have told you all about it. We knew for the last month that it must come before long, though there was a deceptive improvement just before the end. "'Please to sit down, Mr. Milvane. Father went out not long ago, and I don't think he will be back very soon.' "'It was not really Mr. Yule I wished to see,' said Jasper, frankly. "'If he had been at home, I should have spoken with him about what I have in mind. "'But if you will kindly give me a few minutes, it will be much better.' Marian glanced at the expiring fire. Her curiosity as to what Milvane had to say was mingled with an anxious doubt whether it was not too late to put on fresh coals. Already the room was growing very chill, and this appearance of inhospitality troubled her. "'Do you wish to save it?' 
Jasper asked, understanding her look and movement. I'm afraid it has got too low. I think not. Life in lodgings has made me skillful at this kind of thing. Let me try my hand. He took the tongs, and carefully disposed small pieces of coal upon the glow that remained. Marian stood apart, with a feeling of shame and annoyance. But it is so seldom that situations in life arrange themselves with dramatic propriety. And, after all, this vulgar necessity made the beginning of the conversation easier. That will be all right now, said Jasper at length, as little tongues of flame began to shoot here and there. Marian said nothing, but seated herself and waited. I came up to town yesterday, Jasper began. Of course, we have had a great deal to do and think about. Miss Harrow has been very kind indeed to the girls, so have several of our old friends in Wattleboro. It was necessary to decide at once what Maud and Dora are going to do, and it is on their account that I have come to see you. The listener kept silence, with a face of sympathetic attention. We have made up our minds that they may as well come to London. It's a bold step. I'm by no means sure that the result will justify it, but I think they are perhaps right in wishing to try it. They will go on with literary work? Well, it's our hope that they may be able to. Of course, there's no chance of their earning enough to live upon for some time. But the matter stands like this. They have a trifling sum of money, on which, at a pinch, they could live in London for perhaps a year and a half. In that time, they may find their way to a sort of income. At all events, the chances are that a year and a half hence I shall be able to help them to keep body and soul together. The money of which he spoke was the debt owed to their father by William Milvane. In consequence of Mrs. Milvane's pressing application, half of this sum had at length been paid, and the remainder was promised in a year's time, greatly to Jasper's astonishment. In addition, there would be the trifle realized by the sale of furniture, though most of this might have to go in payment of rent, unless the house could be relet immediately. They have made a good beginning, said Marian. She spoke mechanically, for it was impossible to keep her thoughts under control. If Maud and Dora came to live in London, it might bring about a most important change in her life. She could scarcely imagine the happiness of having two such friends always near. On the other hand, how would it be regarded by her father? She was at a loss amid conflicting emotions. It's better than if they had done nothing at all, Jasper replied to her remark, and the way they knocked that trifle together promises well. They did it very quickly, and in far more workmanlike way than I should have thought possible. No doubt they share your own talent. Perhaps so. Of course I know that I have talent of a kind, though I don't rate it very high. We shall have to see whether they can do anything more than mere booksellers' work. They are both very young, you know. I think they may be able to write something that'll do for the English girl. And no doubt I can hit upon a second idea that will appeal to Jolly and Monk. At all events, they'll have books within reach, and better opportunities every way than at Finden. How do their friends in the country think of it? Very dubiously. But then, what else was to be expected? Of course, the respectable and intelligible path marked out for both of them points to a life of governessing. But the girls have no relish for that. They'd rather do almost anything. We talked over all the aspects of the situation seriously enough. It is desperately serious. No doubt of that. I told them fairly all the hardships they would have to face, described the typical London lodgings, and so on. Still, there's an adventurous vein in them, and they decided for the risk. If it came to the worst, I suppose they could still find governess work. Let us hope better things. Yes, but now I should have felt far more reluctant to let them come here in this way, hadn't it been that they regard you as a friend. Tomorrow morning you will probably hear from one or both of them. Perhaps it would have been better if I had left them to tell you all this. But I felt I should like to see you, and put it in my own way. I think you'll understand this feeling, Miss Yule. I wanted, in fact, to hear from yourself that you would be a friend to the poor girls. Oh, you already know that. I shall be so very glad to see them often. Marian's voice lent itself very naturally and sweetly to the expression of warm feeling. Emphasis was not her habit. It only needed that she should put off her ordinary reserve, utter quietly the emotional thought which so seldom might declare itself, and her tones had an exquisite womanliness. Jasper looked full into her face. In that case, they won't miss the comfort of home so much. Of course, they will have to go into the very modest lodgings indeed, 
I have already been looking about. I should like to find rooms for them somewhere near my own place. It's a decent neighborhood, and the park is at hand, and then they wouldn't be very far from you. They thought it might be possible to make a joint establishment with me, but I'm afraid that's out of the question. The lodgings we should want in that case, everything considered, would cost more than the sum of our expenses if we live apart. Besides, there's no harm in saying that I don't think we should get along very well together. We're all of us rather quarrelsome, to tell the truth, and we try each other's tempers. Marian smiled and looked puzzled. Shouldn't you have thought that? I have seen no signs of quarrelsomeness. I'm not sure that the worst fault is on my side. Why should one condemn oneself against conscience? Maud is perhaps the hardest to get along with. She has a sort of arrogance, an exaggeration of something I'm quite aware of in myself. You have noticed that trait in me. Arrogance? I think not. You have self-confidence. Which goes into extremes now and then. But putting myself aside, I feel pretty sure that the girls won't seem quarrelsome to you. They would have to be very fractious indeed before that were possible. We shall continue to be friends, I am sure. Jasper let his eyes wander about the room. This is your father's study? Yes. Perhaps it would have seemed odd to Mr. Yule if I had come in and begun to talk to him about these purely private affairs. He knows me so very slightly. But in calling here for the first time, an unusual embarrassment checked him. I will explain to father your very natural wish to speak of these things, said Marian, with tact. She thought uneasily of her mother in the next room. To her there appeared no reason whatever why Jasper should not be introduced to Mrs. Yule, yet she could not venture to propose it. Remembering her father's last remarks about Milvane in connection with Fadge's magazine, she must wait for distinct permission before offering the young man encouragement to repeat his visit. Perhaps there was complicated trouble in store for her. Impossible to say how her father's deep-rooted and rankling antipathies might affect her intercourse even with the two girls. But she was of independent years. She must be allowed the choice of her own friends. The pleasure she had in seeing Jasper under this roof, and hearing him talk with such intimate friendliness, strengthened her to resist timid thoughts. "'When will your sisters arrive?' she asked. "'I think in a very few days. When I have fixed upon lodgings for them, I must go back to Finden. Then they will return with me, as soon as we can get the house emptied. It's rather miserable selling things one has lived among from childhood.' A friend in Wattleborough will house for us what we really can't bear to part with. It must be very sad, Marian murmured. You know, said the other suddenly, that it's my fault the girls are left in such a hard position. Marian looked at him with startled eyes. His tone was quite unfamiliar to her. Mother had an annuity, he continued. It ended with her life. But if it hadn't been for me, she could have saved a good deal out of it. Until the last year or two, I have earned nothing, and I have spent more than was strictly necessary. Well, I didn't live like that in mere recklessness. I knew I was preparing myself for enumerative work. But it seems too bad now. I'm sorry for it. I wish I had found some way of supporting myself. The end of mother's life was made far more unhappy than it need have been. I should like you to understand all this. The listener kept her eyes on the ground. Perhaps the girls have hinted it to you. Jasper added. No. Selfishness. That's one of my faults. It isn't a brutal kind of selfishness. The thought of it often enough troubles me. If I were rich, I should be a generous and good man. I know I should. So would many another poor fellow whose worst features come out under hardship. This isn't a heroic type. Of course not. I am a civilized man. That's all. Marian could say nothing. You wonder why I am so impertinent as to talk about myself like this. I have gone through a good deal of mental pain these last few weeks, and somehow I can't help showing you something of my real thoughts, just because you are one of the few people I regard with sincere respect. I don't know you very well, but quite well enough to respect you. My sisters think of you in the same way. I shall do many a base thing in life just to get money and reputation. I tell you this, that you mayn't be surprised if anything of that kind comes to your ears. I can't afford to live as I should like to. She looked up at him with a smile. People who are going to live unworthily don't declare it in this way. I oughtn't to. A few minutes ago I had no intention of saying such things. It means I am rather overstrung, I suppose. But it's all true, unfortunately. 
He rose, and began to run his eye along the shelves nearest to him. "'Well, now I will go, Miss Yule.' Marian stood up as he approached. "'It's all very well,' he said, smiling, "'for me to encourage my sisters, in the hope that they may earn a living. But suppose I can't even do it myself. It's by no means certain that I shall make ends meet this year.' "'You have every reason to hope, I think.' I like to hear people say that, but it'll mean savage work. When we were all at Finden last year, I told the girls that it would be another twelve months before I could support myself. Now I am forced to do it. And I don't like work. My nature is lazy. I shall never write for writing's sake, only to make money. All my plans and efforts will have money in view. All. I shan't allow anything to come in way of my material advancement. I wish you every success, said Marian, without looking at him. And without a smile. Thank you, but that sounds too much like goodbye. I trust we are to be friends for all that. Indeed, I hope we may be. They shook hands, and he went towards the door. But before opening it, he asked, Did you read that thing of mine in the current? Yes, I did. It wasn't bad, I think. It seemed to me very clever. Clever, yes, that's the word. It had a success, too. I have as good a thing half done for the April number. But I've felt too heavy hearted to go on with it. The girls shall let you know when they are in town. Marian followed him into the passage and watched him as he opened the front door. When it had closed, she went back into the study for a few minutes before rejoining her mother. End of chapter eight. Chapter nine of New Grub Street. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bridget Gage. New Grub Street by George Gissing. Chapter 9. In Vita Minerva. After all, there came a day when Edwin Reardon found himself regularly at work once more, ticking off his stipulated quantum of manuscript each four and twenty hours. He wrote a very small hand. Sixty written slips of the kind of paper he habitually used would represent, thanks to the astonishing system which prevails in such matters, large type, wide spacing, frequency of blank pages, a passable three-hundred-page volume. On average, he could write four such slips a day, so here we have fifteen days for the volume, and forty-five for the completed book. Forty-five days, an eternity in the looking forward. Yet the calculation gave him a faint-hearted encouragement. At that rate, he might have his book sold by Christmas. It would certainly not bring him a hundred pounds. Seventy-five, perhaps. But even that small sum would enable him to pay the quarter's rent, and then give him a short time, if only two or three weeks, of mental rest. If such rest could not be obtained, all was at an end with him. He must either find some new means of supporting himself and his family, or— have done with life and its responsibilities altogether. The latter alternative was often enough before him. He seldom slept for more than two or three consecutive hours in the night, and the time of wakefulness was often terrible. The various sounds which marked the stages from midnight to dawn had grown miserably familiar to him. Worst torture to his mind was the chiming and striking of clocks. Two of these were in general audible, that of Marylebone Parish Church and that of the adjoining workhouse. The latter always sounded several minutes after its ecclesiastical neighbor, and with a difference of note which seemed to Reardon very appropriate, a thin, querulous voice reminding one of the community it represented. After lying awake for a while, he would hear the quarter sounding. If they ceased before the fourth, he was glad, for he feared to know what time it was. If the hour was complete, he waited anxiously for its number. Two, three, even four were grateful. There was still a long time before he need rise and face the dreaded task, the horrible four blank slips of paper that had to be filled ere he might sleep again. But such restfulness was only for a moment. No sooner had the workhouse bell become silent than he began to toil in his weary imagination, or else, incapable of that, to vision fearful hazards of the future. The soft breathing of Amy at his side, the contact of her warm limbs, often filled him with intolerable dread. Even now he did not believe that Amy loved him with the old love, and the suspicion was like a cold weight at his heart that to retain even her wifely sympathy, her wedded tenderness, he must achieve the impossible. The impossible, for he could no longer deceive himself with the hope of genuine success. 
If he earned a bare living, that would be the utmost. And with bare livelihood, Amy would not, could not be content. If he were to die a natural death, it would be well for all. His wife and the child would be looked after. They could live with Mrs. Edmund Yule, and certainly it would not be long before Amy married again. This time a man of whose competency to maintain her there would be no doubt. His own behavior had been cowardly selfishness. Oh, yes, she had loved him, had been eager to believe in him. But there was always that voice of warning in his mind. He foresaw. He knew. And if he killed himself? Not here. No lurid horrors for that poor girl and her relatives. But somewhere at a distance, under circumstances which would render the recovery of his body difficult, yet would leave no doubt of his death. Would that again be cowardly? The opposite, when once it was certain that to live meant poverty and wretchedness. Amy's grief, however sincere, would be but a short trial compared with what else might lie before her. The burden of supporting her and Willie would be a very slight one if she went to live in her mother's house. He considered the whole matter night after night, until perchance it happened that sleep had pity upon him for an hour before the time of rising. Autumn was passing into winter. Dark days, which were always an oppression to his mind, began to be frequent, and would soon succeed each other remorselessly. Well, if only each of them represented four written slips. Milvane's advice to him had, of course, proved useless. The sensational title suggested nothing, or only ragged shapes of incomplete humanity that fluttered mockingly when he strove to fix them. But he had decided upon a story of the kind natural to him, a thin story, and one which it would be difficult to spin into three volumes. His own, at all events. The title was always a matter for head racking when the book was finished. He had never yet chosen it before beginning. For a week he got on at the desired rate. Then came once more the crisis he had anticipated. A familiar symptom of the malady which falls upon outwearied imagination. There were floating in his mind five or six possible subjects for a book, all dating back to the time when he first began novel writing, when ideas came freshly to him. If he grasped desperately at one of these, and did his best to develop it, for a day or two he could almost content himself. Characters, situations, lines of motive, were laboriously schemed, and he felt ready to begin writing. But scarcely had he done a chapter or two, when all the structure fell into flatness. He had made a mistake. Not this story, but that other one, was what he should have taken. The other one in question, left out of mind for a time, had come back with the face of new possibility. It invited him, tempted him to throw aside what he had already written. Good, now he was in a more hopeful train. But a few days, and the experience repeated itself. No, not this story, but that third one, of which he had not thought for a long time. How could he have rejected so hopeful a subject? For months he had been living in this way, endless circling, perpetual beginning, followed by frustration. A sign of exhaustion, it of course made exhaustion more complete. At times he was on the borderland of imbecility, his mind looking into a cloudy chaos, a shapeless whirl of nothings. He talked aloud to himself, not knowing that he did so. Little phrases which indicated dolorously the subject of his preoccupation often escaped him in the street. What could I make of that now? Well, suppose I made him... But no, that wouldn't do and so on. It had happened that he caught the eye of someone passing fixed in surprise upon him, so young a man to be talking to himself in evident distress. The expected crisis came, even now that he was savagely determined to go on at any cost, to write, let the result be what it would. His will prevailed, a day or two of anguish such as there is no describing to the inexperienced, and again he was dismissing slip after slip, a sigh of thankfulness at the completion of each one. It was a fraction of the whole, a fraction, a fraction. The ordering of his day was thus. At nine, after breakfast, he sat down to his desk and worked till one. Then came dinner, followed by a walk. As a rule, he could not allow Amy to walk with him, for he had to think over the remainder of the day's toil, and companionship would have been fatal. At about half-past three, he again seated himself, and wrote until half-past six, when he had a meal then once more to work from half-past seven to ten. Numberless were the experiments he had tried for the day's division. The slightest interruption of the order for the time being put him out of gear, 
Amy durst not open his door to ask however necessary a question. Sometimes the three hours' labor of a morning resulted in half a dozen lines, corrected into illegibility. His brain would not work. He could not recall the simplest cinnamons. Intolerable faults of composition drove him mad. He would write a sentence beginning thus. She took a book with a look of... Or thus, a revision of this decision would have made him an object of derision. Or, if the period were otherwise inoffensive, it ran off in a rhythmic gallop which was torment to the ear. All this, in spite of the fact that his former books had been noticeably good in style. He had an appreciation of shapely prose which made him scorn himself for the kind of stuff he was now turning out. I can't help it. It must go. The time is passing. Things were better, as a rule, in the evening. Occasionally he wrote a page with fluency, which recalled his fortunate years. And then his heart gladdened, his hand trembled with joy. Description of locality, deliberate analysis of character or motive, demanded far too great an effort for his present condition. He kept as much as possible to dialogue. The space is filled so much more quickly, and at a pinch one can make people talk about the paltriest incidents of life. There came an evening when he opened the door and called to Amy. "'What is it?' she answered from the bedroom. "'I'm busy with Willie.' "'Come as soon as you are free.' In ten minutes she appeared. There was apprehension on her face. She feared he was going to lament his inability to work. Instead of that, he told her joyfully that the first volume was finished. "'Thank goodness!' she exclaimed. "'Are you going to do any more tonight?' "'I think not, if you will come and sit with me.' Willie doesn't seem very well. He can't get to sleep. You would like to stay with him? A little while. I'll come presently. She closed the door. Reardon brought a high-backed chair to the fireside, and allowed himself to forget the two volumes that had still to be struggled through, in a grateful sense of the portion that was achieved. In a few minutes it occurred to him that it would be delightful to read a scrap of the Odyssey. He went to the shelves on which were his classical books— took the desired volume, and opened it, where Odysseus speaks to Nausicaa. For never yet did I behold one of mortals like to thee, neither man nor woman. I am awed as I look upon thee. And Dallas once, hardened by the altar of Apollo, I saw a young palm-tree shooting up with even such a grace. Yes, yes, that was not written at so many pages a day, with a workhouse clock clanging its admonition at the poet's ear. How it freshened the soul! how the eyes grew dim with a rare joy in the sounding of those nobly sweet hexameters. Amy came into the room again. Listen, said Reardon, looking up at her with a bright smile. Do you remember the first time that I read this to you? And he turned the speech into free prose. Amy laughed. I remember it well enough. We were alone in the drawing-room. I had told the others that they must make shift with the dining-room for that evening. And you pulled the book out of your pocket unexpectedly. I laughed at your habit of always carrying little books about. The cheerful news had brightened her. If she had been summoned to hear lamentations, her voice would not have rippled thus soothingly. Reardon thought of this, and it made him silent for a minute. The habit was ominous, he said, looking at her with a smile. A practical literary man doesn't do such things. Milvane, for instance? No. With curious frequency she mentioned the name of Milvane. Her unconsciousness in doing so prevented Reardon from thinking about the fact. Still, he had noted it. "'Did you understand the phrase slightingly?' he asked. "'Slightingly? Yes, a little, of course. It always has that sense on your lips, I think.' In the light of this answer, he mused upon her readily offered instance. True, he had occasionally spoken of Jasper with something less than respect. But Amy was not in the habit of doing so. I hadn't any meaning just then, he said. I meant quite simply that my bookish habits didn't promise much for my success as a novelist. I see, but you didn't think of it in that way at the time. He sighed. No, at least... no. At least what? Well, no, on the whole I had good hope. Amy twisted her fingers together impatiently. Edwin, let me tell you something. You are getting too fond of speaking in a discouraging way. Now why should you do so? I don't like it. It has one disagreeable effect on me. And that is, when people ask me about you, how you are getting on, I don't quite know how to answer. They can't help seeing that I am uneasy. I speak so differently from what I used to. Do you really? 
"'Indeed, I can't help it. "'As I say, it's very much your own fault.' Well, but granted that I am not of a very sanguine nature, and that I easily fall into gloomy ways of talk, what is Amy here for? Yes, yes, but... But... I am not here only to try and keep you in good spirits, am I? She asked it prettily, with a smile like that of maidenhood. Heaven forbid! I oughtn't to have put it in that absolute way. I was half-joking, you know. But, unfortunately, it's true that I can't be as light-spirited as I could wish— "'Does that make you impatient with me?' "'A little. I can't help the feeling, and I ought to try to overcome it. "'But you must try on your side as well. "'Why should you have said that thing just now?' "'You're quite right. It was needless. "'A few weeks ago I didn't expect you to be cheerful. "'Things began to look about as bad as they could. "'But now that you've got a volume finished, there's hope once more.' "'Hope? Of what quality? "'Reardon durst not say what rose in his thoughts.' A very small, poor hope, hope of money enough to struggle through another half-year, if indeed enough for that. He had learnt that Amy was not to be told the whole truth about anything as he himself saw it. It was a pity. To the ideal wife a man speaks out all that is in him. She had rather infinitely share his full conviction, than be treated as one from whom facts must be disguised. She says, let us face the worst, and talk of it together, you and I. No, Amy was not the ideal wife from that point of view. But the moment after this half-reproach had traversed his consciousness, he condemned himself, and looked with the joy of love into her clear eyes. Yes, there's hope once more, my dearest. No more gloomy talk to-night. I have read you something. Now you shall read something to me. It is a long time since I delighted myself with listening to you. What shall it be? I feel rather too tired to-night. Do you? I have had to look after Willie so much. But read me some more, Homer. I shall be very glad to listen. Reardon reached for the book again, but not readily. His face showed disappointment. Their evenings together had never been the same since the birth of the child. Willie was always an excuse, valid enough, for Amy's feeling tired. The little boy had come between him and the mother, as must always be the case in poor homes. Most of all where the poverty is relative— Reardon could not pass the subject without a remark, but he tried to speak humorously. "'There ought to be a huge public crèche in London. It's monstrous that an educated mother should have to be nursemaid.' "'But you know very well I think nothing of that. A crèche, indeed. No child of mine should go to any such place.' There it was. She grudged no trouble on behalf of the child. That was love, whereas— But then maternal love was a mere matter, of course— "'As soon as you get two or three hundred pounds for a book,' she added, laughing, "'there'll be no need for me to give so much time.' Two or three hundred pounds?' He repeated it with a shake of the head. "'Ah, if that were possible.' "'But that's really a paltry sum. "'What would fifty novelists you could name "'say if they were offered three hundred pounds for a book? "'How much do you suppose even Markland got for his last? "'Didn't sell it at all, ten to one. "'Gets a royalty.' which will bring him five or six hundred pounds before the book ceases to be talked of. Never mind. I am sick of the word pounds. So am I. She sighed, commenting thus on her acquiescence. But look, Amy, if I try to be cheerful in spite of natural dumps, wouldn't it be fair for you to put aside thoughts of money? Yes. Read some Homer, dear. Let us have Odysseus down in Hades, and Ajax stalking past him. Oh, I like that. So he read, rather coldly at first, but soon warming. Amy sat with folded arms, a smile on her lips, her brows knitted to the epic humor. In a few minutes, it was as if no difficulties threatened their life. Every now and then, Reardon looked up from his translating with a delighted laugh, in which Amy joined. When he had returned the book to the shelf, he stepped behind his wife's chair, leaned upon it, and put his cheek against hers. Amy. Yes, dear. Do you still love me a little? Much more than a little. Though I am sunk to writing a wretched pot-boiler? Is it so bad as all that? Confoundedly bad. I shall be ashamed to see it in print. The proofs will be a martyrdom. Oh, but why? Why? It's the best I can do, dearest. So you don't love me enough to hear that calmly. If I didn't love you, I might be calmer about it, Edwin. It's dreadful to me to think of what they will say in the reviews. Curse the reviews. His mood had changed on the instant. 
he stood up with darkened face, trembling angrily. "'I want you to promise me something, Amy. You won't read a single one of the notices, unless it is forced upon your attention. Now promise me that. Neglect them absolutely, as I do. They're not worth a glance of your eyes. And I shan't be able to bear it if I know you read all the contempt that will be poured on me.' I'm sure I shall be glad enough to avoid it, but other people, our friends, read it. That's the worst. You know that their praise would be valueless, so have strength to disregard the blame. Let our friends read and talk as much as they like. Can't you console yourself with the thought that I am not contemptible, though I may have been forced to do poor work? People don't look at it in that way. But, darling, he took her hand strongly in his own. I want you to disregard other people. You and I are surely everything to each other. Are you ashamed of me, of me myself? No, not ashamed of you, but I am sensitive to people's talk and opinions. But that means they make you feel ashamed of me. What else? There was silence. Edwin, if you find you are unable to do good work, you mustn't do bad. We must think of some other way of making a living. Have you forgotten that you urged me to write a trashy, sensational story? She colored and looked annoyed. You misunderstood me. A sensational story needn't be trash. And then, you know, if you had tried something entirely unlike your usual work, that would have been excuse enough if people had called it a failure. People! People! We can't live in solitude, Edwin, though really we are not far from it. He did not dare to make any reply to this. Amy was so exasperatingly womanlike in avoiding the important issue to which he tried to confine her. Another moment, and his tone would be that of irritation. So he turned away, and sat down to his desk, as if he had some thought of resuming work. "'Will you come and have some supper?' Amy asked, rising. "'I have been forgetting that tomorrow morning's chapter has still to be thought out. "'Edwin, I can't think this book will really be so poor. You couldn't possibly give all this toil for no result.' "'No, not if I were in sound health, but I am far from it. "'Come and have supper with me, dear, and think afterwards.' He turned and smiled at her. I hope I shall never be able to resist an invitation from you, sweet. The result of all this was, of course, that he sat down in anything but the right mood to his work next morning. Amy's anticipation of criticism had made it harder than ever for him to labor at what he knew to be bad. And, as ill luck would have it, in a day or two he caught his first winter's cold. For several years a succession of influenzas, sore throats, lumbagos, had tormented him from October to May. In planning his present work, and telling himself that it must be finished before Christmas, he had not lost sight of these possible interruptions. But he said to himself, Other men have worked hard in seasons of illness. I must do the same. All very well, but Reardon did not belong to the heroic class. A feverish cold now put his powers and resolution to the test. Through one hideous day he nailed himself to the desk, and wrote a quarter of a page. The next day, Amy would not let him rise from bed. He was wretchedly ill. In the night, he had talked about his work deliriously, causing her no slight alarm. "'If this goes on,' she said to him in the morning, "'you'll have brain fever. You must rest for two or three days.' "'Teach me how to. I wish I could.' Rest had indeed become out of the question. For two days he could not write, but the result upon his mind was far worse than if he had been at his desk." He looked a haggard creature when he again sat down with the accustomed blank slip before him. The second volume ought to have been much easier work than the first. It proved far harder. Messieurs and mesdames, the critics, are wont to point out the weakness of second volumes. They are generally right, simply because a story which would have made a tolerable book, the common run of stories, refuses to fill three books. Reardon's story was in itself weak and the second volume had to consist almost entirely of laborious padding. If he wrote three slips a day, he did well. And the money was melting, melting, despite Amy's efforts at economy. She spent as little as she could. Not a luxury came into their home. Articles of clothing all but indispensable were left unpurchased. But to what purpose was all this? Impossible now that the book should be finished and sold before the money had all run out. At the end of November, Reardon said to his wife one morning, "'Tomorrow I finish the second volume.' "'And in a week,' she replied, "'we shan't have a shilling left.' He had refrained from making inquiries, 
and Amy had forborne to tell him the state of things, lest it should bring him to a dead stop in his writing. But now they must needs discuss their position. "'In three weeks I can get to the end,' said Reardon, with unnatural calmness. "'Then I will go personally to the publishers, and beg them to advance me something on the manuscript before they have read it.' "'Couldn't you do that with the first two volumes?' "'No, I can't. Indeed I can't. The other thing will be bad enough. But to beg on an incomplete book, and such a book, I can't.' There were drops on his forehead. "'They would help you if they knew,' said Amy in a low voice. "'Perhaps. I can't say. They can't help every poor devil. No, I will sell some books. I can pick out fifty or sixty that I shan't much miss.' Amy knew what a wrench this would be. The imminence of distress seemed to have softened her. "'Edwin, let me take those two volumes to the publishers and ask.' "'Heavens, no! That's impossible. Ten to one you will be told that my work is of such doubtful value that they can't offer even a guinea till the whole book has been considered. I can't allow you to go, dearest. This morning I'll choose some books that I can spare. And after dinner I'll ask a man to come and look at them. Don't worry yourself. I can finish in three weeks. I'm sure I can. If I can get you three or four pounds, you could make it do, couldn't you?' Yes. She averted her face as she spoke. You shall have that. He still spoke very quietly. If the books won't bring enough, there's my watch. Oh, lots of things. He turned abruptly away, and Amy went on with her household work. End of chapter 9「Chapter Ten of New Grub Street. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bridget Gage. New Grub Street by George Gissing. Chapter Ten. The Friends of the Family. It was natural that Amy should hint dissatisfaction with the loneliness in which her days were mostly spent. She had never lived in a large circle of acquaintances. The narrowness of her mother's means restricted the family to intercourse with a few old friends, and such new ones as were content with teacup entertainment. But her tastes were social, and the maturing process which followed upon her marriage made her more conscious of this than she had been before. Already she had allowed her husband to understand that one of her strongest motives in marrying him was the belief that he would achieve distinction. At the time she doubtless thought of his coming fame only— or principally, as it considered their relations to each other. Her pride in him was to be one phase of her love. Now she was well aware that no degree of distinction in her husband would be of much value to her, unless she had the pleasure of witnessing its effect upon others. She must shine with reflected light before an admiring assembly. The more conscious she became of this requirement of her nature, the more clearly did she perceive that her hopes had been founded on an error." Reardon would never be a great man. He would never even occupy a prominent place in the estimation of the public. The two things, Amy knew, might be as different as light and darkness. But in the grief of her disappointment, she would rather have had him flare into a worthless popularity than flicker down into total extinction, which it almost seemed was to be his fate. She knew so well how people were talking of him and her— even her unliterary acquaintances understood that Reardon's last novel had been anything but successful, and they must, of course, ask each other how the Reardons were going to live if the business of novel-writing proved unremunerative. Her pride took offense at the mere thought of such conversations. Presently she would become an object of pity. There would be talk of poor Mrs. Reardon. It was intolerable. So during the last half-year she had withheld as much as possible from the intercourse which might have been one of her chief pleasures. And to disguise the true cause, she made pretenses, which were a satire upon her state of mind, alleging that she had devoted herself to a serious course of studies, that the care of house and child occupied all the time she could spare from her intellectual pursuits. The worst of it was, she had little faith in the efficiency of these fictions, in uttering them, she felt an unpleasant warmth upon her cheeks, and it was not difficult to detect a look of doubt in the eyes of the listener. She grew angry with herself for being dishonest, and with her husband for making such dishonesty needful. The female friend with whom she had most trouble was Mrs. Carter. You remember that on the occasion of Reardon's first meeting with his future wife, at the Grosvenor Gallery, 
There were present his friend Carter, and a young lady who was shortly to bear the name of that spirited young man. The Carters had now been married about a year. They lived in Bayswater, and saw much of a certain world which imitates on the lower plane the amusements and affectations of society proper. Mr. Carter was still secretary to the hospital, where Reardon had once earned his twenty shillings a week. But by voyaging in the seas of charitable enterprise, he had come upon supplementary sources of income. For instance, he held the post of secretary to the Barclay Trust, a charity whose moderate funds were largely devoted to the support of gentlemen engaged in administering it. This young man, with his air of pleasing vivacity, had early ingratiated himself with the kind of people who were likely to be of use to him. He had his reward in the shape of offices which are only procured through private influence. His wife was a good natured, lively, and rather clever girl. She had a genuine regard for Amy, and much respect for Reardon. Her ambition was to form a circle of distinctly intellectual acquaintances, and she was constantly inviting the Reardons to her house. A real life novelist is not easily drawn into the world where Mrs. Carter had her being, and it annoyed her that all attempts to secure Amy and her husband for five o'clock teas and small parties had of late failed. On the afternoon when Reardon had visited a second hand bookseller with a view of raising money, he was again shut up in his study, dolorously at work. Amy was disturbed by the sound of a visitor's rat tat. The little servant went to the door and returned, followed by Mrs. Carter. Under the best of circumstances, it was awkward to receive any but intimate friends during the hours when Reardon sat at his desk. The little dining room, with its screen to conceal the kitchen range, offered nothing more than homely comfort. And then the servant had to be disposed of by sending her into the bedroom to take care of Willie. Privacy, in the strict sense, was impossible, for the servant might listen at the door, one room let out of the other, to all the conversation that went on. Yet Amy could not request her visitors to speak in a low tone. For the first year, these difficulties had not been felt. Reardon made a point of leaving the front room at his wife's disposal from three to six. It was only when dread of the future began to press upon him that he sat in the study all day long. You see how complicated were the miseries of the situation. One torment involved another, and in every quarter subjects of discontent were multiplied. Mrs. Carter would have taken it ill had she known that Amy did not regard her as strictly an intimate. They addressed each other by their Christian names and conversed without ceremony. But Amy was always dissatisfied. When the well dressed young woman burst with laughter and animated talk into this abode of concealed poverty, Edith was not the kind of person with whom one can quarrel. She had a kind heart, and was never disagreeably pretentious. Had circumstances allowed it, Amy would have given frank welcome to such friendship. She would have been glad to accept as many invitations as Edith chose to offer. But at present, it did her harm to come in contact with Mrs. Carter. It made her envious, cold to her husband, resentful against fate. Why can't she leave me alone? was the thought that rose in her mind as Edith entered. I shall let her see that I don't want her here. Your husband at work? Edith asked, with a glance in the direction of the study, as soon as they had exchanged kisses and greetings. Yes, he is busy. And you are sitting alone, as usual. I feared you might be out. An afternoon of sunshine isn't to be neglected at this time of year. Is there sunshine? Amy inquired coldly. Why, look, do you mean to say you haven't noticed it? What a comical person you are sometimes. I suppose you have been over head and ears in books all day. How is Willie? Very well, thank you. Mayn't I see him? If you like. Amy stepped to the bedroom door and bade the servant bring Willie for exhibition. Edith, who as yet had no child of her own, Always showed the most flattering admiration of this infant. It was so manifestly sincere that the mother could not but be moved to a grateful friendliness whenever she listened to its expression. Even this afternoon, the usual effect followed when Edith had made a pretty and tender fool of herself for several minutes. Amy bade the servant make tea. At this moment, the door from the passage opened, and Reardon looked in. Well, if this isn't marvelous, cried Edith, I should as soon have expected the heavens to fall. As what? asked Reardon with a pale smile. As you to show yourself when I am here. I should like to say that I came on purpose to see you, Mrs. Carter, but it wouldn't be true. I'm going out for an hour, so that you can take possession of the other room if you like, Amy. Going out? 
said Amy, with a look of surprise. Nothing, nothing. I mustn't stay. He just inquired of Mrs. Carter how her husband was, and withdrew. The door of the flat was heard to close after him. Let us go into the study, then, said Amy, again in rather a cold voice. On Reardon's desk were lying slips of blank paper. Edith, approaching on tiptoe, which was partly make believe, partly genuine awe, looked at the literary apparatus, then turned with a laugh to her friend. How delightful it must be to sit down and write about people one has invented. Ever since I've known you and Mr. Reardon, I have been tempted to try if I couldn't write a story. Have you? And I'm sure I don't know how you can resist the temptation. I feel sure you could write books almost as clever as your husband's. I have no intention of trying. You don't seem very well today, Amy. Oh, I think I am as well as usual. She guessed that her husband was once more brought to a standstill, and this darkened her humor again. One of my reasons for coming, said Edith, was to beg and entreat and implore you and Mr. Reardon to dine with us next Wednesday. Now, don't put on such a severe face. Are you engaged that evening? Yes, in the ordinary way. Edwin can't possibly leave his work. But for one poor evening? It's such ages since we saw you. I'm very sorry. I don't think we shall ever be able to accept invitations in the future. Amy spoke thus at the prompting of a sudden impulse. A minute ago, no such definite declaration was in her mind. Never? exclaimed Edith. But why? Whatever do you mean? We find that social engagements consume too much time, Amy replied, her explanation just as much of an impromptu as the announcement had been. You see, one must either belong to society or not. Married people can't accept an occasional invitation from friends, and never do their social duty in return. We have decided to withdraw altogether, at all events for the present. I shall see no one except my relatives. Edith listened with a face of astonishment. You won't even see me? she exclaimed. Indeed, I have no wish to lose your friendship, yet I am ashamed to ask you to come here when I can never return your visits. Oh, please don't put it in that way. But it seems so very strange. Edith could not help conjecturing the true significance of this resolve. But, as is commonly the case with people in easy circumstances, she found it hard to believe that her friends were so straitened as to have a difficulty in supporting the ordinary obligations of a civilized state. I know how precious your husband's time is, she added, as if to remove the effect of her last remark. Surely there's no harm in my saying. We know each other well enough. You wouldn't think it necessary to devote an evening to entertaining us, just because you had given us the pleasure of your company. I put it very stupidly, but I'm sure you understand me, Amy. Don't refuse just to come to our house now and then. But I'm afraid we shall have to be consistent, Edith. But do you think this is a wise thing to do? Wise? You know what you once told me, about how necessary it was for a novelist to study all sorts of people. How can Mr. Reardon do this if he shuts himself up in the house? I should have thought he would find it necessary to make new acquaintances. As I said, returned Amy, it won't be always like this. For the present, Edwin has quite enough material. She spoke distantly. It irritated her to have to invent excuses for the sacrifice she had just imposed on herself. Edith sipped the tea which had been offered her, and for a minute kept silence. When will Mr. Reardon's next book be published? she asked at length. I'm sure I don't know, not before the spring. I shall look so anxiously for it. Whenever I meet new people, I always turn the conversation to novels, just for the sake of asking them if they know your husband's books. She laughed merrily. Which is seldom the case, I should think, said Amy, with a smile of indifference. Well, my dear, you don't expect ordinary novel readers to know about Mr. Reardon. I wish my acquaintances were a better kind of people. Then, of course, I should hear of his books more often. But one has to make the best of such society as offers. If you and your husband forsake me, I shall feel a sad loss. I shall indeed. Amy gave a quick glance at the speaker's face. Oh, we must be friends just the same, she said, more naturally than she had spoken hitherto. But don't ask us to come and dine just now. All through this winter we shall be very busy, both of us. Indeed, we have decided not to accept any invitations at all. Then, so long as you let me come here now and then, I must give in. I promise not to trouble you with any more complaining. But how you can live such a life, I don't know. 
I consider myself more of a reader than women generally are, and I should be mortally offended if any one called me frivolous. But I must have a good deal of society. Really and truly, I can't live without it. No, said Amy, with a smile which meant more than Edith could interpret. It seemed slightly condescending. There's no knowing, perhaps if I had married a literary man. She paused, smiling and musing. But then I haven't, you see. She laughed. Elbert is anything but a bookworm, as you know. You wouldn't wish him to be. Oh, no, not a bookworm. To be sure, we suit each other very well indeed. He likes society just as much as I do. It would be the death of him if he didn't spend three quarters of every day with lively people. That's a rather large portion. But then you count yourself among the lively ones. They exchanged looks and laughed together. Of course, you think me rather silly to want to talk so much with silly people, Edith went on. But then there's generally some amusement to be got, you know. I don't take life quite so seriously as you do. People are people, after all. It's good fun to see how they live and hear how they talk. Amy felt that she was playing a sorry part. She thought of sour grapes and of the fox who had lost his tail. Worst of all, perhaps Edith suspected the truth. She began to make inquiries about common acquaintances and fell into an easier current of gossip. A quarter of an hour after the visitor's departure, Reardon came back. Amy had guessed aright. The necessity of selling his books weighed upon him so that for the present he could do nothing. The evening was spent gloomily, with very little conversation. Next day came the bookseller to make his inspection. Reardon had chosen out and ranged upon a table nearly a hundred volumes. With a few exceptions, they had been purchased second hand. The tradesman examined them rapidly. What do you ask? he inquired, putting his head aside. I prefer that you should make an offer, Reardon replied, with the helplessness of one who lives remote from traffic. I can't say more than two pounds ten. That is at the rate of sixpence a volume. To me, that's about the average value of books like these. Perhaps the offer was a fair one, perhaps it was not. Reardon had neither time nor spirit to test the possibilities of the market. He was ashamed to betray his need by higgling. I'll take it, he said, in a matter of fact voice. A messenger was sent for the books that afternoon. He stowed them skillfully in two bags, and carried them downstairs to a cart that was waiting. Reardon looked at the gaps left on his shelves. Many of those vanished volumes were dear old friends to him. He could have told you where he had picked them up and when. To open them recalled a past moment of intellectual growth, a mood of hope or despondency, a stage of struggle. In most of them his name was written, and there were often penciled notes in the margin. Of course, he had chosen from among the most valuable he possessed. Such a multitude must else have been sold to make the sum of two pounds ten. Books are cheap, you know. At need, one can buy Homer for four pence, a Sophocles for six pence. It was not rubbish that he had accumulated at so small expenditure, but the library of a poor student, battered bindings, stained pages, supplanted editions. He loved his books, but there was something he loved more, and when Amy glanced at him with eyes of sympathy, he broke into a cheerful laugh. I'm only sorry they have gone for so little. Tell me when the money is nearly at an end again, and you shall have more. It's all right. The novel will be done soon. And that night he worked until twelve o'clock, doggedly, fiercely. The next day was Sunday. As a rule, he made it a day of rest, and almost perforce, for the depressing influence of Sunday in London made work too difficult. Then it was the day on which he either went to see his own particular friends or was visited by them. Do you expect anyone this evening? Amy inquired. Biffin will look in, I dare say. Perhaps Milvain. I think I shall take Willie to mother's. I shall be back before eight. Amy, don't say anything about the books. No, no. I suppose they always ask you when we think of removing over the way. He pointed in a direction that suggested Marylebone Workhouse. Amy tried to laugh, but a woman with a child in her arms has no keen relish for such jokes. I don't talk to them about our affairs, she said. That's best. She left home about three o'clock, the servant going with her to carry the child. At five, a familiar knock sounded through the flat. It was a heavy rap, followed by half a dozen light ones, like a reverberating echo. The last stroke scarcely audible. Reardon lay down his book, but kept his pipe in his mouth, and went to the door. 
A tall, thin man stood there, with a slouch hat and long gray overcoat. He shook hands silently, hung his hat in the passage, and came forward into the study. His name was Harold Biffin, and, to judge from his appearance, he did not belong to the race of common mortals. His excessive meagerness would all but have qualified him to enter an exhibition in the capacity of living skeleton, and the garments which hung upon this framework would perhaps have sold for three and sixpence at an old clothes dealer's. But the man was superior to these accidents of flesh and raiment. He had a fine face, large gentle eyes, nose slightly aquiline, small and delicate mouth. Thick black hair fell to his coat collar. He wore a heavy mustache and a full beard. In his gait there was a singular dignity. Only a man of cultivated mind and graceful character could move and stand as he did. His first act on entering the room was to take from his pocket a pipe, a pouch, a little tobacco stopper, and a box of matches, all of which he arranged carefully on a corner of the central table. Then he drew forward a chair and seated himself. Take your top coat off, said Reardon. Thanks, not this evening. Why the deuce not? Not this evening, thanks. The reason, as soon as Reardon sought for it, was obvious. Biffin had no ordinary coat beneath the other. To have referred to this fact would have been indelicate. The novelist, of course, understood it and smiled, but with no mirth. Let me have your Sophocles, were the visitor's next words. Reardon offered him a volume of the Oxford Pocket Classics. I prefer the wonder, please. It's gone, my boy. Gone? Wanted a little cash. Biffin uttered a sound in which remonstrance and sympathy were blended. I'm sorry to hear that, very sorry. Well, this must do. Now, I want to know how you scan this chorus in the Oedipus Rex. Reardon took the volume, considered, and began to read aloud with metric emphasis. Coriambics, eh? cried the other. Possible, of course, but treat them as Ionics, a minor, with an anacrusis, and see if they don't go better. He involved himself in terms of pedantry, and with such delight that his eyes gleamed. Having delivered a technical lecture, he began to read in illustration, producing quite a different effect from that of the rhythm as given by his friend. And the reading was by no means that of a pendant, rather of a poet. For half an hour, the two men talked Greek meters, as if they lived in a world where the only hunger known could be satisfied by grand or sweet cadences. They had first met in an amusing way. Not long after the publication of his book, On Neutral Ground, Reardon was spending a week at Hastings. A rainy day drove him to the circulating library, and as he was looking along the shelves for something readable, a voice near at hand asked the attendant if he had anything by Edwin Reardon. The novelist turned in astonishment. That any casual mortal should inquire for his books seemed incredible. Of course, there was nothing by that author in the library, and he who asked the question walked out again. On the morrow, Reardon encountered the same man at a lonely part of the shore. He looked at him, and spoke a word or two of common civility. They got into conversation, with the result that Edwin told the story of yesterday. The stranger introduced himself as Harold Biffin, an author in a small way, and a teacher whenever he could get pupils. An abusive review had interested him in Reardon's novels, but as yet he knew nothing of them but the names. Their tastes were found to be in many respects sympathetic, and after returning to London they saw each other frequently. Biffin was always in dire poverty, and lived in the oddest places. He had seen harder trials than even Reardon himself. The teaching by which he partly lived was of a kind quite unknown to the respectable tutorial world. In these days of examinations, numbers of men in a poor position, Clerks chiefly conceive a hope that by passing this, that, or the other formal test, they may open for themselves a new career. Not a few such persons nourish preposterous ambitions. There are warehouse clerks privately preparing, without any means or prospect of them, for a call to the bar. Draper's assistants, who go in for the preliminary examination of the College of Surgeons, and untaught men innumerable who desire to procure enough show of education to be eligible for curacy. Candidates of this stamp frequently advertise in the newspapers for cheap tuition, or answer advertisements which are intended to appeal to them. They pay from sixpence to half a crown an hour, rarely as much as the latter sum. Occasionally it happened that Harold Biffin had three or four such peoples in hand, and extraordinary stories he could draw from his large experience in this sphere. Then, as to his authorship, 
but shortly after the discussion of Greek meters, he fell upon the subject of his literary projects, and by no means for the first time, developed the theory on which he worked. I have thought of a new way of putting it. What I really aim at is an absolute realism in the spirit of the ignobly decent. The field, as I understand it, is a new one. I don't know any writer who has treated ordinary vulgar life with fidelity and seriousness. Zola writes deliberate tragedies. His vilest figures become heroic from the place they fill in a strongly imagined drama. I want to deal with the essentially unheroic, with the day to day life of that vast majority of people who are at the mercy of paltry circumstance. Dickens understood the possibility of such work, but his tendency to melodrama on the one hand, and his humor on the other, prevented him from thinking of it. An instance now. As I came along by Regent's Park half an hour ago, a man and a girl were walking close in front of me, love making. I passed them slowly, and heard a good deal of their talk. It was part of the situation that they should pay no heed to a stranger's proximity. Now, such a love scene as that has absolutely never been written down. It was entirely decent, yet vulgar to the nth power. Dickens would have made it ludicrous, a gross injustice. Other men who deal with low class life would perhaps have preferred idealizing it. An absurdity. For my own part, I am going to reproduce it verbatim, without one single impertinent suggestion of any point of view save that of honest reporting. The result will be something unutterably tedious. Precisely. That is the stamp of the ignobly decent life. If it were anything but tedious, it would be untrue. I speak, of course, of its effect upon the ordinary reader. I couldn't do it, said Reardon. Certainly you couldn't. You, well, you were a psychological realist in the sphere of culture. You were impatient of vulgar circumstances. In a great measure because my life has been murdered by them. And for that very same reason I delight in them, cried Biffin. You are repelled by what has injured you. I am attracted by it. This divergence is very interesting. But for that we should have resembled each other so closely. You know that by temper we are rabid idealists, both of us. I suppose so. But let me go on. I want, among other things, to insist upon the fateful power of trivial incidents. No one has yet dared to do this seriously. It has often been done in farce, and that's why farcical writing so often makes one melancholy. You know my stock instances of the kind of thing I mean. There was poor Alan, who lost the most valuable opportunity of his life because he hadn't a clean shirt to put on. And Williamson, who would probably have married that rich girl, but for the grain of dust that got into his eye. and made him unable to say or do anything at the critical moment. Reardon burst into a roar of laughter. There you are, cried Biffin, with friendly annoyance. You take the conventional view. If you wrote of these things, you would represent them as laughable. They are laughable, asserted the other, however serious to the persons concerned. The mere fact of grave issues in life depending on such paltry things is monstrously ludicrous. Life is a huge farce. And the advantage of possessing a sense of humor is that it enables one to defy fate with mocking laughter. That's all very well, but it isn't an original view. I am not lacking in sense of humor, but I prefer to treat these aspects of life from an impartial standpoint. The man who laughs takes the side of a cruel omnipotence, if one can imagine such a thing. I want to take no side at all, simply to say, look, this is the kind of thing that happens. I admire your honesty, Biffin, said Reardon, sighing. You will never sell work of this kind, yet you have the courage to go on with it because you believe in it. I don't know. I may perhaps sell it some day. In the meantime, said Reardon, laying down his pipe, suppose we eat a morsel of something. I'm rather hungry. In the early days of his marriage, Reardon was wont to offer his friends who looked in on Sunday evening a substantial supper. By degrees, the meal had grown simpler, until now, In the depth of his poverty, he made no pretense of hospitable entertainment. It was only because he knew that Biffin, as often as not, had nothing whatever to eat, that he did not hesitate to offer him a slice of bread and butter and a cup of tea. They went into the back room, and over the Spartan fire continued to discuss aspects of fiction. I shall never, said Biffin, write anything like a dramatic scene. Such things do happen in life, but so very rarely that they are nothing to my purpose. Even when they happen by the by, it is in a shape that would be useless to the ordinary novelist. He would have to cut away this circumstance and add that. Why? I should like to know. Such conventionalism results from stage necessities. Fiction hasn't yet outgrown the influence of the stage on which it originated. 
Whatever a man writes for effect is wrong and bad. Only in your view. There may surely exist such a thing as the art of fiction. It is worked out. We must have a rest from it. You, now, the best things you have done are altogether in conflict with novelistic conventionalities. It was because that blackguard review of On Neutral Ground clumsily hinted this that I first thought of you with interest. No, no. Let us copy life. When the man and woman are to meet for a great scene of passion, let it all be frustrated by one or other of them having a bad cold in the head, and so on. Let the pretty girl get a disfiguring pimple on her nose just before the ball at which she is going to shine. Show the numberless repulsive features of common decent life. Seriously, coldly, not a hint of facetiousness, or the thing becomes different. About eight o'clock, Reardon heard his wife's knock at the door. On opening, he saw not only Amy and the servant, the latter holding Willie in her arms, but with them Jasper Milvain. I have been at Mrs. Yule's, Jasper explained as he came in. Have you any one here? Biffin. Ah, then we'll discuss realism. That's over for the evening. Greek meters also. Thank heaven. The three men seated themselves with joking and laughter, and the smoke of their pipes gathered thickly in the little room. It was half an hour before Amy joined them. Tobacco was no disturbance to her, and she enjoyed the kind of talk that was held on these occasions. But it annoyed her that she could no longer play the hostess at a merry supper table. Why ever are you sitting in your overcoat, Mr. Biffin? were her first words when she entered. Please excuse me, Mrs. Reardon. It happens to be more convenient this evening. She was puzzled, but a glance from her husband warned her not to pursue the subject. Biffin always behaved to Amy with a sincerity of respect which had made him a favorite with her. To him, poor fellow, Reardon seemed supremely blessed. That a struggling man of letters should have been able to marry, and such a wife, was miraculous in Biffin's eyes. A woman's love was to him the unattainable ideal. Already thirty-five years old, he had no prospect of ever being rich enough to assure himself a daily dinner. Marriage was wildly out of the question. Sitting here, he found it very difficult not to gaze at Amy with uncivil persistency. Seldom in his life had he conversed with educated women, and the sound of this clear voice was always more delightful to him than any music. Amy took a place near to him, and talked in her most charming way of such things as she knew interested him. Biffin's deferential attitude as he listened and replied was strong in contrast with the careless ease which marked Jasper Milvain. The realist would never smoke in Amy's presence, but Jasper puffed jovial clouds even whilst she was conversing with him. Welpdale came to see me last night, remarked Milvain presently. His novel is refused on all hands. He talks of earning a living as a commission agent for some sewing machine people. I can't understand how his book should be positively refused, said Reardon. The last wasn't altogether a failure. Very nearly. And this one consists of nothing but a series of conversations between two people. It is really a dialogue, not a novel at all. He read me some twenty pages, and I no longer wondered that he couldn't sell it. Oh, but it has considerable merit, put in Biffin. The talk is remarkably true. But what's the good of talk that leads to nothing, protested Jasper. It's a bit of real life. Yes, but it has no market value. You may write what you like, so long as people are willing to read you. Welpdale's a clever fellow, but he can't hit a practical line. Like some other people I've heard of, said Reardon, laughing. But the odd thing is, that he always strikes one as practical-minded. Don't you feel that, Mrs. Reardon? He and Amy talked for a few minutes, and Reardon, seemingly lost in meditation, now and then observed them from the corner of his eye. At eleven o'clock husband and wife were alone again. You don't mean to say, exclaimed Amy, that Biffin had sold his coat. Or pawned it. But why not the overcoat? Partly, I should think, because it's the warmer of the two. Partly, perhaps, because the other would fetch more. That poor man will die of starvation some day, Edwin. I think it not impossible. I hope you gave him something to eat. Oh, yes, but I could see he didn't like to take as much as he wanted. I don't think of him with so much pity as I used. That's a result of suffering oneself. Amy set her lips and sighed. End of chapter 10、Chapter、eleven of New Grub Street. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chessie. New Grub Street by George Gissing. 
Chapter 11. Respite. The last volume was written in fourteen days. In this achievement Reardon rose almost to heroic pitch, for he had much to contend with beyond the mere labor of composition. Scarcely had he begun when a sharp attack of lumbago fell upon him. For two or three days it was torture to support himself at the desk, and he moved about like a cripple. Upon this ensued headaches, sore throat, general enfeeblement. And before the end of the fortnight it was necessary to think of raising another small sum of money. He took his watch to the pawnbroker's, you can imagine that it would not stand as security for much, and sold a few more books. All this notwithstanding, here was the novel at length finished. When he had written The End, he lay back, closed his eyes, and let time pass in blankness for a quarter of an hour. It remained to determine the title, but his brain refused another effort, after a few minutes' feeble search, he simply took the name of the chief female character, Margaret Home. That must do for the book. Already, with the penning of the last word, all its scenes, personages, dialogues, had slipped away into oblivion. He knew and cared nothing more about them. Amy, you will have to correct the proofs for me. Never, as long as I live, Will I look upon a page of this accursed novel? It has all but killed me. The point is, replied Amy, that here we have it complete. Pack it up and take it to the publishers tomorrow morning. I will. And you will ask them to advance you a few pounds? I must. But that undertaking was almost as hard to face as a rewriting of the last volume would have been. Reardon had such superfluity of sensitiveness that, for his own part, he would far rather have gone hungry than ask for money not legally his due. Today there was no choice. In the ordinary course of business it would be certainly a month before he heard the publisher's terms, and perhaps the Christmas season might cause yet more delay. Without borrowing, he could not provide for the expenses of more than another week or two. His parcel under his arm, he entered the ground-floor office and desired to see that member of the firm with whom he had previously had personal relations. This gentleman was not in town. He would be away for a few days. Reardon left the manuscript and came out into the street again. He crossed and looked up at the publisher's windows from the opposite pavement. Do they suspect in what wretched circumstances I am? Would it surprise them to know all that depends upon that budget of poetry scribbling? I suppose not. It must be a daily experience with them. Well, I must write a begging letter. It was raining and windy. He went slowly homewards, and was on the point of entering the public door of the flats, when his uneasiness became so great that he turned and walked past. If he went in, he must at once write his appeal for money, and he felt that he could not. The degradation seemed too great. Was there no way of getting over the next few weeks? Rent, of course, would be due at Christmas but that payment might be postponed. It was only a question of buying food and fuel. Amy had offered to ask her mother for a few pounds. It would be cowardly to put this task upon her now that he had promised to meet the difficulty himself. What man in all London could, and would, lend him money? He reviewed the list of his acquaintances, but there was only one to whom he could appeal with the slightest hope. That was Carter. Half an hour later, he entered that same hospital door through which, some years ago, he had passed as a half-starved applicant for work. The matron met him. Is Mr. Carter here? No, sir, but we expect him any minute. Will you wait? 
he entered the familiar office and sat down. At the table where he had been wont to work, a young clerk was writing. If only all the events of the last few years could be undone, and he, with no soul dependent upon him, be once more earning his pound a week in this room. What a happy man he was in those days. Nearly half an hour passed. It is the common experience of beggars to have to wait. Then Carter came in with quick step. He wore heavy ulster of the latest fashion, new gloves, a resplendent silk hat. His cheeks were rosy from the east wind. Ha, ah, Reardon, how do, how do, delighted to see you. Are you very busy? Well, no, not particularly. A few checks to sign, and we're just getting out our Christmas appeals. You remember? He laughed gaily. There was a remarkable freedom from snobbishness in this young man. The fact of Reardon's intellectual superiority had long ago counteracted Carter's social prejudices. I should like to have a word with you. Right you are. They went into a small inner room. Reardon's pulse beat at fever rate. His tongue was cleaving to his palate. What is it, old man? asked the secretary, seating himself and flinging one of his legs over the other. You look rather seedy, do you know? Why the deuce don't you and your wife look us up now and then? I've had a hard pull to finish my novel. Finished, is it? I'm glad to hear that. When will it be out? I'll send scores of people to Moody's after it. Thanks, but I don't think much of it, to tell you the truth. Oh, we know what that means. Reardon was talking like an automaton. It seemed to him that he turned screws and pressed levers for the utterance of his next words. I may as well say at once what I have come for. Could you lend me ten pounds for a month? In fact, until I get the money for my book? The secretary's countenance fell, though not to that expression of utter coldness which would have come naturally under the circumstances to a great many vivacious men. He seemed genuinely embarrassed. By Jove! I... Confound it! To tell you the truth, I haven't ten pounds to lend. Upon my word, I haven't, Reardon. These infernal housekeeping expenses. I don't mind telling you, old man, that Edith and I have been pushing the pace rather. He laughed and thrust his hands down into his trousers' pockets. We pay such a darned rent, you know. Hundred and twenty-five. We've only just been saying we should have to draw it mild for the rest of the winter. But I'm infernally sorry. Upon my word, I am. And I am sorry to have annoyed you by the unseasonable request. Devilish seasonable, Reardon, I assure you, cried the secretary, and roared at his choke. It put him into a better temper than ever, and he said at length, I suppose a fiver wouldn't be much use? For a month, you say? I might manage a fiver, I think. It would be very useful, but on no account if... No, no, I could manage a fiver for a month. Shall I give you a check? I'm ashamed. Not a bit of it. I'll go and write a check. Reardon's face was burning. Of the conversation that followed when Carter again presented himself, he never recalled a word. The bit of paper was crushed together in his hand. Out in the street again, he all but threw it away, dreaming for the moment that it was a bus ticket or a patent medicine bill. He reached home much after the dinner hour. Amy was surprised at his long absence. "'Got anything?' she asked. "'Yes.' It was half his intention to deceive her, to say that the publishers had advanced him five pounds. But that would be his first word of untruth to Amy. And why should he be guilty of it? He told her all that had happened. The result of this frankness 
was something that he had not anticipated. Amy exhibited profound vexation. "'Oh, you shouldn't have done that!' she exclaimed. "'Why didn't you come home and tell me? I would have gone to mother at once.' "'But does it matter?' "'Of course it does,' she replied sharply. "'Mr. Carter will tell his wife, and how pleasant that is.' "'I never thought of that, and perhaps it wouldn't have seemed to me so annoying as it does to you.' "'Very likely not.' She turned abruptly away, and stood at a distance in gloomy muteness. "'Well,' she said at length, "'there's no helping it now. Come and have your dinner. "'You have taken away my appetite. "'Nonsense! I suppose you're dying of hunger.' They had a very uncomfortable meal, exchanging few words. On Amy's face was a look more resembling bad temper than anything Reardon had ever seen there. After dinner he went and sat alone in the study. Amy did not come near him. He grew stubbornly angry. Remembering the pain he had gone through, he felt that Amy's behavior to him was cruel. She must come and speak when she would. At six o'clock she showed her face in the doorway and asked if he would come to tea. "'Thank you,' he replied. "'I had rather stay here.' "'As you please.' And he sat alone until about nine. It was only then he recollected that he must send a note to the publishers, calling their attention to the parcel he had left. He wrote it, and closed with a request that they would let him hear as soon as they conveniently could. As he was putting on his hat and coat to go out and post the letter, Amy opened the dining-room door. "'You going out?' "'Yes. Shall you be long?' "'I think not.' He was away only a few minutes. On returning he went first of all into the study, but the thought of Amy alone in the other room would not let him rest. He looked in, and saw that she was sitting without a fire. "'You can't stay here in the cold, Amy.' "'I'm afraid I must get used to it,' she replied, affecting to be closely engaged upon some sewing. That strength of character, which it had always delighted him to read in her features, was become an ominous hardness. He felt his heart sink as he looked at her. "'Is poverty going to have the usual result in our case?' he asked, drawing nearer. "'I never pretended that I could be indifferent to it. "'Still, don't you care to try and resist it?' "'She gave no answer. "'As usual in conversation with an aggrieved woman, "'it was necessary to go back from the general to the particular. "'I am afraid,' he said, that the Carters already knew pretty well how things were going with us. "'That's a very different thing, but when it comes to asking them for money... "'I'm very sorry. I would rather have done anything if I had known how it would annoy you. "'If we have to wait a month, five pounds will be very little use to us.' She detailed all manner of expenses that had to be met. Outlay, there was no possibility of avoiding, so long as their life was maintained on its present basis. However, you needn't trouble any more about it. I'll see to it. Now you are free from your book, try to rest. Come and sit by the fire. There's more chance of rest for me if we are thinking unkindly of each other. A doleful Christmas. Week after week went by, and Reardon knew that Amy must have exhausted the money he had given her. But she made no more demands upon him, and necessaries were paid for in the usual way. He suffered from a sense of humiliation. Sometimes he found it difficult to look in his wife's face. When the publisher's letter came, it contained an offer of seventy-five pounds for the copyright of Margaret Home. Twenty-five more to be paid, if the sale in free volume form 
should reach a certain number of copies. Here was failure put into unmistakable figures. Reardon said to himself that it was all over with his profession of authorship. The book could not possibly succeed even to the point of completing his hundred pounds. It would meet with universal contempt, and, indeed, deserved nothing better. "'Shall you accept this?' asked Amy, after dreary silence. "'No one else would offer terms as good. "'Will they pay you at once? "'I must ask them to. "'Well, it was seventy-five pounds in hand. "'The check came as soon as it was requested, "'and Reardon's face brightened for the moment. "'Blessed money, root of all good, "'until the world had went some saner economy. "'How much do you owe your mother?' he inquired, without looking at Amy. Six pounds, she answered coldly, and five to Carter, and rent twelve pounds ten. We shall have a matter of fifty pounds to go on with. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of New Grub Street This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. New Grub Street by George Gissing. Chapter 12. Work Without Hope. The prudent course was so obvious that he marveled at Amy's failing to suggest it. For people in their circumstances to be paying a rent of fifty pounds when a home could be found for half the money was recklessness. There would be no difficulty in letting the flat for this last year of their lease, and the cost of removal would be trifling. The mental relief of such a change might enable him to front with courage a problem in any case very difficult and, as things were, desperate. Three months ago, in a moment of profoundest misery, he had proposed this step. Courage failed him to speak of it again. Amy's look and voice were too vivid in his memory. Was she not capable of such a sacrifice for his sake? Did she prefer to let him bear all the responsibility of whatever might result from a futile struggle to keep up appearances? Between him and her there was no longer perfect confidence. Her silence meant reproach, and, whatever might have been the case before, there was no doubt that she now discussed him with her mother, possibly with other people. It was not likely that she concealed his own opinion of the book he had just finished, all their acquaintances would be prepared to greet its publication with private scoffing, or with mournful shaking of the head. His feeling towards Amy entered upon a new phase. The stability of his love was a source of pain. Condemning himself, he felt at the same time that he was wronged. A coldness which was far from representing the truth began to affect his manner and speech, and Amy did not seem to notice it. At all events, she made no kind of protest. They no longer talked of the old subjects, but of those mean concerns of material life which formerly they had agreed to dismiss as quickly as possible. Their relations to each other, not long ago an inexhaustible topic, would not bear spoken comment. Both were too conscious of the danger signal when they looked that way. In the time of waiting for the publisher's offer, and now again when he was asking himself how he should use the respite granted him, Reardon spent his days at the British Museum. He could not read to much purpose, but it was better to sit here among strangers than to seem to be idling under Amy's glance. Sick of imaginative writing, he turned to the studies which had always been most congenial, and tried to shape out a paper or two like those he had formerly disposed of to editors. Among his unused material lay a mass of notes he had made in a reading of Diogenes Laertius, and it seemed to him now that he might make something saleable out of those anecdotes of the philosophers. In a happier mood he could have written delightfully on such a subject, not learnedly, but in the strain of a modern man whose humour and sensibility find free play among the classic ghosts. Even now he was able to recover something of the light touch which had given value to his published essays. Meanwhile the first number of The Current had appeared, and Jasper Milvane had made a palpable hit. Amy spoke very often of the article called Typical Readers, and her interest in its author was freely manifested. Whenever a mention of Jasper came under her notice, she read it out to her husband. 
Reardon smiled and appeared glad, but he did not care to discuss Milvain with the same frankness as formerly. One evening at the end of January, he told Amy what he had been writing at the museum, and asked her if she would care to hear it read. "'I began to wonder what you were doing,' she replied. "'Then why didn't you ask me?' "'I was rather afraid to.' "'Why afraid?' "'It would have seemed like reminding you that—' "'You know what I mean. "'That a month or two more will see us at the same crisis again. "'Still, I had rather you had shown an interest in my doings.' "'After a pause, Amy asked, "'Do you think you can get a paper of this kind accepted?' "'It isn't impossible. "'I think it's rather well done. "'Let me read you a page.' "'Where will you send it?' she interrupted. "'To the wayside. "'Why not try the current? "'Ask Milvain to introduce you to Mr. Fadge.' They pay much better, you know. But this isn't so well suited for Fadge, and I much prefer to be independent, as long as it's possible. That's one of your faults, Edwin, remarked his wife mildly. It's only the strongest men that can make their way independently. You ought to use every means that offers. Seeing that I am so weak? I didn't think it would offend you. I only meant— No, no, you are quite right. Certainly I am one of the men who need all the help they can get. But I assure you, this thing won't do for the current. What a pity you will go hack to those musty old times. Now think of that article of Milvane's. If only you could do something of that kind. What do people care about Diogenes and his tub and his lantern? My dear girl, Diogenes Laertius had neither tub nor lantern that I know of. You are making a mistake, but it doesn't matter. No, I don't think it does. The caustic note was not very pleasant on Amy's lips. Whoever he was, the mass of readers will be frightened by his name. Well, we have to recognize that the mass of readers will never care for anything I do. You will never convince me that you couldn't write in a popular way if you tried. I am sure you are quite as clever as Milvane. Reardon made an impatient gesture. Do leave Milvane aside for a little. He and I are as unlike as two men could be. What's the use of constantly comparing us? Amy looked at him. He had never spoken to her so brusquely. How can you say that I am constantly comparing you? If not spoken in words, then in your thoughts. That's not a very nice thing to say, Edwin. You make it so unmistakable, Amy. What I mean is that you are always regretting the difference between him and me. You lament that I can't write in that attractive way. Well, I lament it myself. For your sake, I wish I had Melvane's peculiar talent, so that I could get reputation and money, but I haven't, and there's an end of it. It irritates a man to be perpetually told of his disadvantages. I will never mention Milvane's name again, said Amy coldly. Now that's ridiculous, and you know it. I feel the same about your irritation. I can't see that I have given any cause for it. Then we'll talk no more of the matter. Reardon threw his manuscript aside and opened a book. Amy never asked him to resume his intention of reading what he had written. However, the paper was accepted. It came out in the wayside for March, and Reardon received seven pounds ten for it. By that time he had written another thing, of the same gossipy kind, suggested by Pliny's letters. The pleasant occupation did him good, but there was no possibility of pursuing this course. Margaret Home would be published in April. He might get the five and twenty pounds contingent upon a certain sale, Yet that could in no case be paid until the middle of the year, and long before then he would be penniless. His respite drew to an end. But now he took counsel of no one. As far as it was possible he lived in solitude, never seeing those of his acquaintances who were outside the literary world, and seldom even his colleagues. Milvane was so busy that he had only been able to look in twice or thrice since Christmas, and Reardon nowadays never went to Jasper's lodgings. He had the conviction that all was over with the happiness of his married life, though how the events which were to express his ruin would shape themselves he could not foresee. Amy was revealing that aspect of her character to which he had been blind, though a practical man would have perceived it from the first. So far from helping him to support poverty, she perhaps would even refuse to share it with him. He knew that she was slowly drawing apart. Already there was a divorce between their minds, and he tortured himself in uncertainty as to how far he retained her affections. A word of tenderness, a caress, no longer met with response from her. Her softest mood was that of mere camaraderieship. All the warmth of her nature was expended upon the child. 
Reardon learnt how easy it was for a mother to forget that both parents have a share in her offspring. He was beginning to dislike the child, but for Willie's existence Amy would still love him with undivided heart, not perhaps so passionately as once, but still with a lover's love, and Amy understood, or, at all events remarked, this change in him. She was aware that he seldom asked a question about Willie, and that he listened with indifference when she spoke of the little fellow's progress. In part offended, she was also in part pleased. But for the child, mere poverty, he said to himself, should never have sundered them. In the strength of his passion he could have overcome all her disappointments, and indeed, but for that new care, he would most likely never have fallen into this extremity of helplessness. It is natural in a weak and sensitive man to dream of possibilities disturbed by the force of circumstances. For one hour which he gave to conflict with his present difficulties, Reardon spent many in contemplation of the happiness that might have been. Even yet it needed but a little money to redeem all. Amy had no extravagant aspirations. A home of simple refinement and freedom from anxieties would restore her to her nobler self. How could he find fault with her? She knew nothing of such sordid life as he had gone through, and to lack money for necessities seemed to her degrading beyond endurance. Why, even the ordinary artisan's wife does not suffer such privations as hers at the end of the past year. For lack of that little money his life must be ruined. Of late he had often thought about the rich uncle, John Yule, who might perhaps leave something to Amy, but the hope was so uncertain. And supposing such a thing were to happen— would it be perfectly easy to live upon his wife's bounty, perhaps exhausting a small capital, so that, some years hence, their position would be no better than before? Not long ago he could have taken anything from Amy's hand. Would it be so simple, since the change that had come between them? Having written his second magazine article, it was rejected by two editors, and he had no choice but to hold it over until sufficient time had elapsed, to allow of his again trying the wayside he saw that he must perforce plan another novel. By this time he was resolute not to undertake three volumes. The advertisements informed him that numbers of authors were abandoning that Procrustean system. Hopeless as he was, he might as well try his chance with a book which could be written in a few weeks. And why not a glaringly artificial story with a sensational title? It could not be worse than what he had last written. So, without a word to Amy, he put aside his purely intellectual work and began once more the search for a plot. This was towards the end of February. The proofs of Margaret Home were coming in day by day. Amy had offered to correct them, but after all he preferred to keep his shame to himself as long as possible, and with a hurried reading he dismissed sheet after sheet. His imagination did not work the more happily for this repugnant task. Still, he hit at length upon a conception which seemed— absurd enough for the purpose before him. Whether he could persevere with it, even to the extent of one volume, was very doubtful, but it should not be said of him that he abandoned his wife and child to penury without one effort of the kind that Milvane and Amy herself had recommended. Writing a page or two of manuscript daily, and with several holocausts to retard him, he had done nearly a quarter of the story when there came a note from Jasper, telling of Mrs. Milvane's death. He handed it across the breakfast-table to Amy, and watched her as she read it. "'I suppose it doesn't alter his position,' Amy remarked, without much interest. "'I suppose not appreciably. He told me once his mother had a sufficient income, but whatever she leaves will go to his sisters, I should think. He has never said much to me.' Nearly three weeks passed before they heard anything more from Jasper himself. Then he wrote, again from the country, saying that he purposed bringing his sisters to live in London— Another week, and one evening he appeared at the door. A want of heartiness in Reardon's reception of him might have been explained as gravity natural under the circumstances. But Jasper had before this become conscious that he was not welcomed here quite so cheerily as in the old days. He remarked it distinctly on that evening when he accompanied Amy home from Mrs. Ewell's. Since then he had allowed his pressing occupations to be an excuse for the paucity of his visits. It seemed to him perfectly intelligible that Reardon, sinking into literary insignificance, should grow cold to a man entering upon a successful career. The vein of cynicism in Jasper enabled him to pardon a weakness of this kind, which in some measure flattered him. But he both liked and respected Reardon, and at the present he was in the mood to give expression to his warmer feelings. "'Your book is announced, I see,' 
he said with an accent of pleasure, as soon as he had seated himself. I didn't know it. Yes, new novel by the author of On Neutral Ground, down for the 16th of April, and I have a proposal to make about it. Will you let me ask Fage to have it noticed in Books of the Month in the May Current? I strongly advise you to let it take its chance. The book isn't worth special notice, and whoever undertook to review it for Fage would either have to lie or stultify the magazine. Jasper turned to Amy. Now what is to be done with a man like this? What can one say to him, Mrs. Reardon? Edwin dislikes the book, Amy replied carelessly. That has nothing to do with the matter. We know quite well that in anything he writes there'll be something for a well-disposed reviewer to make a good deal of. If Fage will let me, I should do the thing myself. Neither Reardon nor his wife spoke. Of course, went on Milvane, looking at the former, if you had rather I left it alone. I had much rather. Please don't say anything about it. There was an awkward silence. Amy broke it by saying, Are your sisters in town, Mr. Milvane? Yes, we came up two days ago. I found lodgings for them not far from Mornington Road. Poor girls. They don't quite know where they are yet. Of course, they will keep very quiet for a time. Then I must try to get friends for them. Well, they have one already. Your cousin, Miss Yule. She has already been to see them. I'm very glad of that. Amy took an opportunity of studying his face. There was again a silence, as if of constraint. Reardon, glancing at his wife, said with hesitation, "'When they care to see other visitors, I am sure Amy would be very glad.' "'Certainly,' his wife added. "'Thank you very much. Of course I knew I could depend on Mrs. Reardon to show them kindness in that way. But let me speak frankly of something. My sisters have made quite a friend of Miss Yule since she was down there last year. Wouldn't that,' he turned to Amy, "'cause you a little awkwardness?' Amy had a difficulty in replying. She kept her eyes on the ground. "'You have no quarrel with your cousin,' remarked Reardon. "'None whatever. It's only my mother and my uncle.' "'I can't imagine Miss Yule having a quarrel with anyone,' said Jasper. Then he added quickly, "'Well, things must shape themselves naturally. We shall see. For the present they will be fully occupied. Of course it's best they should be. I shall see them every day, and Miss Yule will come pretty often, I dare say.' Reardon caught Amy's eye, but at once looked away again. "'My word!' exclaimed Milvane, after a moment's meditation. "'It's well this didn't happen a year ago. The girls have no income, only a little cash to go on with. We shall have our work set. It's a pretty lucky thing that I have just got a sort of footing.' Reardon muttered an assent. "'And what are you doing now?' Jasper inquired suddenly. "'Writing a one-volume story.' "'I'm glad to hear that. Any special plan for its publication?' No. Then why not offer it to Jedwood? He's publishing a series of one-volume novels. You know of Jedwood, don't you? He was Culpepper's manager, started business about half a year ago, and it looks as if he would do well. He married that woman. What's her name? Who wrote Mr. Henderson's Wives? Never heard of it. Nonsense. Miss Wilkie's, of course. Well, she married this fellow Jedwood, and there was a great row about something or other between him and her publishers. Mrs. Boston Wright told me all about it. An astonishing woman, that. A cyclopedia of the day's small talk. I'm quite a favorite with her. She's promised to help the girls all she can. Well, but I was talking about Jedwood. Why not offer him this book of yours? He's eager to get hold of the new writers. Advertises hugely. He has the whole back page of the study about every other week. I suppose Miss Wilkie's profits are paying for it. He has just given Markland two hundred pounds for a paltry little tale that would scarcely swell out to a volume. Markland told me himself. You know that I've scraped an acquaintance with him. Oh, I suppose I haven't seen you since then. He's a dwarfish fellow with only one eye. Mrs. Boston Wright cries him up at every opportunity. Who is Mrs. Boston Wright? asked Reardon, laughing impatiently. Edit's the English girl, you know. She's had an extraordinary life. Was born on Mauritius. No, Ceylon. I forget, some such place. Married a sailor at fifteen. Was shipwrecked somewhere, and only restored to life after terrific efforts. Her story leaves it all rather vague. Then she turns up as a newspaper correspondent at the Cape. Gave up that, and took to some kind of farming, I forget where. Married again, first husband lost in aforementioned shipwreck, this time a Baptist minister, and began to devote herself to soup kitchens in Liverpool. Her husband burned to death somewhere. She's next discovered in the thick of literary society in London. A wonderful woman, I assure you. 
Must be nearly fifty, but she looks twenty-five. He paused, then added impulsively, Let me take you to one of her evenings. Nine on Thursday. Do persuade him, Mrs. Reardon. Reardon shook his head. No, no, I should be horribly out of my element. I can't see why. You would meet all sorts of well-known people, those you ought to have met long ago. Better still, let me ask her to send an invitation for both of you. I'm sure you'd like her, Mrs. Reardon. There's a good deal of humbug about her, it's true, but some solid qualities as well. No one has a word to say against her, and it's a splendid advertisement to have her for a friend. She'll talk about your books and articles till all is blue. Amy gave a questioning look to her husband, but Reardon moved in an uncomfortable way. We'll see about it, he said. Some day, perhaps. Let me know whenever you feel disposed. But about Jedwood, I happen to know a man who reads for him. Heavens, cried Reardon, who don't you know? The simplest thing in the world. At present is a large part of my business to make acquaintances. Why, look you, a man who has to live by his miscellaneous writings couldn't get on without a vast variety of acquaintances. One's own brain would soon run dry. A clever fellow knows how to use the brains of other people. Amy listened with an unconscious smile which expressed keen interest. Oh, pursued Jasper, when did you see Webdale last? Haven't seen him for a long time. You don't know what he's doing? The fellow has set up as a literary adviser. He has an advertisement in the study every week. To young authors and literary aspirants, something of the kind, advice given on choice of subjects. MSS read, corrected, and recommended to publishers. Moderate terms. A fact. And what's more, he has made six guineas in the first fortnight, so he says, at all events. Now that's one of the finest jokes I ever heard. A man who can't get anyone to publish his own books makes a living by telling other people how to write. But it's a confounded swindle. Oh, I don't know. He's capable of correcting the grammar of literary aspirants, and as for recommending to publishers, well, anyone can recommend, I suppose. Reardon's indignation yielded to laughter. It's not impossible that he may thrive by this kind of thing. Not at all, assented Jasper. Shortly after this he looked at his watch. I must be off, my friends. I have something to write before I can go to my truckle bed, and it'll take me three hours at least. Good-bye, old man. Let me know when your story's finished, and we'll talk about it. And think about Mrs. Boston Wright. Oh, and about that review in the current. I wish you'd let me do it. Talk it over with your guide, philosopher and friend. He indicated Amy, who laughed in a forced way. When he was gone, the two sat without speaking for several minutes. Do you care to make friends with those girls? asked Reardon at length. I suppose in decency I must call upon them? I suppose so. You may find them very agreeable. Oh, yes. They conversed with their own thoughts for a while. Then Reardon burst out laughing. Well, there's the successful man, you see. Some day he'll live in a mansion and dictate literary opinions to the universe. How has he offended you? Offended me? Not at all. I'm glad of his cheerful prospects. Why should you refuse to go among those people? It might be good for you in several ways. If the chance had come when I was publishing my best work, I dare say I shouldn't have refused. But I certainly shall not present myself as the author of Margaret Home and the rubbish I'm now writing. Then you must cease to write rubbish. Yes, I must cease to write altogether. And do what? I wish to heaven I knew. End of chapter 12《Chapter Thirteen of New Grub Street》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chessy. New Grub Street by George Gissing. Chapter Thirteen. A Warning. In the spring list of Mr. Jedwood's publications. Announcement was made of a new work by Alfred Yule. It was called English Prose in the Nineteenth Century, and consisted of a number of essays, several of which had already seen the light in periodicals, strung into continuity. The final chapter dealt with contemporary writers, more especially those who served to illustrate the author's theme. 
that journalism is the destruction of prose style. On certain popular writers of the day there was an outpouring of gall which was not likely to be received as though it were sweet ointment. The book met with rather severe treatment in critical columns. It could scarcely be ignored the safest mode of attack when one's author has no expectant public, and only the most skilful could write of it in a hostile spirit without betraying that some of its strokes had told. An evening newspaper which piqued itself on independence indulged in laughing appreciation of the polemical chapter, and the next day printed a scornful letter from a thinly disguised correspondent who assailed both book and reviewer. For the moment people talked more of Alfred Yule than they had done since his memorable conflict with Clement Fetch. The publisher had hoped for this. Mr. Chetwood was an energetic and sanguine man, who had entered upon his business with a determination to rival in a year or so the houses which had slowly risen into commanding stability. He had no great capital, but the stroke of fortune which had wedded him to a popular novelist enabled him to count on steady profit from one source, and boundless faith in his own judgment urged him to an initial outlay which made the prudent shake their heads. He talked much of the new era, foresaw revolutions in publishing and book-selling, planned every week a score of untried ventures, which should appeal to the democratic generation just maturing. In the meantime, was ready to publish anything which seemed likely to get talked about. The main number of The Current, in its article headed Books of the Month, devoted about half a page to English prose in the 19th century. This notice was a consummate example of the flippant style of attack. Flippancy, the most hopeless form of intellectual vice, was a characterizing note of Mr. Fetch's periodical. His monthly comments on publications were already looked for with eagerness by that growing class of readers who care for nothing but what can be made matter of ridicule. The hostility of other reviewers was awkward and ineffectual compared with this venomous banter which entertained by showing that in the book under notice there was neither entertainment nor any other kind of interest. To assail an author without increasing the number of his readers is the perfection of journalistic skill, and the current, had it stood alone, would fully have achieved this end. As it was, silence might have been better tactics. But Mr. Fetch knew that his enemy would smart under the poison pinpoints, and that was something gained. On the day that the current appeared, its treatment of Alfred Yule was discussed in Mr. Jetwood's private office. Mr. Quamby, who had intimate relations with the publisher, happened to look in just as a young man, one of Mr. Jetwood's readers, was expressing a doubt whether Fetch himself was the author of the review. "'But there's Fetch's thumb-mark all down the page,' cried Mr. Quamby. "'He inspired the thing, of course, but I rather think it was written by that fellow Milwain.' "'Think so?' asked the publisher. "'Well, I know with certainty that the notice of Markland's novel is his writing, and I have reasons for suspecting that he did Yule's book as well. "'Smart youngster, that,' remarked Mr. Jetwood. "'Who is he, by the by?' "'Somebody's illegitimate son, I believe,' replied a source of trustworthy information with a laugh. "'Denham says he met him in New York a year or two ago, under another name.' "'Excuse me,' interposed Mr. Quamby. "'There's some mistake in all that.' He went on to state what he knew, from Yule himself, concerning Milwain's history. Though in this instance a corrector, Mr. Quamby took an opportunity, a few hours later, of informing Mr. Hinks that the attack on Yule in the current 
was almost certainly written by young Milwayne, with the result that when the rumour reached Yule's ears, it was delivered as an undoubted and well-known fact. It was a month prior to this that Milwayne made his call upon Mary and Yule on the Sunday when her father was absent. When told of the visit, Yule assumed a manner of indifference, but his daughter understood that he was annoyed. With regard to the sisters who would shortly be living in London, he merely said that Marian must behave as discretion directed her. If she wished to invite the Miss Milwains to St. Paul's Crescent, he only begged that the times and seasons of the household might not be disturbed. As her habit was, Marian took refuge in silence. Nothing could have been more welcome to her than the proximity of Maud and Dora, but she foresaw that her own home would not be freely open to them. Perhaps it might be necessary to behave with simple frankness and let her friends know the embarrassments of the situation. But that could not be done in the first instance. The unkindness would seem too great. A day after the arrival of the girls, she received a note from Dora and almost at once replied to it by calling at her friend's lodgings. A week after that, Maud and Dora came to St. Paul's Crescent. It was Sunday, and Mr. Yule purposely kept away from home. They had only been once to the house since then, again without meeting Mr. Yule. Marian, however, visited them at their lodgings frequently. Now and then she met Jasper there. The latter never spoke of her father, and there was no question of inviting him to repeat his call. In the end, Marian was obliged to speak on the subject with her mother. Mrs. Yule offered an occasion by asking when the Miss Milwains were coming again. "'I don't think I shall ever ask them again,' Marian replied. Her mother understood and looked troubled. "'I must tell them how it is, that's all,' the girl went on. "'They are sensible. They won't be offended with me.' "'But your father has never had anything to say against them,' urged Mrs. Yule. "'Not a word to me, Marian. i tell you the truth if he had. "'It's too disagreeable all the same. I can't invite them here with pleasure. "'Father has grown prejudiced against them all, and he won't change. "'No, I shall just tell them.' "'It's very hard for you,' sighed her mother. If I thought I could do any good by speaking. But I can't, my dear. I know it, mother. Let us go on as we did before. The day after this, when Yule came home about the hour of dinner, he called Marian's name from within the study. Marian had not left the house today. Her work had been set, in the shape of a long task of copying from disorderly manuscript. She left the sitting-room in obedience to her father's summons. "'Here's something that will afford you amusement,' he said, holding to her the new number of the current and indicating the notice of his book. She read a few lines, then threw the thing onto the table. "'That kind of writing sickens me,' she exclaimed with anger in her eyes. "'Only base and heartless people can write in that way.' You surely won't let it trouble you. Oh, not for a moment, her father answered, with exaggerated show of calm. But I am surprised that you don't see the literary merit of the work. I thought it would distinctly appeal to you. There was a strangeness in his voice, as well as in the words, which caused her to look at him inquiringly. She knew him well enough to understand that such a notice would irritate him profoundly. But why should he go out of his way to show it her, and with this peculiar acerbity of manner? Why do you say that, father? It doesn't occur to you who may probably have written it. She could not miss his meaning. Astonishment held her mute for a moment, then she said, 
Surely Mr. Fetch wrote it himself. I am told not. I am informed on very good authority that one of his young gentlemen has the credit of it. You refer, of course, to Mr. Milwain, she replied quietly. But I think that can't be true. He looked keenly at her. He had expected a more decided protest. I see no reason for disbelieving it. I see every reason, until I have your evidence. This was not at all Marian's natural tone in argument with him. She was wont to be submissive. I was told, he continued, hardening face and voice, by some one who had it from Jedwood. Yule was conscious of untruth in this statement, but his mood would not allow him to speak ingeniously, and he wished to note the effect upon Marian of what he said. There were two beliefs in him. On the one hand he recognized Fetch in every line of the writing. On the other he had a perverse satisfaction in convincing himself that it was Milwain who had caught so successfully the master's manner. He was not a kind of man who can resist an opportunity of justifying, to himself and others, a course into which he has been led by mingled feelings, all more or less unjustifiable. "'How should Chadwood know?' asked Marianne. Yule shrugged his shoulders. "'As if these things didn't get about among editors and publishers. "'In this case there's a mistake.' And why, pray? His voice trembled with choler. Why need there be a mistake? Because Mr. Milwain is quite incapable of reviewing your book in such a spirit. There is your mistake, my girl. Milwain will do anything that's asked of him, provided he's well enough paid. Marian reflected. When she raised her eyes again, they were perfectly calm. What has led you to think that? Don't I know the type of man? Nositur ex sorcius. Have you Latin enough for that? You'll find that you are misinformed, Marian replied, and therewith went from the room. She could not trust herself to converse longer. A resentment such as her father had never yet excited in her, such indeed as she had seldom, if ever, conceived, threatened to force utterance for itself in words which would change the current of her whole life. She saw her father in his worst aspect, and her heart was shaken by an unnatural revolt from him. Let his assurance of what he reported be ever so firm. What right had he to make this use of it? His behavior was spiteful. Suppose he entertained suspicions which seemed to make it his duty to warn her against Milwain. This was not the way to go about it. A father, actuated by simple motives of affection, would never speak and look thus. It was the hateful spirit of literary rancor that ruled him, the spirit that made people eager to believe all evil that blinded and maddened. Never had she felt so strongly the unworthiness of the existence to which she was condemned. That contemptible review, and now her father's ignoble passion, such things were enough to make all literature appear a morbid excrescence upon human life. Forgetful of the time, she sat in her bedroom, until a knock at the door and her mother's voice admonished her that dinner was waiting. An impulse all but caused her to say that she would rather not go down for the meal, that she wished to be left alone. But this would be weak peevishness. She just looked at the glass to see that her face bore no unwonted signs, and descended to take her place as usual. Throughout the dinner there passed no word of conversation. Yule was at his blackest. He gobbled a few mouthfuls, then occupied himself with the evening paper. On rising, he said to Marian, 
Have you copied the whole of that? The tone would have been uncivil if addressed to an impertinent servant. Not much more than half, was the cold reply. Can you finish it tonight? I'm afraid not. I am going out. Then I must do it myself. And he went to the study. Mrs. Yule was in an anguish of nervousness. What is it, dear? she asked of Marian in a pleading whisper. Oh, don't quarrel with your father. Don't. I can't be a slave, mother, and I can't be treated unjustly. What is it? Let me go and speak to him. It's no use. We can't live in terror. For Mrs. Yule, this was unimaginable disaster. She had never dreamt that Marian, the still, gentle Marian, could be driven to revolt. And it had come with the suddenness of a thunderclap. She wished to ask what had taken place between father and daughter in the brief interview before dinner. But Marian gave her no chance, quitting the room upon those last trembling words. The girl had resolved to visit her friends, the sisters, and tell them that in future they must never come to see her at home. But it was no easy thing for her to stifle her conscience and leave her father to toil over that copying which had need of being finished. Not her will, but her exasperated feeling had replied to him that she would not do the work. Already it astonished her that she had really spoken such words. And as the throbbing of her pulses subsided, she saw more clearly into the motives of this wretched tumult which possessed her. Her mind was harassed with a fear lest in defending Milwain she had spoken foolishly. Had he not himself said to her that he might be guilty of base things just to make his way? Perhaps it was the intolerable pain of imagining that he had already made good his words, which robbed her of self-control and made her meet her father's rudeness with defiance. Impossible to carry out her purpose. She could not deliberately leave the house and spend some hours away with the thought of such wrath and misery left behind her. Gradually she was returning to her natural self. Fear and penitence were chill at her heart. She went down to the study, tapped, and entered. Father, I said something that I did not really mean. Of course I shall go on with the copying and finish it as soon as possible. You will do nothing of the kind, my girl. He was in his usual place, already working at Marian's task. He spoke in a low, thick voice. Spend your evening as you choose. I have no need of you. I behaved very ill-temperedly. Forgive me, father. Have the goodness to go away. You hear me? His eyes were inflamed, and his discolored teeth showed themselves savagely. Marian durst not, really durst not approach him. She hesitated, but once more a sense of hateful injustice moved within her and she went away as quietly as she had entered. She said to herself that now it was her perfect right to go whither she would. But the freedom was only in theory. Her submissive and timid nature kept her at home, and upstairs in her own room. For, if she went to sit with her mother, of necessity she must talk about what had happened, and that she felt unable to do. Some friend to whom she could unbosom all her sufferings would now have been very precious to her. But Maud and Dora were her only intimates, and to them she might not make the full confession which gives solace. Mrs. Yule did not venture to intrude upon her daughter's privacy. That Marian neither went out nor showed herself in the house proved her troubled state, but the mother had no confidence in her power to comfort. At the usual time she presented herself in the study with her husband's coffee, 
The face which was for an instant turned to her did not invite conversation, but distress obliged her to speak. "'Why are you so cross with Marian, Alfred?' "'You had better ask what she means by her extraordinary behavior. A word of harsh rebuff was the most she had expected. Thus encouraged, she timidly put another question. "'How has she behaved?' I suppose you have ears. But wasn't there something before that? You spoke so angry to her. Spoke so angry, did I? She's out, I suppose. No, she hasn't gone out. That will do. Don't disturb me any longer. She did not venture to linger. The breakfast next morning seemed likely to pass without any interchange of words. But when Yule was pushing back his chair, Marian, who looked pale and ill, addressed a question to him about the work she would ordinarily have pursued to-day at the reading-room. He answered in a matter-of-fact tone, and for a few minutes they talked on the subject much as at any other time. Half an hour after, Marian set forth for the museum in the usual way. Her father stayed at home. It was the end of the episode for the present. Marian felt that the best thing would be to ignore what had happened, as her father evidently purposed doing. She had asked his forgiveness, and it was harsh in him to have repelled her. But by now she was able once more to take into consideration all his trials and toils, his embittered temper and the new wound he had received. That he should resume his wonted manner was sufficient evidence of regret on his part. Gladly she would have unsaid her resentful words. She had been guilty of a childish outburst of temper, and perhaps had prepared worse sufferings for the future. And yet, perhaps it was as well that her father should be warned. She was not all submission. He might try her beyond endurance. There might come a day when perforce she must stand face to face with him and make it known she had her own claims upon life. It was as well he should hold that possibility in view. This evening no work was expected of her. Not long after dinner she prepared for going out. To her mother she mentioned she should be back about ten o'clock. Give my kind regards to them, dear, if you like to said Mrs. Yule, just above her breath. Certainly I will. End of chapter 13、Chapter、fourteen of New Grub Street This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Emily Livingston. New Grub Street by George Gissing. Chapter fourteen. Recruits. Marian walked to the nearest point of Camden Road, and there waited for an omnibus. Which conveyed her to within easy reach of the street where Maud and Nora Milvain had their lodgings. This was at the north east of Regent's Park, and no great distance from Mornington Road, where Jasper still dwelt. On learning that the young ladies were at home and alone, she ascended to the second floor and knocked. That's right. Exclaimed Dora's pleasant voice as the door opened and the visitor showed herself. And then came the friendly greeting which warmed Marian's heart, the greeting which, until lately, no house in London could afford her. The girls looked oddly out of place in the second floor sitting room, with its vulgar furniture and paltry ornaments. Maud, especially so, for her fine figure was well displayed by the dress of mourning, 
and her pale, handsome face had as little congruence as possible with the background of humble circumstances. Dora impressed one as a simpler nature, but she too had distinctly the note of refinement which was out of harmony with these surroundings. They occupied only two rooms, the sleeping chamber being double-bedded. They purchased food for themselves and prepared their own meals excepting dinner. During the first week a good many tears were shed by both of them. It was not easy to transfer themselves from the comfortable country home to this bare corner of lodgers London. Maud, as appeared at the first glance, was less disposed than her sister to make the best of things. Her countenance wore an expression rather of discontent than of sorrow, and she did not talk with the same readiness as Dora. On the table lay a number of books. When disturbed, the sisters had been engaged in studious reading. I'm not sure I do right in coming again so soon, said Marian, as she took off her things. Your time is precious. Oh, so are you, replied Dora, laughing. <laughs> it's only under protest that we work in the evening when we have been hard at it all day. We have news for you, too, said Maud, who sat languidly in an uneasy chair. Good, I hope. Someone called to see us yesterday. I dare say you can guess who it was. Amy, perhaps? Yes. And how did you like her? The sisters seemed to have a difficulty in answering. Dora was the first to speak. We thought she was sadly out of spirits. Indeed, she told us that she hasn't been very well lately. But I think we shall like her if we come to know her better. It was rather awkward, Marian, the elder sister explained. We felt obliged to say something about Mr. Reardon's books, but we haven't read any of them yet you know, so I just said that I hoped soon to read his new novel. I suppose you've seen reviews of it, she asked at once. Of course, I ought to have had the courage to say no, but I admitted that I had seen one or two. Jasper showed us them. She looked very much annoyed, and after that we didn't find much to talk about. The reviews are very disagreeable, said Marian, with a troubled face. I have read the book since I saw you the other day, and I'm afraid it isn't good, but I have seen many worse novels more kindly reviewed. Jasper says it's because Mr. Reardon has no friends among the journalists. Still replied Marian. I'm afraid they couldn't have given the book much praise if they wrote honestly. Did Amy ask you to go and see her? Yes, but she said it was uncertain how long they would be living at their present address. And really, we can't feel sure whether we should be welcome or not just now. Marian listened with bent head. She, too, had to make known to her friends that they were not welcome in her own home, but she knew not how to utter words which would sound so unkind. "'Your brother,' she said after a pause, "'will soon find suitable friends for you.' "'Before long,' replied Dora, with a look of amusement, He's going to tell us to call Mrs. Boston Wright, 
I hardly thought he was serious at first, but he says he really means it. Marian grew more and more silent. At home she felt that it would not be difficult to explain her troubles to these sympathetic girls, but now the time had come for speaking, she was oppressed by shame and anxiety. True, there was no absolute necessity for making the confession this evening, and if she chose to resist her father's prejudice, things might even go on in a seemingly natural way. But the loneliness of her life had developed in her a sensitiveness which could not endure situations such as the present. Difficulties which are of small account to people who take their part in active social life harassed her to the destruction of all peace. Dora was not long in noticing the dejected mood which had come upon her friend. What's troubling you, Marian? Something I can hardly bear to speak of. Perhaps it will be the end of your friendship for me, and I should find it very hard to go back to my old solitude. The girls gazed at her, in doubt at first whether she spoke seriously. What can you mean? Dora exclaimed. What crime have you been committing? Maud, who leaned with her elbows on the table, searched Marian's face curiously, but said nothing. Has Mr. Melvane shown you the new number of The Current? Marian went on to ask. They replied with a negative, and Maud added, he has nothing in it this month, except a review. A review? repeated Marian, in a low voice. Yes, of somebody's novel. Markland's, supplied Dora. Marian drew a breath, but remained for a moment with her eyes cast down. Do go on, dear urged Dora. Whatever are you going to tell us? There's a notice of father's book, continued the other, a very ill-natured one. It's written by the editor, Mr. Fadge. Father and he have been unfriendly for a long time. Perhaps Mr. Melvane told you something of it. Dora replied that he had. "'I don't know how it is in other professions,' Marian resumed. "'But I hope there is less envy, hatred, and malice than in this of ours. The name of literature is often made hateful to me by the things I hear and read. My father has never been very fortunate.' and many things have happened to make him bitter against the men who succeed. But he has often quarreled with people who were at first his friends, but never so seriously as any one with Mr. Fadge. His feeling of enmity goes so far that it includes even those who are in any way associated with Mr. Fadge. I'm sorry to say, she looked with painful anxiety from one to the other of the sisters. This has turned him against your brother, and— Her voice was checked by agitation. We were afraid of this, said Dora, in a tone of sympathy. Jasper feared it might be the case, added Maud more coldly, though with friendliness. Why I speak of it at all, Marian hastened to say, is because I am so afraid it should make a difference between yourselves and me. Oh, don't think that, Dora exclaimed. I am so ashamed, Marian went on in an uncertain tone, but I think it will be better if you don't come and see me. It sounds ridiculous, 
It is ridiculous and shameful. I couldn't complain if you refused to have anything more to do with me. Don't let it trouble you, urged Maud, with perhaps a trifle more magnanimity in her voice than was needful. We quite understand. Indeed, it shan't make any difference to us. But Marian had averted her face, and could not meet these assurances with any show of pleasure. Now that the step was taken, she felt her behavior had been very weak. Unreasonable harshness such as her father's ought to have been met more steadily. She had no right to make it an excuse for such incivility to her friends. Yet only in some such way as this could she make it known to Jasper Milvane how her father regarded him, which she felt it necessary to do. Now his sisters would tell him, and henceforth there would be a clear understanding on both sides. That state of things was painful to her, but it was better than ambiguous relations. "'Jasper is very sorry about it,' said Dora, glancing rapidly at Marian. "'But his connection with Mr. Fadge came about in such a natural way,' added the eldest sister, "'and it was impossible for him to refuse opportunities.' "'Impossible, I know,' Marian replied earnestly. "'Don't think I wish to justify my father, but I can understand him, and it must be very difficult for you to do so. "'You can't know, as I do, how intensely he has suffered in these wretched, ignoble quarrels. "'If only you will let me come here still, in the same way, and still be as friendly to me, "'my home has never been a place to which I could have invited friends with any comfort.' even if I'd had any to invite. There were always reasons, but I can't speak of them. My dear Marian, appealed Dora, don't distress yourself so. Don't believe that nothing whatever has happened to change our feeling for you, has there, Maud? Nothing whatever. We are not unreasonable girls, Marian. I... I am more grateful to you than I can say." It had seemed as if Marian must give way to the emotions which all but choked her voice. She overcame them, however, and presently was able to talk in pretty much her usual way, though when she smiled it was but faintly. Maud tried to lead her thoughts in another direction by speaking of work in which she and Dora were engaged. Already the sisters were doing a new piece of compilation for Messrs. Jolly and Monk. It was more exacting than their initial task for the book market, and would take a much longer time. A couple of hours went by, and Marian had just spoken of taking leave, when a man's step was heard rapidly ascending the nearest flight of stairs. "'Here's Jasper,' remarked Dora, and— in a moment there sounded a short, sharp summons at the door. Jasper it was. He came in with radiant face, his eyes blinking before the lamplight. "'Well, girls, ha! How do you do, Miss Yule? I just had the vaguest sort of expectation that you might be here. It seemed a likely night. I don't know why, I say.' "'Dora, we really must get two or three decent easy-chairs for your room. "'I've seen some outside a second-hand furniture shop in Hempstead Road, "'about six shillings apiece. "'There's no sitting on chairs such as these.' "'That on which he tried to dispose himself, "'when he had flung aside his trappings, "'creaked and shivered ominously. "'You hear?' I shall come plump on to the floor, if you don't mind. My word, what a day I've had! I've just been trying what I really could do in one day, if I worked my hardest. Now just listen. It deserves to be chronicled for the encouragement of the aspiring youth. I got up at seven-thirty, and whilst I breakfasted, I read through a volume I had to review. 
By ten-thirty the review was written, three-quarters of a column of the evening budget. "'Who is the unfortunate author?' interrupted Maud, caustically. "'Not unfortunate at all. I had to crack him up. Otherwise I couldn't have done the job so quickly. It's the easiest thing in the world to write laudation. Only an inexperienced grumbler would declare it was easier to find fault. The book was Billington's Vagaries. Pompous idiocy, of course, but he lives in a big house and gives dinners. Well, from ten-thirty to eleven, I smoked a cigar and reflected, feeling the day wasn't badly begun. At eleven, I was ready to write my Saturday causerie for the Will of the Wisp. It took me till close upon one o'clock, which was rather too long. I can't afford more than an hour and a half for the job. At one I rushed out to a dirty little eating-house on Hampstead Road, was back again by quarter to two, having in the meantime sketched a paper for the West End. Pipe in mouth, I sat down to a leisurely artistic work. By five, half the paper was done. The other half remains for tomorrow. From five to half-past, I read four newspapers and two magazines, and from half-past to a quarter to six I jotted down several ideas that had come to me whilst reading. At six I was again in the dirty eating-house, satisfying a ferocious hunger. Home once more at six forty-five, and for two hours wrote steadily at a long affair I have in a hand for the current. Then I came here thinking hard all the way. What say you to this? Have I earned a night's repose? And what's the value of it all? asked Maud. Probably from ten to twelve guineas, if I calculated. I meant what was the literary value of it, said the sister with a smile. Equal to that of the contents of a mouldy nut pretty much what I thought. Oh, but it answers the purpose, urged Dora, and it does no one any harm. Honest journey work, cried Jasper. There are few men in London capable of such a feat. Many a fellow could write more in quantity, but they couldn't command my market. It's rubbish, but rubbish of a very special kind of fine quality. Marian had not yet spoken, save a word or two in reply to Jasper's greeting. Now and then she just glanced at him, but for the most part her eyes were cast down. Now Jasper addressed her. A year ago, Miss Yule, I shouldn't have believed myself capable of such activity. In fact, I wasn't capable of it then. "'You think such work won't be too great a strain upon you?' she asked. "'Oh, this isn't a specimen day, you know. "'Tomorrow I shall very likely do nothing but finish my West End article "'in an easy two or three hours. "'There's no knowing. "'I might perhaps keep up the high pressure if I tried, "'but then I couldn't dispose of all the work.' Little by little, or perhaps rather quicker than that, I shall extend my scope. For instance, I should like to do two or three liters a week for one of the big dailies. I can't attain unto that just yet. Not political leaders? By no means. That's not my line. The kind of thing in which one makes a column out of what would fill six lines of respectable prose. You call a cigar a convoluted weed, and so on. You know, that passes for facetiousness. I've never really tried my hand at that style yet. I shouldn't wonder if I managed it brilliantly. Some day I'll write a few exercises. Just take two lines of some good prose writer and expand them into twenty, in half a dozen different ways. Excellent mental gymnastics. Marian listened to his flow of talk for a few minutes longer. 
then took the opportunity of a brief silence to rise and put on her hat. Jasper observed her, but without rising. He looked at his sisters in a hesitating way. At length he stood up, and declared that he too must be off. This coincidence had happened once before when he had met Marian here in the evening. "'At all events you won't do any more work to-night,' said Dora. "'No, I shall read a page of something over a glass of whisky, and seek the sleep of a man who has done his duty.' "'Why the whisky?' asked Maud. "'Do you grudge me such a poor solace?' "'I don't see the need of it.' "'Nonsense, Maud!' exclaimed her sister. "'He needs a little stimulant when he works so hard.' Each of the girls gave Marian's hand a significant pressure as she took leave of them, and begged her to come again as soon as she had a free evening. There was gratitude in her eyes. The evening was clear, and not very cold. "'It's rather late for you to go home,' said Jasper, as they left the house. "'May I walk part of the way with you?' Marian replied with a low, "'Thank you.' "'I think you get on pretty well with the girls, don't you?' "'I hope they are as glad of my friendship as I am of theirs.' "'Pity to see them in a place like that, isn't it?' They ought to have a good house with plenty of servants. It's bad enough for a civilized man to have to rough it, but I hate to see women living in a sordid way. Don't you think they could both play their part in a drawing-room with a little experience? Surely there's no doubt of it. Maud would look really superb if she were handsomely dressed. She hasn't a common face by any means. And Dora is pretty, I think. Well, they shall go and see some people before too long. The difficulty is, one doesn't like it to be known that they live in such a crib, but I daren't advise them to go in for expense. One can't be sure that it would repay them. Though, now, in my case, if I could get hold of a few thousand pounds, I should know how to use it with the certainty of return. It would save me, probably, a clear ten years of life. I mean, I shall go at a jump to what I shall be ten years hence without the help of money. But they have such a miserable little bit of capital, and everything is still so uncertain. One daren't speculate under the circumstances. Marian made no reply. You think I talk of nothing but money? "'Jasper said suddenly, looking down into her face. "'I know too well what it means to be without money. "'Yes, but you do just a little despise me.' "'Indeed, I don't, Mr. Milvane.' "'If that is sincere, I am very glad. "'I take it in a friendly sense. "'I am rather despicable, you know.' It's part of my business to be so, but a friend needn't regard that. There is the man apart from his necessities. The silence was then unbroken till they came to the lower end of Park Street, the junction of the roads which led to Hampstead, to Highgate, and to Holloway. Shall you take an omnibus? Jasper asked. She hesitated. "'Or will you give me the pleasure of walking on with you? "'You are tired, perhaps?' "'Not the least.' "'For the rest of her answer she moved forward, "'and they crossed into the obscurity of Camden Road. "'Shall I be doing wrong, Mr. Milvane?' "'Marian began in a very low voice. "'If I ask you about the authorship of something in this month's current?' I'm afraid I know what you refer to. There's no reason why I shouldn't answer a question of the kind. It was Mr. Fadge himself who reviewed my father's book. It was, confound him! 
I don't know another man who could have done the thing so vilely well. I suppose he was only replying to my father's attack upon him and his friends. Your father's attack is honest and straightforward and justifiable and well put. I read the chapter of his book with huge satisfaction. But has any one suggested that another than Fadge was capable of that masterpiece? Yes, I am told that Mr. Jedwood, the publisher, has somehow made a mistake. Jedwood? And what mistake? Father heard that you were the writer. I— Jasper stopped short. They were in the rays of the street lamp, and could see each other's faces. And he believes that. I'm afraid so. And you believe, believed it? Not for a moment. I shall write a note to Mr. Yule. Marian was silent a while, then said, Wouldn't it be better if you found a way of letting Mr. Jedwood know the truth? Perhaps you are right. Jasper was very grateful for the suggestion. In that moment he had reflected how rash it would be to write to Alfred Yule on such a subject, with whatever prudence in expressing himself. Such a letter coming under the notice of the great Fadge might do its writer serious harm. "'Yes, you are right,' he repeated. "'I'll stop that rumor at its source. I can't guess how it started.' For aught I know, some enemy hath done this, though I don't quite discern the motive. Thank you very much for telling me, and still more for refusing to believe that I could treat Mr. Yule in that way, even as a matter of business. When I said that I was despicable, I didn't mean that I could sink quite to such a point as that, if only because it was your father— he checked himself, and they walked on for several yards without speaking. "'In that case,' Jasper resumed at length, "'your father doesn't think of me in a very friendly way.' "'He scarcely could!' "'No, no, and I quite understand that the mere fact of my working for Fadge would prejudice him against me, but that's no reason, I hope, why you and I shouldn't be friends.' "'I hope not.' "'I don't know that my friendship is worth much,' Jasper continued, talking into the upper air, a habit of his when he discussed his own character. "'I shall go on as I have begun, and fight for some of the good things in life. But your friendship is valuable. If I am sure of it, I shall be at all events within sight of the better ideals.' Marian walked on, with her eyes upon the ground. To her surprise, she discovered presently that they had all but reached St. Paul's Crescent. "'Thank you for having come so far,' she said, pausing. "'Ah, you are nearly home. Why, it seems only a few minutes since we left the girls. Now I'll run back to the whiskey of which Maud disapproves.' <laughs> "'May it do you good,' said Marian, with a laugh. A speech of this kind seemed unusual upon her lips. Jasper smiled as he held her hand and regarded her. "'Then you can speak in a joking way. "'Do I seem so very dull?' "'Dull by no means, but sage and sober and reticent.' and exactly what I like in my friend, because it contrasts with my own habits, all the better that merriment lies below it. Good night, Miss Yule. He strode off, and in a minute or two turned his head to look at the slight figure passing into the darkness. Marian's hand trembled as she tried to insert her latch-key, when she had closed the door very quietly behind her, she went to the sitting-room. 
Mrs. Yule was laying aside the sewing which she had occupied herself throughout the lonely evening. "'I'm rather late,' said the girl, in a voice of subdued joyousness. "'Yes, I was getting a little uneasy, dear.' "'Oh, there's no danger.' "'You have been enjoying yourself, I can see.' "'I have had a pleasant evening.' In the retrospect, it seemed the pleasantest she had yet spent with her friends, though she had set out in such a different mood. Her mind was relieved of two anxieties. She felt sure that the girls had not taken ill when she told them, and there was no longer the least doubt concerning the authorship of that review in the current. She could confess to herself now that the assurance from Jasper's lips was not superfluous. He might have weighed profit against other considerations, and have written in that way of her father. She had not felt that absolute confidence which defies every argument from human frailty, and she now asked herself if faith of that unassailable kind is ever possible. Is it not only the poet's dream, the far ideal? Marian often went thus far in her speculation. Her candor was allied with clear insight into the possibilities of falsehood. She was not readily the victim of illusion. Thinking much and speaking little, she had not come to her twenty-third year without perceiving what a distance lay between a girl's dream of life as it might be and life as it is. Had she invariably disclosed her thoughts, she would have earned the repute of a very skeptical and slightly cynical person. But with what rapturous tumult of the heart she could abandon herself to a belief in human virtues when their suggestions seemed to promise her a future of happiness! Alone in her room, she sat down only to think of Jasper Milvane, and extract from the memory of his words, his looks, new sustenance for her hungry heart. Jasper was the first man who had ever evinced a man's interest in her. Until she met him she had not known a look of compliment or a word addressed to her emotions. He was as far as possible from representing the lover of her imagination. But from the day of that long talk in the fields near Wattleborough, the thought of him had supplanted dreams. On that day she said to herself, I could love him if he cared to seek my love. Premature, perhaps, why, yes, but one who is starving is not wont to feel reluctance at the suggestion of food. The first man who had approached her with display of feeling and energy and youthful self-confidence, handsome, too, it seemed to her, her womanhood went eagerly to meet him. Since then she had made careful study of his faults. Each conversation had revealed to her new weakness and follies, with the result that her love had grown to a reality. He was so human, and a youth of all but monastic seclusion had prepared her to love the man who aimed with frank energy at the joys of life. A taint of pedantry would have repelled her. She did not ask for high intellect or great attainments, but vivacity, courage, determination to succeed were delightful to her senses. Her ideal would not have been a literary man at all, certainly not a man likely to be prominent in journalism, rather a man of action, one who had no restraints of commerce or official routine. But in Jasper she saw the qualities that attracted her apart from the accidents of his position. Ideal personages do not descend to girls who have to labor at the British Museum. It seemed a marvel to her, and a good augury, that even such a man as Jasper should have crossed her path. It was as though years had passed since their first meeting. Upon her return to London, had followed such long periods of hopelessness. Yet whenever they encountered each other, he had 
look and speech for her with which surely he did not greet every woman. From the first his way of regarding her had shown frank interest, and at length had come to the confession of his respect, his desire to be something more to her than a mere acquaintance. It was scarcely possible that he should speak as he several times had of late, if he did not wish to draw her towards him. That was the hopeful side of her thoughts. It was easy to forget for a time those words of his which one might think were spoken as distinct warning, but they crept into the memory, unwelcome, importune, as soon as imagination had built its palace of joy. Why did he always recur to the subject of money? I shall allow nothing to come in my way, he once said, that, as if meaning, certainly not a love affair with a girl who is penniless. He emphasized the word friend, as if to explain that he offered and asked nothing more than friendship. But it only meant that he would not be in haste to declare himself. Of a certainty there was conflict between his ambition and his love but she recognized her power over him, and exulted in it. She had observed his hesitancy this evening, before he rose to accompany her from the house. Her heart laughed within her as the desire drew him, and henceforth such meetings would be frequent. With each one her influence would increase. How kindly fate had dealt with her in bringing Maud and Dora to London! It was within reach to marry a woman who would bring him wealth. He had that in mind. She understood it too well. But not one moment's advantage would she relinquish. He must choose her in poverty, and be content with what his talents could earn for him. Her love gave her the right to demand this sacrifice. Let him ask for her love and the sacrifice would no longer seem one, so passionately would she reward him. He would ask it. Tonight she was full of a rich confidence, partly, no doubt, the result of reaction from her miseries. He had said at parting that her character was so well suited to his, that he liked her, and then he had pressed her hand so warmly before long he would ask her love. The unhoped was all but granted her. She could labor on in the valley of the shadow of books, for a ray of dazzling sunshine might at any moment strike into its musty gloom. End of 14 Recording by Emily Livingston Chapter 15 Part 1 of New Grub Street this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bridget Gage. New Grub Street by George Gissing. Chapter 15. The Last Resource. The past twelve months had added several years to Edwin Reardon's seeming age. At thirty-three, he would generally have been taken for forty. His bearing, his personal habits, were no longer those of a young man. He walked with a stoop, and pressed noticeably on the stick he carried. It was rare for him to show the countenance which tells of present cheerfulness, or glad onward-looking. There was no spring in his step. His voice had fallen to a lower key, and often he spoke with that hesitation in choice of words, which may be noticed in persons whom defeat has made self-distrustful. Ceaseless perplexity and dread gave a wandering, sometimes a wild, expression to his eyes. He seldom slept, in the proper sense of the word. As a rule, he was conscious, all through the night, of a kind of fighting between physical weariness and wakeful toil of the mind. It often happened that some wholly imaginary obstacle in the story he was writing kept him under a sense of effort throughout the dark hours. Now and again he woke, reasoned with himself, and remembered clearly that the torment was without cause. But the short relief thus afforded soon passed in the recollection of real distress. In his unsoothing slumber he talked aloud, frequently wakening Amy. Generally he seemed to be holding a dialogue with someone who had imposed an intolerable task upon him. 
He protested passionately, appealed, argued in the strangest way about the injustice of what was demanded. Once Amy heard him begging for money, positively begging, like some poor wretch in the street. It was horrible, and made her shed tears. When he asked what he had been saying, she could not bring herself to tell him. When the striking clock summoned him remorselessly to rise and work, he often reeled with dizziness. It seemed to him that the greatest happiness attainable would be to creep into some dark, warm corner, out of the sight and memory of men, and lie there torpid, with a blessed half-consciousness that death was slowly overcoming him. Of all the sufferings collected into each four-and-twenty hours, this of rising to a new day was the worst. The one-volume story which he had calculated would take him four or five weeks was with difficulty finished in two months. March winds made an invalid of him. At one time he was threatened with bronchitis, and for several days had to abandon even the effort to work. In previous winters he had been wont to undergo a good deal of martyrdom from the London climate, but never in such a degree as now. Mental illness seemed to have enfeebled his body. It was strange that he succeeded in doing work of any kind, for he had no hope from the result. This one last effort he would make, just to complete the undeniableness of his failure, and then literature should be thrown behind him. What other pursuit was possible to him he knew not, but perhaps he might discover some mode of earning a livelihood. Had it been a question of gaining a pound a week, as in the old days, he might have hoped to obtain some clerkship like that at the hospital, where no commercial experience or aptitude was demanded. But in his present position, such an income would be useless. Could he take Amy and the child to live in a garret? On less than a hundred a year, it was scarcely possible to maintain outward decency. Already his own clothing began to declare him poverty-stricken, and but for gifts from her mother, Amy would have reached the like pass. They lived in dread of the pettiest casual expense, for the day of pennilessness was again approaching. Amy was oftener from home than had been her custom. Occasionally she went away soon after breakfast, and spent the whole day at her mother's house. "'It saves food,' she said with a bitter laugh, when Reardon once expressed surprise that she should be going again so soon. "'And gives you an opportunity of bewailing your hard fate,' he returned coldly. The reproach was ignoble, and he could not be surprised that Amy left the house without another word to him. Yet he resented that, as he had resented her sorrowful jest." The feeling of unmanliness in his own position tortured him into a mood of perversity. Through the day he wrote only a few lines, and on Amy's return he resolved not to speak to her. There was a sense of repose in this change of attitude. He encouraged himself in the view that Amy was treating him with cruel neglect. She, surprised that her friendly questions elicited no answer, looked into his face, and saw a sullen anger of which hitherto Reardon had never seemed capable. Her indignation took fire, and she left him to himself. For a day or two he persevered in his muteness, uttering a word only when it could not be avoided. Amy was at first so resentful that she contemplated leaving him to his ill-temper, and dwelling at her mother's house until he chose to recall her. But his face grew so haggard in fixed misery that compassion at length prevailed over her injured pride. Late in the evening she went to the study, and found him sitting unoccupied. "'Edwin, what do you want?' he asked indifferently. "'Why are you behaving to me like this? "'Surely it makes no difference to you how I behave. "'You can easily forget that I exist and live your own life. "'What have I done to make this change in you?' "'Is it a change?' "'You know it is.' "'How did I behave before?' he asked, glancing at her. "'Like yourself, kindly and gently. "'If I always did so, in spite of things that might have embittered another man's temper,' I think it deserved some return of kindness from you. What things do you mean? Circumstances for which neither of us is to blame. I am not conscious of having failed in kindness, said Amy distantly. Then that only shows that you have forgotten your old self, and utterly changed in your feeling to me. When we first came to live here, could you have imagined yourself leaving me alone for long, miserable days, just because I was suffering under misfortunes? You have shown too plainly that you don't care to give me the help, even of a kind word. You get away from me as often as you can, as if to remind me that we have no longer any interest in common. Other people are your confidants. You speak of me to them, as if I were purposely dragging you down into a mean condition. 
How can you know what I say about you? Isn't it true? he asked, flashing an angry glance at her. It is not true. Of course I have talked to mother about our difficulties. How could I help it? And to other people? Not in a way that you could find fault with. In a way that makes me seem contemptible to them. You show them that I have made you poor and unhappy, and you are glad to have their sympathy. What you mean is that I oughtn't to see anyone. There's no other way of avoiding such a reproach as this. So long as I don't laugh and sing before people, and assure them that things couldn't be more hopeful, I shall be asking for their sympathy, and against you. I can't understand your unreasonableness. I'm afraid there is very little in me that you can understand. So long as my prospect seemed bright, you could sympathize readily enough. As soon as ever they darkened, something came between us. Amy, you haven't done your duty. Your love hasn't stood the test as it should have done. You have given me no help, besides the burden of cheerless work. I have had to bear that of your growing coldness. I can't remember one instance when you have spoken to me as a wife might, a wife who is something more than a man's housekeeper. The passion in his voice and the harshness of the accusation made her unable to reply. You said rightly, he went on, that I have always been kind and gentle. I never thought I could speak to you or feel to you in any other way. But I have undergone too much, and you have deserted me. Surely it was too soon to do that. So long as I endeavored my utmost and loved you the same as ever, you might have remembered all you once said to me. You might have given me help, but you haven't cared to. The impulses which had partook in this outbreak were numerous and complex. He felt all that he expressed. But at the same time, it seemed to him that he had the choice between two ways of uttering his emotion the tenderly appealing, and the sternly reproachful. He took the latter course, because it was less natural to him than the former. His desire was to impress Amy with the bitter intensity of his sufferings. Pathos and loving words seemed to have lost their power upon her. But perhaps if he yielded to that other form of passion, she would be shaken out of her coldness. The stress of injured love is always tempted to speech, which seems its contradiction. Reardon had the strangest mixture of pain and pleasure in flinging out these first words of wrath that he had ever addressed to Amy. They consoled him under the humiliating sense of his weakness. And yet he watched with dread his wife's countenance as she listened to him. He hoped to cause her pain equal to his own, for then it would be in his power at once to throw off this disguise and soothe her with every softest word his heart could suggest. That she had really ceased to love him, he could not, durst not believe. But his nature demanded frequent assurance of affection. Amy had abandoned too soon the caresses of their ardent time. She was absorbed in her maternity, and thought it enough to be her husband's friend. Ashamed to make appeal directly for the tenderness she no longer offered, he accused her of utter indifference, of abandoning him, and all but betraying him, that in self-defense she might show what really was in her heart. But Amy made no movement towards him. How can you say that I have deserted you? she returned, with cold indignation. When did I refuse to share your poverty? When did I grumble at what we have had to go through? Ever since the troubles began, you have let me know what your thoughts were, even if you didn't speak them. You have never shared my lot willingly. I can't recall one word of encouragement from you, but many, many which made the struggle harder for me. Then it would be better for you if I went away altogether and left you free to do the best for yourself. If that is what you mean by all this, why not say it plainly? I won't be a burden to you. Someone will give me a home. And you would leave me without regret? Your only care would be that you are still bound to me? You must think of me what you like. I don't care to defend myself. You won't admit, then, that I have anything to complain of? I seem to you simply in a bad temper without a cause? To tell you the truth, that's just what I do think. I came here to ask what I have done that you were angry with me, and you break out furiously with all sorts of vague reproaches. You have much to endure, I know that, but it's no reason why you should turn against me. I have never neglected my duty. Is the duty all on my side? I believe there are very few wives who would be as patient as I have been. Reardon gazed at her for a moment, then turned away. The distance between them was greater than he had thought, and now he repented of having given way to an impulse so alien to his true feelings. Anger only estranged her, whereas by speech of a different kind he might have won the caress for which he hungered. Amy, seeing that he would say nothing more, left him to himself. It grew late in the night. The fire had gone out, 
but Reardon still sat in the cold room. Thoughts of self-destruction were again haunting him, as they had done during the black months of last year. If he had lost Amy's love, and all through the mental impotence which would have made it hard for him even to earn bread, why should he still live? Affection for his child had no weight with him. It was Amy's child rather than his, and he had more fear than pleasure and the prospect of Willie's growing to manhood. He had just heard the workhouse clock strike two, when, without the warning of a footstep, the door opened. Amy came in. She wore her dressing gown, and her hair was arranged for the night. "'Why do you stay here?' she asked. It was not the same voice as before. He saw that her eyes were red and swollen. "'Have you been crying, Amy?' "'Never mind. Do you know what time it is?' He went towards her. "'Why have you been crying?' "'There are many things to cry for.' "'Amy, have you any love for me still, or has poverty robbed me of it all?' I have never said that I didn't love you. Why do you accuse me of such things? He took her in his arms and held her passionately, and kissed her face again and again. Amy's tears broke forth anew. Why should we come to such utter ruin? she sobbed. Oh, try, try if you can't save us even yet. You know without my saying it that I do love you. It's dreadful to me to think that all our happy life should be at an end, when we thought of such a future together. Is it impossible? Can't you work as you used to, and succeed as we felt confident you would? Don't despair yet, Edwin. Do, do try, whilst there is still time. Darling, darling, if only I could. I have thought of something, dearest. Do as you proposed last year. Find a tenant for the flat whilst we still have a little money, and then go away into some quiet country place, where you can get back your health and live for very little. And write another book, a good book, that'll bring you reputation again. I and Willie can go and live at Mother's for the summer months. Do this. It would cost you so little, living alone, wouldn't it? You would know that I was well cared for. Mother would be willing to have me for a few months. And it's easy to explain that your health has failed, that you're obliged to go away for a time. But why shouldn't you go with me, if we are to let this place? We shouldn't have enough money. I want to free your mind from the burden whilst you are writing. And what is before us if we go on in this way? You don't think you will get much for what you're writing now, do you? Reardon shook his head. Then how can we live even till the end of the year? Something must be done, you know. If we get into poor lodgings, what hope is there that you'll be able to write anything good? But, Amy, I have no faith in my power of— Oh, it would be different. A few days, a week, or a fortnight of real holiday in the spring weather. Go to some seaside place. How is it possible that all your talent should have left you? It's only that you have been so anxious and in such poor health. You say I don't love you, but I have thought and thought what would be best for you to do, how you could save yourself. How can you sink down to the position of a poor clerk in some office? That can't be your fate, Edwin. It's incredible. Oh, after such bright hopes, make one more effort. Have you forgotten that we were to go to the South together? You were to take me to Italy and Greece. How can that ever be if you fail utterly in literature? How can you ever hope to earn more than bare sustenance at any other kind of work? He all but lost consciousness of her words, in gazing at the face she held up to his. You love me? Say again that you love me. Dear, I love you with all my heart, but I am so afraid of the future. I can't bear poverty. I have found that I can't bear it. And I dread to think of your becoming only an ordinary man. Reardon laughed. But I am not only an ordinary man, Amy. If I never write another line, that won't undo what I have done. It's little enough, to be sure, but you know what I am. Do you only love the author in me? Don't you think of me apart from all that I may do or not do? If I had to earn my living as a clerk, would that make me a clerk in soul? You shall not fall to that. It would be too bitter a shame to lose all you have gained in these long years of work. Let me plan for you. Do as I wish. You are to be what we hoped from the first. Take all the summer months. How long will it be before you can finish this short book? A week or two. Then finish it, and see what you can get for it. And try at once to find a tenant to take this place off our hands. That would be twenty-five pounds saved for the rest of the year. You could live on so little by yourself, couldn't you? Oh, on ten shillings a week, if need be. But not to starve yourself, you know. Don't you feel that my plan is a good one? When I came to you tonight, I meant to speak of this. But you were so cruel— Forgive me, dearest love, I was half a madman. You have been so cold to me for a long time. 
I have been distracted. It was as if we were drawing nearer and nearer to the edge of a cataract. End of chapter 15, part 1